All right, hello everyone and welcome to my stream today. Um, we're just gonna get started up here in a minute, but as you know, we gotta kill some pre-roll and we gotta remind everyone that we're live. So uh, I probably should just get to it. Um, pretty excited about the stream today because uh, I get to, as you know, I've been building a meta framework myself, so I'll start. And um, it's been a long process. It's, you know, I, I never wanted to build a meta framework originally. I was working on Solid. I was like, okay, sweet, someone else will build it. But, you know, we kept on getting, you know, the ask. People kept on being like, hey, I want, you need something like next. And I was like, no, this is too much work. Never do it. No, it's it's crazy. But then V2 came out and I was like, okay, okay, okay. I mean, actually, I was looking at Snowpack actually first. To be fair, Snowpack came out. And and they had SSR support, and I was like, okay, this might be a real thing. And then beat two, and I was like, okay, yeah, this is the thing. And it's it's kind of crazy um, to you know that realization when it went from something that I was like, yeah, never in a million years, too much work, to realizing it was something that we could actually build. And a lot of that comes down to Vite. So um, I'm obviously very interested to hear the story of other um, authors, you know, working on meta frameworks and how, you know, Vite has impacted that and what it's enabled, especially in this case, uh, Analog, which we'll be looking at today, is built on Angular, which, you know, has kind of historically been known for having its own tool chain, kind of being kind of separate from the rest of the JavaScript ecosystem. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool to see, um, uh, you know, a meta framework being built with a lot of the same tooling. Yeah. Hey, everyone, come say hi in the chat, eh? Well, as, as you come in, I'm I'm just giving the spiel. And also, I should probably... Let's see here. Um, I'm just going to... I haven't actually shared my screen yet. Uh, entire screen. This one, yeah. Let's uh, let's retweet this and tell people that we're, we're live here. We're going to have Brandon join us in a few minutes. And it's going to be... Pretty good. Yeah, I was I'm just looking at this cover. I was actually having some fun trying to figure out what I wanted to do for this, right? Analog kept on making me think of like circuits and clocks. Um, and yeah, I was trying to think of the biggest flashiest thing I could come up with um, yeah, it's that I could showcase the logo with. Eh, it works. Um, we're live, what is it? Uh, HTTP, uh, actually Twitter is smart enough that if I go Twitch, dot tv slash ryan solid this should work okay i think whatever okay fine i'm not risking it all right yeah good people coming into the chat let's get past that uh tw twitch pre-roll eh Yeah. All right. Plus, I know, I know, I, it's interesting. I never really expected originally when I started streaming, um, just because of my interests and stuff, that uh, the Angular f folks would be like a big part of, you know, our viewership because I, I talk a lot of reactivity, which was, well, I mean, signals, not Angular has RxJS, but and I talk a lot of, like React and I wasn't expecting it. But um, some of our Angular videos have been some of our best videos to date in terms of viewership over time, especially like the one we had with the core team when we had uh, Alex and Pavel join us uh, live to talk about signals. Um, so I, you know, I'm pretty excited about about that. I there's and even when Minko came and tried to teach me Angular and how dependency injection works. So yeah, I mean there is an interest out there. Angular's been kind of on a bit of a resurgence. People are rooting for Angular. It's kind of funny how you go from the like being the big most popular framework to being almost like an underdog story again. Like it's it's kind of cool to see because I, I think I, sh I showed this before. Actually, you know what? I'm going to show this right now while we while we wait for people to flood in. Right? It, uh, what is it? State of JavaScript. Right? If I if I go back, I forget which year it was. Maybe I mean I should get the the latest. Right? Is that the latest? And I went to the like obviously. Um, where is it? Libraries, front end. I want to see it. Okay, yeah. This year was more impressive on my story, but Angular is the only JavaScript framework that I know in history that has like 
declined, declined, greatly declined, declined, and then started crawling back up. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out here. Everybody else usually, like, sure, there's a little variation here, but usually when, when, once you're down, you're down and out. Like, here's Ember, you know what I mean? I, it's not just front end. We can go back end frameworks too. It's just like, like, here's Gatsby. Like, <laughs> so Angular, Angular is still very much alive and kicking, you know? Yeah. No, Twitch is great for the chat. I, I actually should pull up Twitch in another window because I miss all those wonderful Twitch specific features through the StreamYard chat. Like I don't get to see your subscriptions. I don't get to see, um, uh, you know, first times chatter, all that kind of stuff. Easy fix for skipping pre-rolls. Yeah, you can sub. Yes, obviously you can sub. Yeah, the Twitch, <laughs> did the link not work? That's we have way more people on YouTube today than in Twitch. How's that going? Okay, yeah. Okay, they're starting to come in. Okay, good, good, good. All right. Angular was the first framework I used. I started in V11. Okay, that's not that long ago, but I, I, I found the story a lot recently has been like the last five years, there's been a lot of React that when I talk to a lot of newer developers, they're like, there's, they, it's not about HTML, CSS, or you know anything else. It's just like, I learned web dev in this bubble, there was React. To be fair, during that same time, there was also Angular. But um, it was very different at the time when AngularJS first showed up on the scene. Yeah, see, we got some Angular fans here, right? So yeah, no, this is good, this is good. Ah, uh, there we go, people are starting to show up. I said those pre-rolls are deadly. Mm. All right. Wish Angular Elements would got my love. Lit is lit, but <laughs> Angular rocks. Yeah, I mean, Web Components is a whole other thing. I don't even know if I'm going to talk about those today. But yeah, I, it's interesting that in, within Google itself, they've had a lot of fracturing. But this happens at any large company, right? Like different people, different objectives, working on spaces that could, could be considered similar. And then you end up with multiple solutions to the same sort of problem. At least it gets, yeah, yeah. Can we have the Twitch link? Yeah, sure, sure. It should just be Twitch TV slash Ryan solid. I think I might have to make sure that I actually have the whole HTTPS colon. Okay, putting that out there. Okay, so we probably should get started here because you guys have probably seen seen enough of just having my, my face up here. And we, we have a guest today um, to talk about Angular and about his meta framework analog, which is built on top of Angular. So, um, like, give me one second. I know that's like the perfect lead in, but yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm like behind on my, 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 uh, banners and stuff. All right, here we go. Okay. Let's try that again. <laughs> Obviously you, you all have, uh, seen enough of my, my smug mug here that we should actually bring on our guest today. Um, to talk about Angular and more importantly, his meta framework analog, uh, which is built on top of Angular. So um, let's let's welcome Brandon Roberts to the stream. Hey, Hi, Ryan. <laughs> hey, how are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. You know, um, it's a nice sweltering hot day here in San Jose. Um, these lights are going to just burn me up in no time. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the, it's not it's not as as hot here today, but yeah, we've been having some of that that heat also. Not maybe not so much as out there, but yeah, somewhat. Yeah, so I'm super stoked to have you join us. As I mentioned before, I was a you know a JavaScript library framework author, and I've now found myself being a meta framework author. Something we have in common, um, where you have been building um, a JavaScript meta framework in Angular. But before we actually talk about analog, let's talk about Angular just for a moment. Cause like, I, I guess why Angular, like what's, what, what, what's your background <laughs> or history with Angular? What, what led you to building a meta framework in Angular? Yeah. Yeah. So the, it, it go, it goes back. Well, it goes back some years now at this point. So, um, I've been in the Angular community probably seven or eight years now. And, but prior to that, I was a back-end developer. I was doing PHP, had done some C Sharp, uh, VB, uh, VB.net. That, uh, that was even further back from that, uh, <laughs> further I've back there. there. But, uh, but yeah, so I was 
uh, doing back end work at a job. They were doing they were doing like full stack PHP back then. So they were like everything was on the server, uh, everything was rendered that way. But there were I was actually working on a it was a public facing site, uh, and they were migrating it from just PHP four or whatever it was back then to PHP on the back end and Angular JS on or Angular JS what it is called now on the on the front end. So uh, I. I had always wanted to get into like the front end ecosystem. So uh, my friend, Mike, Mike Ryan, who's uh, we've worked on projects before, open source projects before, too, uh, which I'll get into. But he he asked me if I wanted to try some work on Angular JS and uh, in addition to like doing the back end work. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll get, you know, I'll see what uh, what we can try to get going and build there. So. I kind of started down that path of doing front end Angular JS work back then, but this was around about the time that uh, Angular JS was, uh, I guess, ramping down, and like Angular two at the time was in alpha stage, I believe. So, so uh, this is like 2015 ish. Yeah, 2014, 2015. Yeah, around yeah. about that time. Um, so yeah, I I had gotten in. Oh, uh, Angular two was coming along. Um, and like I said, it hadn't even gotten shipped yet officially. So, and where we worked, we kind of had the luxury of being able to basically ship, basically ship whatever we wanted to. So if we wanted to, you know, ship cutting edge or be on the bleeding edge of uh, projects and things, we, we got to pick our stack. So, right. Uh, so yeah, we were, we were shipping, <laughs> we were shipping Angular 2 uh, projects while it was still in alpha beta. Uh, stages and that was initially how I got involved in well at least got introduced to uh, Angular JS and then Angular too. Hmm. Uh, but how I really got involved in the community was uh, basically like trying to I wanted I always wanted to start contributing back to open source so I basically jumped in on GitHub and because Angular two was you know still people were still trying to figure it out uh, and we had done a good amount of work on it. Uh, I was going into GitHub. I was helping people with issues. Uh, I was trying to just can, kind of getting involved in the in the community with uh, Angular. So I would, you know, help people there. I ended up, you know, somebody that was working on the Angular di more directly uh, on the docs. They asked if I wanted. Th they noticed I could I could pretty I could communicate pretty well with uh, as far as helping people with issues and things like that. So I ended up working on the Angular docs team. Uh, for a stretch also uh, uh, oh, okay, in okay. the community. So. Yeah. So just to kind of get the get that, you're building Angular 2 projects that mm -hmm. like ahead of Angular 2 getting released, which is yep. the first thing that I, that caught my head. <laughs> I don't, no one does that anymore. Like everybody's mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, that's experimental. You know, I, I've noticed a huge repulsion against like not proven stuff these days. Whereas mm -hmm. like if you go back to 2013, 14, 15, people are like, oh yeah, this is, been around in beta for like six months like let's let's go mm -hmm. <laughs> but um but the other thing here is you, you got involved in open source and that's huge um yeah how, what how, how like how what did that look like initially for you i'm just i'm digging in a little on this but i just because yeah, sure. the open source angle is like kind of obviously interesting to me like um was this just something you had some time when you were like between stuff at work or did you like take this on yourself how did how did how did because it led to you actually working on the official Angular docs, yeah. which is amazing. Um, yes, t just elaborate a bit more on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I had, like I said, I had been wanting to get involved, and in, I've been like, yeah, I've been basically a consumer of open source for the longest. Like when I was uh, much younger, uh, I used to, <laughs> I used to run Linux uh, distributions and build all that stuff from scratch, and. Uh, I got exposure to like open source in that way, but on the like consumer side of things, and it was something that I thought was like a kind of a large barrier to to contribute to, because you know if I'm coming in looking at the Linux kernel and all the machinery and reviews it takes to contribute to that, instead of looking at smaller projects, it seems like a very large lift to to kind of get involved in open source. But uh, like as I kind of moved along and kind of use some other projects then it, it became it became more obvious that open source was more approachable in other areas there's like that's not like the linux kernel and nothing else there's like <laughs> of course a multitude of uh open source projects out there so 
getting involved in angular kind of gave me that that window that foot into the into the open source ecosystem i kind of found a place where i could slide in uh and it was it was great i mean the people who were on the angular team at the time uh one of them being rob warmald who is the founder of another open source project that i worked on he uh he was like one of the first people i kind of interacted with in the angular project and then you know it was you know, I just came in, I was like, hey, I want to help. And it was like, hey, we need some help. So uh, and then the other people in the community uh, definitely gave me opportunities to to kind of thrive there. So the one the first part was like I was doing all this, like in addition to my day job. So I wasn't doing like open source at work or anything like that. So it was, it's always mostly always been like um, nights and weekends and um you know, side side project work, that kind of thing, as far as contributing to open source. But that's kind of how I how I initially got in and kind of moved my way along the 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 ecosystem there. Yeah, no, that's 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 awesome here because, like as you said, you were just had an interest. You you always kind of you know interest in open source, but you got to go you know something more attainable or like, mm -hmm. and then next, as I said, you you do some stuff, you help a bit, and next thing you know, you're writing docs. Mm -hmm. um first stint um uh, w w when was that the you're working on the angular docs around what time period uh well i yeah i had two stints on the docs this was around probably 2014 2015 okay. um this was around angular 2 it was coming out of beta they had official like the official docs and stuff up then uh so i was like doing the day job thing i was writing articles and things for the docs and working with the rest of the the docs team there and like in addition to that i was still like helping people on github and and then i en ended up getting involved in and in most of these things like like i said kind of came out of the the job that i had before where we got to experiment with a lot of things uh so we ended up basically building something that was like redux for uh angular um, which is called, like I mentioned Rob Warmall before, which is the, that open source project is in GRX. Yeah. So it's like uh, Redux and RxJS kind of mixed together, uh, which is <laughs> like a combination that not many people were, uh, were necessarily interested in at the time. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, we, we kind of I mean, shepherded that project alone. I mean, there is, what is it, Redux Observable on the React side? Someone yep. did try and do a similar thing. I, I guess I can... Picture it, but you're right. It is an interesting thing because you're mi mixing push-based reactivity with like a centralized synchronous mm -hmm. store. Uh, at least that's the re the reduxing. I don't know if if it was a little bit different in Angular to suit RX more. It's just I know how many I, I saw the Redux observable side, and that was yeah. like like you know what's the other one? Redux Saga on the generator Redux side, like sagas. Yeah, mm -hmm. you and you're like definitely like. Like it's a very cerebral place to live, um, you know. They're trying <laughs> yeah. to figure out how all this all wires. Whereas, yeah, I would I imagine that because NGRX became kind of like de facto uh, mm -hmm. store technology or Angular. I imagine it might have been a little bit more approachable. But um, yeah, the yeah, and that was that was kind of where I guess like my I guess I, my footing in the ecosystem kind of really grew was the NGRX project and uh, Rob. Like I said, Rob started the project and then. Uh, me and Mike uh, kind of took it over from there and kind of ran with it and kind of built out a lot of the things uh, like the thing that's similar to uh, Redux Observable in NGRX is NGRX FX, uh, which is just like a side effect uh, management library. But right. But yeah, the yeah, it be, ended up becoming like the choice uh, in the ecosystem just because Angular traditionally has in I say Angular as if it's a person, but they they haven't taken a they didn't take like a stance on what you you should use for state management so and people were looking for you know something to use in that area so we kind of slid into that spot and uh kind of kept iterating on the, on the project and kind of grew it to to where it is today so yeah yeah that's really cool and it's actually very indicative of the time i think everybody was kind of that was the thinking what was attractive about say react and angular both was that you would start with like plain looking data almost and then you would just like they both had different mechanisms, whether it was React's virtual DOM or Angular's Zone JS. But like mm -hmm. 
they made it that you, in theory, didn't have to worry too much about how things change if you just like you could just use plain data and it would update. Mm -hmm. um, it's very interesting to see how in both spaces that evolved in time to that people are to the not people we already said angular wasn't a person um <laughs> to the frameworks actually realizing that you know no no we we should probably make our data special and understand our changes because yeah. you're going to get there eventually anyways but it, yeah that evolution was very i feel like it's like something that needed to happen i think the ecosystem needed to go through this whole cycle to understand where we are mm -hmm. and um on the angular one yeah ngrx was like it's you know it's like, you know, when people talk about Redux and React, I'd say NGR acts even more so with Angular than Redux and React because Redux got replaced by other things over time. My understanding yeah. is NGRX is still to this day the, yeah. the, 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 the yeah, store. It's still, yeah, it's still widely, widely used. Uh, if we're just looking at like NPM stats or whatever, like one in six apps are still using, and it's still like our, our downloads and things are still growing, which is, you're kind of an indicative of of the project at, at in our like our team has grown over time it's just been like a a, a nice project that uh that i'm proud of anyway that's still i mean it's not that the project isn't going anywhere but yeah but yeah it's definitely grown over time in in the community and even with the like the evolution of uh, angular and signals and everything like we're we're kind of rolling in with that with that space too just because we've you know we've done it for a while so we've had conversations yeah. with the team too about you know what does a you know what does this world look like for like existing apps or even going forward with in a world where like NGRX has been you know kind of like the mainstay for a long time so yeah no definitely no and that's awesome um so yeah working in grx and then you know this is all through uh yeah i mean mid to 2010s mm -hmm. um what uh, yeah, I, I, is there much more st like? W w let's head towards analog. How does yeah. how do how do you get from there to analog? What what happened? What do yeah. you see? <laughs> so um, so yeah, like I'm working on NGRX. I'm like and we're like building stuff with Angular. We kind of live in this sort of bubble kind of thing where you do things. I call it like the Angular way. Like he kind of talked about this before, where like Angular does its own thing. Or kind of like on this island we're off on uh you got your own angular is a very like comprehensive system its own tooling build tools and all that and uh just looking at like where the web because i've i mean i've been around the web for like a long uh, like a really long time at this point so uh just looking at where like the landscape of the web was going um tools like everybody was like using webpack and then like v came along a few years ago a couple of years ago or at this point but uh and it seemed like v came along and then like the resurgence of these like better frameworks just started like popping up like svelte kid and Next.js, if you want to you know call it a meta framework but the the thing and it was one of those things like okay angular already does a lot but these other it seemed like people were coming at it from like a different approach as far as like the meta frameworks go, as far as what you get out of the box. So that was kind of my, my initial, what I, like I said, what I was looking at as the landscape of where meta frameworks were before I even got the, the like idea to kind of move forward with that. So. Right. Right. And uh, I mean, a key part of the meta framework thing is that there are full stack and SSR and yeah. I know that Angular did have some sort of SSR solution historically, yeah. but I don't remember. I, it was it an Angular it's, Universal? Yeah. But I, I don't. I don't know if anyone actually ever used it much. I, I like. I never got the impression when even when I was like talking to people in the Angular community that they they spent much time with SSR uh, generally mm. speaking. So that must yeah. have been interesting. Yeah, I got that that kind of impression also. I mean, yeah, Angular Universal has been around for a while, and uh, so there's there's Angular Universal, which was uh, it was still like uh, I think a, like a community a community driven project. Uh, I believe like Patrick uh, Stapleton, Patrick JS, as as I like to call or people like to call him. He, him, and uh, a few other people, Jeff Welpley, and even uh, Jeff Cross from that works at NX. Now, I think they were part of the people that were on there originally on that team uh, trying to move Universal forward. So, yeah, Universal was a solution that's out there uh, for SSR, and it does some things with SSG and pre-rendering, too. Uh, and then there's also Scully, 
which was another like it had a it was it had more of a focus. It was like a static site generator. Like it was like, it was like Gatsby, right? Uh, but for Angular, so uh, it kind of wrapped around your Angular app uh, in that way to that you build static sites on top of that. So there there have been some other projects out there that of course predated uh, analog, but they weren't necessarily meta frameworks. They were like Universal does a little bit of this scully does a little bit of that uh and um but they were still just kind of staying in in their like niche i would say as far as what they were offering and then of course like i said angular already is a framework itself so trying to for me it was like part of it was i'll be honest it was like out of spite like (laughs) like there there are these other everybody else has a meta framework out here why doesn't why can't Angular have one also uh, to kind of package up these kind of things on top of it to make the experience better there? So uh, it kind of started out that way because I thought about it, thought about starting the project even a long way before I actually tried to make put the pieces together to try to make it work. Because I, I was kind of like you. I wanted I wanted somebody else to build the thing. <laughs> Uh, and then I could just like talk about the thing and use the thing because <laughs> uh, <laughs> then I wouldn't have to necessarily have the burden of uh, all the maintenance and all the, the things that come along with that. But uh, but like I said, at some point, I I, I wanted it uh, bad enough that I was willing to like sink some time into it to see if it would at least go somewhere. So uh, so that's kind of how I got the, the motivation to, to start the project, at least. This is sort of an aside, but I was just interested. Does Angular change much version to version? It was just like, my company's using mm-hmm. Angular and Universal for news public front in Germany a lot, but it's a bit of a struggle. We're also still on V10, so that's part of the problem. Oh, man. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. Uh, Angular does two major versions every year. Uh, so every six months, they do a, a major. And the the Ang- Angular has gone through a good set of changes along the way that have held some projects back. One of, one of those things being just like the Ivy project or the Ivy initiative, I think, wh- whatever you want to call it. But Ivy was like a rewrite, an internal rewrite of the Angular compiler and its rendering system. Uh, but they wanted to do all this in like a backwards compatible way where you could still, one day you could flip over to Ivy and ideally your app would still work the, mostly the same way. Uh, but that process took like, uh, <laughs> V10 to <laughs> yeah, there's two. That process took like two or three years. Um, and like Angular, I think slowed the, the things around Angular kind of slowed down around that time uh, that they were doing that. But, but yeah, like I said, two, two majors every year. And the goal has always to been not to break things as much as possible, but people just invariably get stuck on older versions because something that they were using didn't get updated or because uh, it's, it's hard to move like the Titanic, right? Because <laughs> the ecosystem has to move along with it. So uh, Angular is still moving along, but the, but the more of the, some of those changes and things did hold some people or projects back that haven't been able to upgrade yet. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. It was a little bit of an aside, but I was just like thinking about that because we were talking about Angular 2 a moment ago, and then suddenly talking about migrating from 10 to 16, and I was yeah. like, it's only been a few years. I, I don't know many other frameworks that have gone through that mm-hmm. many major versions in that period of time, but it's good. I mean, if you're on a cadence, you have an expectation, and it lets things keep on moving forward. There's a positive to that. It was just, um, it was just, yeah, something that I was a little bit interesting, a little bit unaccustomed to, and a little, like React suddenly showed up at React 15, but mm-hmm. that's because they were in 0.14, 0.13. And then they're oh, just like, okay. they were like, okay, we're just going to, instead of going 0.15, we're just going to call it 15.0. There was mm-hmm. never a React 1 or a React 2 or whatever. They just went straight. They, React 1 was basically React 15. Oh, so, okay. I did, I, today, <laughs> I did not know that. I, just, I've all, I guess maybe my first uh, references to it probably around 15, 16. And then, because yeah. I, I look at, look at like the other projects like that and you look at react and it was like 16 to 17 or it was <laughs> yeah. like four or five four years or so before they bumped that next major so 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, 15 wasn't really 1.0, but it was a big change for stability. I guess, like, 13. Like, there's really, from a public standpoint, been, like, 13, point 13, point 14, 15, uh, 16, 17, 18. There's been yeah. about six versions of React. Like, and the first couple kind of blur together. So, like, maybe there's been four versions. Like, that. The, the, that's yeah. just what I, you know, so... Yeah, it is a little bit different. You know, there's four versions of Svelte. Um, mm -hmm. There's... Uh, there's three versions of you. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. There's also a version of Angular that never existed, the version three, <laughs> version three, which I yeah. kind of had a part in, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's, a, that's more maybe an inside, inside joke that still lives to this day. Yeah, 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 no, yeah that's actually true. I, didn't, I never saw Angular 3. There was Angular 2 and Angular 4, mm -hmm. but, yeah, I was like, I was counting by even numbers, but it was, it was more of yeah. like the, uh, what was it, HTML, or there there. Went from like e ES three to ES five, like ES four just disappeared. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, the the yeah the inside story on that one is we we built a router called NGRX router, and Angular router wasn't necessarily settled at the time. So what we ended up doing was folding NGRX router into Angular, and they just skipped from two to four because <laughs> like we were on the that was the router was version three. And uh, the rest of the framework was still on version two, so they just like bumped everything to to version four. So, uh, nice little nice little backstory there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So yeah. Um. Yeah. We're just talking Angular stuff now, but yeah. Uh, so Vite. Yeah. Make a meta framework because you can because it's like let's show that Angular can be part of this uh community you know that's moving forward with the meta framework what's hip what's mm -hmm. cool what people are talking about on twitter um yeah i had yeah i had dug into like i said trying to put the pieces together and it was the the choice was like do i want to go with webpack and try to put something together there with that or like i said Vite was taking over basically taking over the landscape and try to see if if we could get something working with that but uh and would angular even like fit into that model of how V works and everything. So yeah, that was, uh, like I said, part of the initial, initial, uh, challenge there to, to get those two things working together. Cause like I said, part of me wanted angular to get off of this Island of, uh, well, we like, we're doing our own thing. We don't necessarily interact with the community, community based tools, I guess as much and that sort of thing. So, uh, that was, that was that part of it part of where I wanted to use Vite as kind of like a baseline also. I think I've seen recently even that there's some official templates that use Vite these days. Or I saw, I saw an announcement or something. I thought I saw Minko post something like a, a month mm -hmm. or so ago. Like Vite has actually come into the Angular ecosystem beyond yeah, Analog yeah. now. Well, yeah, Vite, it, a Angular does use Vite today, but it's only as a dev server. So it I doesn't see. necessarily take full advantage of uh Vite's like build pipeline. They have a, a solution there where they're using like ES build uh to compile everything and then it uses uh Vite to Vite's dev server to to serve those artifacts and that's kinda how the the infrastructure is kinda moving along there. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean it's, it's still cool to kind of see that move forward. But yeah let's uh let's talk a little bit more analog. Um yep. so yeah, I guess what when when I guess it was was it shortly after V two when this all got started? Like it was the same time that I started looking at it. It was a little bit later. I I, I first was, heard of Analog at the V Conf um, yeah. last year, but um, I yeah, said, I, I think it was um, I think it was V three when I like really kind of started diving in to see what what would work and what wouldn't work because like starting from scratch. Uh, uh, of course, like Angular has its own tooling, but they they do have a package like the Angular compiler. You do have access to use that. So, and I was kind of looking how that is used in the the regular Angular tooling to uh, see what how we could bridge the gap there with uh, Angular compiler and Vite. So, they they have a slightly different model on how Angular compilation works versus how uh, things integrate with Vite, because Vite is very much about like single file compilation, uh, HMR, all those uh, things that come along with it. And Angular is 
the Angular compiler is built around uh, it's, it's built around TypeScript. So it heavily embed basically wraps the TypeScript compiler and adds like Angular specific uh, metadata to it. So uh, being able to use those two things together, uh, this was the initial step was getting the V plugin to be able to, you know, uh, transform like Angular source files and run it through uh, Vite's build pipeline. So, yeah, I see. It. Thanks, Sha, for the thanks for the shout out there. Uh, but yeah, that was the the initial idea on at least to get any of it working. It had to start with the Vite plugin because that's like right. the, that's like the window into the Vite ecosystem uh, was for me. Right, right, and also to have SSR working mm -hmm. with that too. Um, I don't, as I said, I don't know what the state of SSR was. All I, the only thing I know about Angular SSR, was that they didn't do hydration. They just like re render yep. like SSR and like they had two modes: SSR <laughs> and client rendering, and they just put it together. There's no like yeah. hydrate the thing. Uh, is is that that still true today or? No, there. This this has helped the the. E ecosystem also but they there has been more of a focus on the ssr story in angular so uh now it's in developer preview but there's client hydration that's uh included you can add client hydration to your to your ssr setup and we're not doing this destructive hydration anymore where uh of course like i said you render it on the server then it basically destroys everything and and rebuilds the the entire tree but now it it renders on the server and then on the client, it will attach the correct listeners and hydrate the application directly in place without doing the whole destructive hydration, destructive hydration uh, as it used to. So uh, that part has gotten better about the the uh, the process of how you work with SSR and Angular and Analog uses uses that also. Uh, but that was developed, like I said, in with the uh, in Ang by the Angular team itself. And I believe in probably in conjunction with the probably Chrome Aurora uh, team because they, they, I think they have been doing like a big push on performance uh, yeah. in the in the like broader ecosystem. And uh, I've I've heard more than once that uh, <laughs> Angular out in the wild uh, is not very has not been very fast and performant uh, traditionally. So uh, making mm -hmm. it more of a, they've made it more of an effort to to work around that. So. Yeah, no, I, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And from the way you're talking about it, it sounds like these updates are something that you were very easily able to, like the core team adds mm -hmm. this feature and then you were able to just like turn it on and it, it worked pretty straightforward then for you. Yeah, the, yeah, the SSR, like we, I guess to be, to be clear, we aren't using any of like the Angular Universal uh, source or anything like that because they, they have moved basically a lot of the thing, the, the internals of what Angular Universal used to be, like into the core framework. So, um, so basically, like any, I don't say anybody, but like any project can basically take advantage of those SSR APIs and client hydration and use those to build something with. So, and yeah, Analog is still building on top of on top of Angular at the at the end of the day for for those things. Yeah. Okay. No, that's that's good, and I'm glad that it's that that straightforward. This this is what I was sort of getting at when I was talking about going between the different versions and stuff. And it feels yeah. like there's been a shift in the Angular team in the last, I want to say, I don't know how long. Like, it feels like the last year and a half, mm -hmm. uh, roughly, where like, I don't know. It's part of that, you know, revitalizing, but it's also just feels like a, just a different Angular team. I know it's not yeah. completely. I mean, some of the 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 old guard have moved on yeah. i know like mishko and igor and all them have kind of moved on but uh, it's more than that uh, it yeah. feels like yeah i think i think so too uh the like it, it's interesting that you have that because someone asked me if if mishko and igor ever moved on from angular did did that did i think it that it would survive uh past that and i was like you know we'll have to see because <laughs> i don't know you know once the like the kind of figureheads of a framework leave then you got to see where like where things are going to go from there but but like you said the things are definitely taking a turn and i i attribute that to people like sarah drasner and uh minko getchev who are on the angular team and uh even other people simona there's too many people to name but there's definitely have been some people who have like transitions off the 
the angular team and some people that are still there but the team that that is there now or that has they have like built up over the, i think the past couple of le- years like you said has definitely has a different take on how angular should be positioned and the things that they focus on so i think it's been healthy for the the I think it's been healthy for Angular and healthy for like the community uh, in that way. Uh, I, I did get a question. I wanted to wait till the right time to ask, and this feels like the mm. right time. They're like, uh, the, "Are you afraid of Angular doing their own meta framework?" Is like they've been, you know, they've been pushing the boundary a bit. Yeah. Or is there any concern about them getting in the game themselves? Uh, I have had that. Yes, I, I honestly that. It, is in the back of my mind, but I, I do have conversations with the team about uh, like what they're building. So we do have a like a line of communication there. So if they if they do, then, hey, maybe uh, we'll see what what comes out of that. But I haven't gotten any indication in the near future that they're that they're going to build their own thing. But like I said, I I was on the fence of like building the thing in the first place. But but it was more because I wanted to see it happen. So if the if the team sees that as a focus, then we'll see where things land there. Because there's already some like overlap there now, even with like Angular Universal, and uh, there's an upcoming feature where Angular Angular CLI will be doing SSR uh, and SSG. So there is some overlap there, but I think there is a, a space for a meta framework in Angular, even despite what the what the team does so yeah yeah i'm like trying to think of like i'm not under any ndas or anything angular (laughs) team has been doing something a lot of really cool stuff recently i mentioned Mm -hmm. a year ago that they did a bake-off with a bunch of javascript frameworks where they like they're like hey angular team and whiz team and you know people work on the frameworks team at google let's you do spell app you do a react app you do a Mm view app see how it's different understand it and get perspective well, mm-hmm. they just did, I mean, again, they just did another one, except they did meta frameworks uh, this past yep. week. So, hey, I, hey, I, I wasn't under NDA at also, but I was there. Analog <laughs> was uh, part of the, right. yeah, Analog right. was part of the, the meta frameworks in yep. that group. So uh, I take it as a vote of confidence. Uh, <laughs> right, right. I, I think they're trying to understand what those pieces are needed for all the meta frameworks. Yeah, Solid yep. Start was in that group, which surprised me because sometimes they, you know, I'm in beta and they're like, Couple of, at one point, someone asked a question. They're like, "Where's this feature? I couldn't find any documentation on it." I'm like, "Yeah, because uh, we haven't implemented it yet." Um, <laughs> but yeah, you know, and I felt kit, Quick City. I like, I think a whole a, a, most of the known meta frameworks were part of it. And yeah. I'm, this is part of that change of perspective that I'm talking about. But it also suggests that um, they are looking at this from a primitive standpoint, mm-hmm. from a platform standpoint, less so from uh, like we're going to build a next competitor standpoint. So I, I just, that's why I want to throw that out there. Cause uh, yeah, I had a suspicion analog would have been in that group. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and I think, it, I think it, like you said, looking at it, I think that is where the, the team more focuses on is these days. It's like the primitives of the, the building blocks that enable things like uh, analog to be built or even other like solutions in that area. So that's the part that, that's the part where I think the, at least the relationship there is healthy and that we're not like trying to step on each other's toes or anything um, in that way. So uh, if if they build some things that, you know, help it help improve what analog does, you know, I'm all for it. And even you can see that with the new things that have uh, come out recently with RFCs for. So and even with signals and everything, all these things I feel like are moving Angular, Angular along, uh, Angular itself along now where it like stands in the in the ecosystem as a whole we'll see but uh but i like the shift of where where things are going definitely so someone's asking here speaking of angular performance times do you think angular signal like one of the on the jet server approach <laughs> i feel like this is a question for me um right now i wouldn't expect a huge difference because signals are initially being used just as a way to like drive zone or drive like the yeah. the existing change detection it's just like a a very coarse grained way of doing it Phase two will make that better, which they're already like designing out. They have RFCs for it. Phase mm-hmm. three is when you finally get to there. And at that point, we might be seeing some pretty impressive stuff. But we're a, probably a few years away from that. But uh, the, is the question, will will eventually get there? Um, possibly. I think there's certain constraints around the way Angular works. But I, the one thing I've noticed about the team is they're willing to kind of you know, mess with the perception a little bit. 
And as long as they have a migration path, and one thing I've noticed is that work that they did previously on the compiler and stuff has abstracted away a lot of those details to a point that, and the templating, that they can do more than you might expect they can do just yeah. because they have that abstraction layer. Yeah. Uh, hope that's a good answer. I, I just couldn't... Sid JS framework, but I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> it's a trigger word, the, the JS yeah. framework benchmark, yeah. But yeah, right. the, uh, but yeah, like you said, being more, like I said, performance minded. Uh, like I said, we'll we'll see what the what the benchmarks show up in a, a few years. I, like I want to see some. The thing with, I know we're uh, we're talking about analog also, but. Like I said, the thing about Angular that has been with me for the longest time is I want to, everybody's wanting like, when is Angular getting JSX? And I'm like, I, you know, I don't, I don't see it happening because just for like from a control standpoint and uh, they already have like their own templating language and everything. So uh, we'll see like what that evolves into if it's just like Google's flavor of JSX, but yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on that, yeah, signals don't actually make a huge difference in the benchmark. They make like the fractional, like if like the difference between the speedy reactive system almost makes no things. Most of that benchmark is just dumping DOM elements onto the page. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I there's there's other pieces to it. As I said, uh, Angular, interestingly enough, on a performance standpoint, it's it was always interesting. I'd always talk to Angular folks about performance, and they always. There's a perception in the wider ecosystem that Angular wasn't very performant, but when I talked to Angular folks, there was a perception that their stuff was performant. And I was always confused about this discrepancy. And I realized that a lot of it had to do with like the problem scope. Like Angular rarely ever micro benchmarked, but they would like look at some kind of larger thing and then make the mm -hmm. determination on the performance on that, which is actually a better way to determine performance. But there was always this like kind of gap between the people who would be doing micro benchmarks and people who were doing this kind of like trying to look at real worldish scenario characteristics yeah. thing. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think, I think there's just more awareness now of how that fits into the whole story now. Cause the, pro the problem is most people, when they pick up a framework, they go, go and they hear performance, they go make some stupid test and it's the stupidest <laughs> test. It's like, how fast can I update this text in a Dom node? And then they go, this is slow. This is fast. And it just so happens. It's all really, really good at those tests. Like really, really, really good. But there's more to performance than, than that. Um, so I will say this. Angular has managed over the years. Them and React are always around the same performance level, except Angular mm -hmm. is usually always just a tiny bit in front. I, I don't know how, like, okay. what, 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 what the, what, like, on my benchmarks and stuff. I don't know what the thing is, but over time, I've watched this over, like, almost a decade. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they seem to be always lockstep. And Angular always seems to be just like a tiny right. bit in front of React. I don't know if that's just <laughs> they're like a... the they're playing the long the long <laughs> game on performance day. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 interesting. Um, anyway. Um, okay, so um, okay, I want to look at an analog here in a minute and talk about yeah. it. We're starting to get a little bit of QA. Uh, type questions, which is what I expected here. I'm trying to yeah, think sure. of if I want to push them off too much, but I actually I got. Before we get into it, it's it's hard without looking at it. For some, uh, Tristan asks here, with hindsight, if you could oh, start analog again, what would you done differently? You know, um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. without seeing it, it's harder for me to get that perspective from the audience standpoint. But I, this is a very probably a very good question. So you, go for it. Sure. Yeah, I've I've talked about this um, on Twitter also about if I could do some things differently, and one of those things was. Uh, being built on like the for some people who don't know like analog is built on top of nitro as like its server engine um but the what i would if i could go back and like have a fresh look at it today the way astro has come along and kind of built up that infrastructure to me like astro is basically like a meta framework in a box like it has all the pieces to do ssr to do ssg uh, to do API routes, all those things are kind of provided for you, and and you can hook into Astro's like infrastructure. So one of those things would be to, if I could start fresh, I would look at using Astro as like the thing underneath. Um, and I actually looked at doing that, but the I think some of the things I ran into, well, some of them were technical, and some were just like. Uh, 
people problems, I guess, if you want to, if you want to call it that. Like on the on the technical side, I think that things fit together well, and I can make them work. Uh, on the people side of things, the I think it would have been too far gone from the Angular ecosystem to use Astro uh, in that way. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. It sounds like we should share notes. See, I, I went the other path, and I've been tinkering with Astro the last couple months, where I've had time not at conferences. And obviously, I've hit a lot of the technical snags in that. And I'm like, I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I'm, I, I didn't give Nitro a good enough first look. So mm -hmm. I think we need, we should share notes. Um. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, the, I was, like I said, I was looking at because when I, <laughs> when I started Analog, I was like, uh, I was a team of one, uh, trying to get the project off the ground before. So, and I didn't want to like have to rebuild the whole world of like deployment targets and messing with uh browser support in different areas those all that stuff i wanted to try to get something that was working off the ground so uh and i looked at nitro because i didn't know that nitro at first was like practically decoupled from nuxt because nuxt uses nitro also uh but it allowed it it felt like to me like nitro provided that that sweet spot of being able to drop it in something else and, or drop it in uh, another library because it has a, a JavaScript API that you can hook into. So, uh, yeah, those were the, that was like the friction, the friction points for me was to get the project going was not to have to rebuild everything from scratch and then yeah. not to have to support like Cloudflare and Netlify and every target out there from scratch. It's so, not fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we built everything from scratch, and now we're like, that's what we regret about Solid Start. We're like, we should have yeah. not built everything from scratch. But yeah, maybe we'll look at Nitro a little bit uh, and how it fits yeah. in when we look at the code. But let's, let's, let's flip modes a little bit here and start actually looking at what an analog project might look like or like what, what analog looks like. I don't know how I should get started here. Should I Actually, I'm going to pull up the website just for a second so, yeah, I can, so I can take a look at this and we can talk to that a little bit and then maybe you can show off some code here in a moment but i'm gonna yeah let's switch to this mode analog full stack angular meta framework v power yeah, um, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna change the tagline here at some point but yeah that's the that's the one for today i'm trying to trying to do something that's you know less centered around meta frameworks and kind of like something that that's a little more catchy but we'll see i know what the, i know what the goal is we just got to put it put it down there so yeah that's 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 the punchline at today anyway what do we got here someone's like can i uh nathan's here can i get the elevator pitch for analog uh, okay the elevator pitch is uh <laughs> it's a meta framework that helps you build and ship applications faster with angular so there's the elevator pitch all right so yeah we got ssr and ssg mm -hmm. what, what does hybrid mean in this i just it Hybrid in this case means that you can still have SSR running, but it's like a combination of pre-render pages plus SSR. Gotcha. So gotcha. If you want to pre-render part of the, the app and still have it, some other parts uh, rendered at, at request time, then it supports both of those. Right. And this, in fact, was the feature that the uh, Angular team asked for that I was like not implemented yet. <laughs> so I'll start, it has a fully static mode and a fully dynamic mode. Uh, it doesn't have a half and half mode. I added that in the Angular, inter or sorry, the Astro integration, but I have not, that was the missing feature. So this is a key feature here. And then file-based routing and API routes. And this is the analog logo right here. Um, yep. Let me yep, see. I, yeah, I, I came up with the logo because I felt I've said this before, like if you're going to go through all this work of trying to put a project together, you got to come up with a, a logo so people will recognize the thing. So it still has the uh, I think maybe you can see where it's going too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll I mean, because I, I see I, I see a combination of the Nux logo with okay, the Angular. I seen that one before. Yeah, the, 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 because the Nux logo looks like this with the Angular mm -hmm. red with like a, some kind of analog signal across the top but that's yeah. that's so sorry the nux logo was not part of the intention here 
Well, sort of. The well, I, I'm going to blame it on the triangles because Nuxt logo has triangles. The Next JS is triangles. Oh right, Vers <laughs> Vercel, Vercel, Vercel does yeah. yeah, yeah. Does Next have triangles or is it just Vercel? Yeah, it's, I think it's Vercel, uh, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Vercel, yeah, Vercel, has yeah, Vercel logos, triangles. So yeah, it it kind of followed, <laughs> kind of followed in that path of of using triangles for the the logo and then like I said the the kind of wave link in the middle there was kind of like the analog um the analog across in the logo there i had originally i didn't really have a good name for the project at first yeah uh but there was another github project uh that had the name it was another person who tried to do something crazy with angular and they the github repo was named analog so i was like hmm okay that was i kind of had the same idea it was a crazy idea but I wanted to see it happen, so I kind of lifted that name and was able to get the, the domains and everything for it. So the, the branding was like intentional as far as the project goes. Okay, makes sense. So Solid Star for Angular or Next or Svelte Kit, exactly. Yeah. That's that's what this is. It's the, the, the full stack meta framework for Angular. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, need uh, to add, I need to add Solid Star to the list there. I don't have it... Uh, in the intro there as far as other meta frameworks. I think so. none of these other ones are in beta. I've been kind of, oh. we've been kind of dragging our feet. It's fair. You, 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 we can add us when you, you want to. <laughs> I, I have not been pushing Solid Start too hard on the advertised users. I mean, there's some companies using us in production. I've been only pushing Solid Start on like, here's some crazy technological innovation you've never seen before, that kind of angle. Um, so we still need to stabilize to it to a point where I feel mm -hmm. better pushing it on people, um, so to speak. But yeah, um, you have a CLI script, it looks like. Yep. It makes it easy to get started. Yeah, there's a couple of ways you can generate a new project. Uh, there's like the create analog way, and then we also integrate with NX uh, right. workspaces. So if you have a, because NX is like pretty big within the, the Angular ecosystem also. So if you want to like generate an analog project inside of an NX works NX workspace, you can you can do that too. Right, right. So and then we got routing, we have API routes, st static site generation, server side rendering. Yeah, I yeah. I, I just want to quickly quick, 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 quick. define event handler. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is part of uh, like I said, using Nitro underneath, yeah, and yeah, H three is. is a part yeah. of that whole like unjs. Yeah. Uh, NJS framework system so it allows us to like hook into that for API routes uh, in that way and this is kind of like I said driven through Nitro but we kind of built a bridge internally in analog to kind of meld those two things together yeah for those who aren't familiar with Nitro the Next.js guys well sort of the Next.js it's funny because this is not sponsored by there's 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 sorry there's there's Nux sorry I did say I meant Nux the Nux yeah. um there's a Nuxt Labs or like the Nuxt company, which is independent slightly from the Nuxt framework, mm -hmm. even though they sponsor work on the Nuxt framework. And then Anjas is like on the other side, which is the core pieces that are used in Nuxt, but completely open sourced and, you know, yep. like different, slightly different project lead. Like Daniel is involved, but he's not like the main guy where he's like the Nuxt open source guy who's, you know, mm -hmm. so, but Anjas has Nitro, which is a web server engine that works on Cloudflare, Netlify, yep. uh, Dino Edge, Vercel, like everywhere. H3, which is HP thing. It's just a whole bunch of, it's like the Unix philosophy, a whole bunch, unplug in, unstored. It's, it's a whole bunch of small pieces that work across all the platforms. So then like you don't have to worry about all this stuff. Um, like unstored, for example, is a key value store that apparently works everywhere, whether you're using KV stores, in Cloudflare or whether you, you know, have some other, you know, probably, I wouldn't be surprised if they get the, the new Vercel KV uh, in here. Yeah, it works. Not. Yeah, it already works with, uh, yeah, Vercel KV also. Yeah, so there you go. Um, does Nitro use the web standard fetch API? It does not, does it? This no, is like, no. th that's the one thing I found in my research, although mm -hmm. it looks like they, there's, they're going to support uh, standard web streams in their next version of H3, I heard. But yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was one thing I did notice is that the, the like it doesn't use the standard request response uh, model there, but I think there is a way, I've, I've seen someone submit a PR, I believe, that adds support for that. But like I said, it has to go through H3 and, and everything else before to make it to 
nitro. But yeah, that was one of the things I considered uh, in that way. If I, if I, but I think you could, like I said, you could probably support it if you wanted to. Uh, but at least for getting something off the, getting something off the ground, it, it works like it is today. Yeah. What's cool about the thing is, we actually mentioned this to to Daniel is when you go to Nitro page, they they show it all as like it's almost like it's an own opinionated meta mm -hmm. framework thing where you could kind of swap in any render you want. Yep. But what he, what 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 he, he, they don't talk about, which is actually cool, and what I'm seeing in your project is instead Nitro kind of aliases everything, and you can kind of like use it all together, and they have a CLI and they have everything. But all the pieces are independently available. This is why you were able to just like directly go to mm -hmm. H3 library and go, okay, I want to define an API route. Like Nitro, probably if I go here and go API, uh, where is it? Routing. API route, like they have a whole convention and a whole thing, yeah. but you can still use the pieces without following Nitro's specific conventions, um, if mm -hmm. I understand properly. So, yeah, that's it's definitely interesting to me. But okay, so yeah, I, I, maybe this is I, I'm like looking at the reference material. Maybe we, it's better just to um, look at a, a project <laughs> next, next, next. Yeah, that's no. Not, I, not the first time I've seen that that name, <laughs> the next. Yeah, I mean, out, but yeah. Yeah, for solid, the one that's mostly people consider is sexed. Um, because <laughs> um, soxed or noxed doesn't really do it anyway. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I'm, I had enough of those. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, let's let's next. For next OS, yeah, okay. <laughs> let's how about how about, how about you just let's just get started and look at an actual nitro uh, bleh, analog project. Um, how would you? Yeah, so, sure. I can uh, share my screen here, and all right. we're gonna. Dig into move this over here. Share beautiful uh, window to the screen. Hmm. All right. Uh, so I see your code editor. So I think I can just pop this in. Yeah, you are live now. We can see your VS Code. Okay. Cool. Uh, so I did. I, I'll admit, I did the the. Uh, I'm catering catering to the audience here, and I did analog uh, hacker news uh, with this with this project. So uh, we we could drop the drop the I'll drop the link to it in the in the chat there. But um, or actually, I, I can I can send it out to both. If, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. But yes, this is like a typical uh, analog project uh, that I dropped in there for people who want to drop, drop the link there but but yeah on the surface the the setup here is is pretty standard here if you're like i guess from an angular point of view there are some subtle differences here because like i said angular is about its own tooling uh, has a lot of its own tooling built in so you don't necessarily get access to much of the configuration but uh but one thing i did want to do was to like i say integrate with v so we have like the standard v config here the analog plugin is kind of what drives everything there, and uh, you have option to pre-render routes here. Uh, our index.html is at the root um, normally, so that's pretty pretty standard fare there. So uh, digging into some of these other files, like the main, if we look at, uh, I think in Solid Start, there's like an entry client and an entry server. Yeah. Uh, so here we have like the main.ts. And this is like the client. Uh, this is basically the entry on the client side. Yeah. And uh, then we have a main server here. Yeah. Uh, and this does the server side rendering, like I said, using standard Angular APIs with render application there. So okay. uh, that part's uh, pretty straightforward. The part that kind of analog brings to this is uh, the file-based routing is one thing that that we have here. So in our pages, there we do this by convention also. We have our pages directory here. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's starting to look familiar. Yeah, it, it does. It, yeah, that's what, like I said, compared to, like I said, the other meta frameworks out there, these are similar concepts. So we have the stories uh, route here. And like I said, I, I use the, I think I use Nikhil's, yeah. uh, his um, Vite uh, React server components example that I kind of migrated over from here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we got the stories page. 
everything is, is defined with dot page dot ts yeah and so we have our components here with stories and this and this is how you define like the the route so this is like a catch-all route right with the three dots and the stories there um for that one so but you can have many different types of routes if i wanted just to create like an about route then or a static route yeah. i could do it in about page dot ts and that right. will work there so the and the dot page before the ts is just an indicator to the file based writer like this is a page if it didn't have that yeah. it would treat it like something else yeah initially uh we had a routes folder and everything that was a typescript file inside the routes folder was considered to be a route uh, but as we kind of went along, we noticed that people wanted to like co-locate their components and things next to their pages. So we ended up switching to like the page convention to only trick only treat those things with the dot page extension as as routes. Do you, you never consider putting like a plus sign in front of it or anything like that? No, no, that <laughs> I don't. I. I did notice it, but I didn't want to go down that route. The convention here is is a lot similar to uh, the one for Remix, or even, I would say I would say even Solid Solid Start in that yeah, way. Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah. Uh, as far as like the convention goes, where like parent, you can have like layout layout directory or layout files and layout directories, but uh, this yeah. one is pretty pretty shallow there. But yeah. no, I didn't want to. I didn't want to do the plus page and uh, those extra files there that are common in other ones like uh, SvelteKit and, and Next.js. So. Yeah, it's interesting because, yeah, yeah, we got our convention from, I think, Nuxt originally. And I think mm -hmm. Remix is very similar to that. And Old Next was kind of similar, but then they went kind of somewhere else. Uh, I, I, was, I was looking at all the different stuff. But yeah, let's get back to the example here. So you got the mapping of between the different data types. That looks familiar. You have yep. the... You have the just top level template, which has an app stories component. So the, there's first a top component, which just has like the layout, and then another component here, which actually handles the yeah the so display. Yeah, so we have the yeah the the components themselves are just exported as default because uh, we're using Angular's new standalone components, uh, and and that that was another thing that kind of unlocked what Analog could do. Because before with module, everything had to be registered related to a module. But with standalone components, we can kind of we can declare everything a component needs uh, within its imports. So this one just has this dependency on the stories component that gives us this here. And then you have your controller code down here uh, that I have for just fetching this, this fetching the stories list there. So right. Um, so yeah, we have the the story. Like I said, that looks familiar. You can, you know, kind of okay. kind of did have some RxJS in here, but that was just to uh, to kind of translate what oh, translate the, the the map stories to like the re making a HTTP request. This has signals already too. If I'm understanding here, you have yep. your data ser services. So this is there's an HN service, a router service. I don't know what the story ref is, and then. You ha the stories come in as a, a, a signal with an ar array of stories. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah I'm <laughs> I'm kind of building where kind of where Angular is going uh, with this example with using signals and everything. So I'm using am using a mix of signals and observables here. But but yeah, we it has the signals are in developer preview, but you can still use them today. Uh, and get some more feedback about right. that. But the, yeah, I, I, I hope you don't mind my questions, just because I'm less than Angular folk. But if I, yeah, I sure. understand this correctly, the the when the component initializes, um, we get an RX s stream from the router that yes. we look at the router, and when it hits the right event message, like the navigation end, mm -hmm. it maps out the completed URL, and you use that URL. To pipe back into the HN service to do the data fetching, and yes. then and then until while this thing's mounted, you do you you subscribe to it until it's mounted, and then you pull the, the story. Tap is like it's funny. It's like a, it's like a subscribe almost, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then you set with the, no side effects. Yep, and then you subs then you set the signal that we had above with the output from that. So this this yeah. wires the router event all the way through to the signal that uh, ends up getting the, the, that set of stories. And then those stories, when they get set, immediately get passed 
as a mm -hmm. prop down to the app stories component. Okay. Yep. Yep. Everything kind of flows in that. Yeah. Everything flows in that way. And, uh, the kind of the reason that I had to go about doing it this way is because when you initially come into the component, we want to get, cause we have like two, two streams of events here. Like this is a stream of events. So when you, if you're navigating between the tabs yeah. at the, uh, if I go back here, yeah. if we go to new and then show, so we're still navigating it within the same component, but the, the URL changed. The only thing I'm disappointed about this example is the header bar should be like a nice red color to match analog. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, I, 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 I went for uh, functionality first, and it, <laughs> and we 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 got a, a little behind on the on the pot on the the red polish. So I'll yeah. I'll update that so people can see it in, in post, as they say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, other thing I'm going to mention really quick, just to do it, the, the hide stop sharing thing actually shows up on the stream. So you can uh, just you press, go. just, yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Just aside. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. So like I said, this is just driving the stories page and yeah. this is just a convention here. If we want to go to the, uh, stories, you can define each page for some right. of the, this is probably the most legwork that I had to do was like translating the, yeah. the JSX to um, like Angular's templating language, yeah. but uh, it's pretty standard stuff here with the routing. You might have actually had an easier job with the very first version of the Hacker News demo was actually, a, I ported this from Vue, which <laughs> ironically would have had a, probably a closer s syntax to Angular's. Uh, yeah. Um, but That's yeah. true. Yeah. That was, yeah. that was fun for me. I had to convert all the like V ifs and V fours back into JSX and ternaries mm -hmm. and stuff. But anyways, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I went it. the, went the other direction with that. Yeah. But, uh, this is just pulling for, this one is a little less, uh, RX JS heavy, but, uh, we're just pulling the ID. Well, Angular has this feature now where you can, uh, get the ID as an input or a prop, uh, yeah. for a route. So a component input binding is used here to get the ID um, in which it matches the ID over here for the page. And then we just grab the story uh, for that uh, to get the components. And then this is kind of like that nested nested components that can yeah. kind of drill down uh, there. So if we go back into here, uh, it gives you that same yeah. uh, tree, nested tree. Of collapsing components. Yeah, yeah. collapsing components there uh, for Angular that I'm sure people will go and dig into, and uh, maybe you can you can use this for the the Angular analog benchmarks or, or <laughs> something like that. So yeah, yeah, no, this is this is a yeah. I, I I have a pretty good idea. I know where this app ends up right now, and it's 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 because it's almost I I don't, I don't want to call it binary. It's just single page mm -hmm. app with SSR. It doesn't matter what your framework is. We all come in on that death page. I call it at around forty-eight on the lighthouse. Yeah. It just there's nothing we can do about it. Um, there's been a few that are slower on occasion, but generally speaking, it's just sh simply the fact of you get a large page of comments. You have so much to hydrate, and that recursive hydration prevents frameworks from doing clever tricks to cheat. So yeah. it, I, I like the example, but yeah, I mean, you can see from the code the templating is. Pretty good, and you and there's syntax highlighting. This is this is good. Like I haven't been. Mm -hmm. I used to use you know string templating. I know that's like an unfair thing. Frameworks in the past, but the, the tooling has caught up, you know, significantly. So, yeah, the, the Angular language service for VS Code and even the WebStorm and other things have have the syntax highlighting for the Angular templates there too. I did want to point out uh, one more thing. If we talked about the kind of the client side hydration there, uh, but here's the this was the thing that that allows the SS, kind of the SSR story to get better for Angular is the client hydration. Because if we don't use this particular uh, function here, then it'll do it'll behave the way it used to, where it does the destructive hydration every time you reload the yeah. uh, reload the page. So as opposed to just attaching to the event listeners and kind That's of hydrating the the hydrating the application from there. It's interesting, it's, and it's just a provider. I, uh, Angular's DI is so powerful that it, it, it can represent even those kind of concepts with it. That's that's yeah. crazy to me. Um, yeah, so uh, I follow that, yeah. The, the data complexity on the stories page is definitely more complicated because it has to handle the, the route params and the, the yeah. wildcard routes, where the other ones you could just feed like the parameters straight in through the data fetching. So these ones are just straight component except for like the recursiveness of the comments 
Can I yeah. see one of the components for like the like either the the comment or the stories? Just something that's yeah okay because these right. are a little bit like more straightforward because they don't have the they they just get props. So yeah, the component is literally like yeah. here's my props. At input, I'm gathering is the prop representation in Angular. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah because the yeah the components are classes. Uh, we don't have like async. Fun we don't have functional components in in Angular um, at least today. So if if and when that happens, we'll see what that looks like. Uh, so I'm I am interested in that. But yeah, inputs are uh, analogous to props in uh, Solid or React or other other frameworks there, and uh, we get our styles that are like scope by default. If you want to have ones that are just particular. Uh, to this component too, but uh, yeah, this is pretty standard uh, Angular template yeah. syntax. Uh, yeah. As far as the router links, uh, this it, it routing in Angular is different than like Solid, for example, where you have like the A component there, yeah. uh, and we use we just hook onto the the anchor tag itself and use like a an attribute uh, right. binding there to to build the route. So this will look the same way in SSR and still. Yeah render the hrefs and everything so yeah uh that part uh of it there and then like inner html that's like set set dangerously html i can't remember what yeah. the uh Sol solids is actually inner html no we just we just did the same as you guys but yeah react is okay. dangerously set inner html yeah, and then there there's an go. object with like a property on it mm -hmm. um yeah uh yeah, yeah but yeah i mean i i i get a feel that's what that's what i meant like so with the ones where the data is not a concern, you do actually spend in a simple app like this most of your time in the templating, and then yeah. it's just a matter of, yeah, some the the way the D, the I guess the injection works. I don't know what these imports are, but I'm gathering it's just like that's how you indicate that these are the components that you need. Like right. router yeah. link is used inside here. Yeah, these is, are like the, the depend basically the dependencies of the of the template uh, right. for this, or they could have providers in here too, but. These are the things that the template depends on, like the router link is here, and common module brings in things like ngif and ng4, uh, which that'll change when uh, Angular has an RFC out for control flow uh, syntax, uh, which will change how that how that works in the future. And then the co comment comment component is just like a self referencing, yeah. uh, self referencing to this component because we're like building that tree, right. that tree down, and the toggle component. Uh, around that, which kind of layers this uh, yeah. this here, because we're using I'm using in Angular what's called content projection, yeah. but in Solid this would be like children, yeah, uh, something similar to that. So exactly, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, I, it's cool. Angular X is a term for it because okay? when I was trying to explain like that mechanism, Mishko was the first one who tipped me off, and he's like, "Oh yeah, you mean." Uh, uh, projection and I was like, oh, okay, good, that's good, because it actually helps explain concepts like RSCs. Actually, funnily enough, um, oh, okay. oh I, I, I love this question. This is a good question. I, I, I think I know the answer to this question. But inspecting analog hacker news app HL, there's these empty comment tags within yeah. the LIs. What are these for? Do you, yeah, yeah. So Angular uses these. Uh, these comment nodes are like hints to the. To Angular's rendering rendering system of uh, where these nodes are, like in the tree, so it it actually uses those, uh, like ng4 for an example, it uses those for hints of where to place things and uh, it gives information about how to how to track those across renders and things like that. So those yeah. are what those comment nodes are in the tags there in the in the in the rendered HTML there. And especially if Angular now does non-destructive hydration or rather just hydrates. Mm -hmm. um, there's more situations where you're going to need comment nodes like this to match up stuff from the server and the client. Yeah. Um, just like there's, you can get away with stuff in the client because you know you're rendering it. So like there's a few places where you need it for references. Uh, list is a perfect example because you, you're, you're going through a list of different elements. You actually have to know where one starts and ends. Um, like sure in a list with it's just LIs, it's pretty easy, but you can have situations where you can have multiple elements at the top level of the list and stuff like that. So these help you like frame off sections of the HTML. Yeah. Um, another perfect example is adjacent text nodes. How do you, how, like when you have text that's like some kind of static text and then you have some dynamic text and then you have static text. Mm -hmm. When you SSR it, you're just getting one text blob there. Right. So how do you right. like get in there and like separate out the pieces? So comments are used a ton uh, in J J JavaScript frameworks, uh, a little bit on client side rendering, but an absolute ton when you need the hydrate. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, definitely so. And uh, the, I don't know if it's be, it should be included here, but the, the hydration or the, uh, this is the deployed app, but the client side hydration in develop, developer preview kind of tells you what it's, what it's doing when you're in development mode, as far as like the nodes that all the nodes that it hydrated and how that process worked, because you, you do have an option to skip certain things in hydration in the hydration process if you know some components need to be uh re like reconstructed after ssr too so it gives it does get a little more control there and i think even with the the upcoming defer uh deferred loading syntax uh coming to angular it'll be more more granular there also the first syntax is that for streaming do you know or uh it's not for streaming i can I can go here to Angular, Angular, and discussions. Uh, so this is deferred loading a new RFC. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so this it gives you defer blocks um, to give you more control over uh, the template loading of things in the template. So okay, so this is like yeah. lazy components. This is like our lazy function. Yeah, yeah, okay. lazy function, and but that's still an RFC uh, now, right. but definitely be coming where you have different triggers on how you can do that, uh, how you can, like I said, defer when templates are loaded. And it will uh, it'll handle this like at the compiler level and create like uh, dynamic imports for these things. So you can even not, or not load parts of your template until these certain triggers or things happen there. But, uh, but that's still something that's coming there. And from talking to the team, there is, it seems like there is a pathway where you could have things that are uh, rendered on the server, but like today, it's like an on it's binary. It's like an on and off uh, kind of thing where you can render on the server and then you can everything either gets hydrated on the client or it gets recreated. But you could get to a point where you could render on the server, have it displayed on the client, but it never needs to be like hydrated on the client. So it could just be in place uh, in the future. So this is, this is something that possibly could come out of later with the defer deferred syntax uh deferred loading but that's that's where it, this is just where it is today so i would definitely recommend people check out the the rfc uh for that okay yeah no that's 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 cool i'm just actually looking at the 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 example here i actually i uh I, um, you, you know me, I'm like sitting here looking and I'm like, <laughs> okay, okay, what, what's, what's our payload here? Um, this looks like, uh, is this a Netlify edge deploy or Netlify functions deploy? Do you know? It's a functions deploy. It's, it's okay. just a regular, right. there, Nitro does give you, yeah, it's just a regular deploy. Uh, it does deploy functions along with the, the app. So, uh, the index page, probably if you go to like slash new, or if you click on new, and refresh it'll render it through the ssr uh but it's just a reg it's still just a not an edge deploy but uh, okay that's something that it would it would support deploying to netlify edge if we yeah. chose that as a target gotcha so 91 kilobytes uh payload which is actually very similar to next i think yeah. uh just just out of curiosity this is next app directory that we built on stream yeah it's basically the same size it's 90 kv so same same sort of uh javascript payload um scenario okay cool cool just kind of uh getting a perspective on like where this kind of fits in on stuff um yeah, yeah i'm sure there's yeah i'm sure I, if i could have like optimized it <laughs> maybe it's maybe shaved off a little bit more but for yeah. the for the practical purposes of showing like say what analog does and on top of angular yeah that that yeah. part's there so yeah 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 no that makes sense and then the, this one's always about point three bigger or point yeah a little bit. Yeah, yeah no this is okay so yeah that that gives a ballpark on size and stuff um, just wanted to take a a quick look at this one here um, you know I'm gonna do something just because I'm mean. Um, <laughs> Because I haven't done this for, for a while. It. Last time we tried this, this net didn't work. Okay, we gotta remember this number. Three zero one eight six three two six. Three zero one maybe I should just copy it somewhere. Three zero one yeah, eight six three two six. Three zero one eight six Oh man. Or does it have to be like stories or Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's probably stories. Yeah. Um fine. I'm just gonna I'm I'm like so lazy, I'm just gonna duplicate this page and then just get it again. Three two six eight six three two six eight six 
three, two, six. The last couple times I tried to run this on stream, it like didn't work, which yeah. is well. I mean, I should actually see if I should actually see if it actually. Uh, it's fine. Can I trick this and then make it show up now? Uh, because the, what what ends up happening a lot of times is that this mm -hmm. the API craps out, so to speak. Oh, uh, okay. Right. Um, and I haven't been able to run these as much recently um, because, yeah, PageSpeed and so sites ha has has, you know, um, ran out on me. Um, see, because I yeah, I used to do this in every framework here spell kit, but <laughs> yeah, see, like I had a list there already. Yeah, um, and if I grab this, I mean, I can actually just see if the page even loads in the browser. Sometimes this page is just so mean that depending on the processing time, yeah, see, mm -hmm. it's got 1,400 comments on this page, oh, which, okay. may, which is just the, the meanest of the mean, um, so to speak. <laughs> see, this is what's been happening. I think I used to, like, push page insights so hard that they started, like, being like, no, no, your request takes too long. We're not going to, like, mm -hmm. humor you anymore. And I'm like, <laughs> so I haven't been able to do this on stream for, oh, almost a year now. When I did the next RSC, I had the exact same problem. Yeah, okay, actually that's pretty that's pretty standard actually. We finally got a score back. But this is this is what I was talking about, how brutal yeah. this this page is. Okay. Okay. So yeah, actually Okay. I, I mean I should give a second run. But yeah, this felt kit version is forty seven. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, solid start remix and that were all about forty seven, forty eight. It looks like this we might be back in business. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give this one more go. But actually, that's the other thing. They, they, they cache the results now. See, I, I drive these servers oh, wow. hard. So, like, they don't let me get new results every time, I don't think. I, I miss this. this. This used to be, like, the funnest part of my stream. <laughs> <laughs> funnest right? part of the stream, demolishing uh, <laughs> yeah, framework well, we, benchmarks. Here we go, yeah. Next, let's go with next uh, 12. Oh, man. This is, well, this is hey, bringing back memories. Now you have another another test target, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this is this is good. This is good. You can see I, how I'm, things evolve over time. This honestly, this is a bad test. If you talk to the Chrome guys, they're like, use Core Web Vitals. Lighthouse is, is only an approximation. You know, mm -hmm. they they give me a little bit of flack on this sometimes, but um, this is just taking me back. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, it's definitely one of those things where it. I guess I should throw up one more just to show that like it's possible to score okay, but you need to like uh, you need a crazy framework to do it. Um, yeah. Astro Solid HN. Yeah, here we go. This is this is partially hydrated, you know. But yeah, see, I, I don't even, I'm not even convinced these. Well, it's almost like we just just like come back like in ten minutes. Okay, there you go. <laughs> oh, there we go. Next twelve got a forty nine. Uh, there's a variation of plus or minus five or so on any given run. Um, Oh, there we go. Okay, forty-one. Like, it's it's what yeah. my point is. Like, you can be running, remix the same spelt kit. You could be running your best spa apps. Mm -hmm. um, this this test is just for partial hydration. This is how I convince people that they should be investing on uh, in in partial hydration. But this is good to see the analogs in the same. So I didn't put solid start. Solid start is. I guess we got a we got a minute here. We can put solid start in here too. Yeah. Um, do, 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 do. Not islands. Solid start islands is very performant. I want I want the other one. P S. Solid hacker news. Which one do I like? Solid hacker news. Bercelv. God, I, I the, my other problems. I built solid hacker news on like too many, too many different ones. Well, let's just do Netlify because. It's, yeah, let's just do this. You'll see this one will also be in the 40s. Mm -hmm. um, whereas okay. Astro, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 this, is, this, is, this, is, this is my mean test. And you can tell these are all different because there's a different color. See, this one's purple. Yep. This one's black. This one's felt orange. Okay. And this That's is all, your, the uh, more, all the more incentive <laughs> for me to uh, switch the analog one to red now. So. Exactly, exactly. Well, but, red, red in a good way, not in yeah. the, <laughs> the bad performance way. <laughs> yeah, no, but the, 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 this is good. I'm, I, I'm actually glad that the, uh, it looks like Page Insights are back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Ryan's... They're ready, <laughs> ready for you to destroy some more benchmarks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and to be fair, this is, this, this is a much better tool. Um, 
uh, for 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 getting timelines and stuff, especially when they like debug this. That's more of like, um, yeah, I for, yeah, solid actually. I figured out a serialization trick that actually improved performance slightly out of the forties, mm -hmm. but it was it's yeah, you can tell Astro Quick so, yeah. so, uh, Marco is like in this zone. But yeah, this is not a spa test. This is just uh, this is just. So this. what do you, what do you, what what would you consider to be a good measure? Even if everybody's in the forties, like how do you move the needle on the in the uh, in on, on tests like this on tests like these? This is this is this is hard. Um, I have to admit. Uh, but now that this is working, do you know what that means? That means <laughs> uh -oh, that I think we we awoken the monster. That means that w I I had it a moment ago, right? Uh, it was auto completing for me. Uh, it, Hacker News. I wasn't able to do this on the next RSC stream, but we can. Oh, right. We might be able to I'll get. I at this one too. We might be able. To, oh yeah. See, I did try and put it in here. We might actually be able to get the the server components. Uh, what I'm what I what I'm gonna get at is. This test is mean to frameworks that have to hydrate essentially. Mm. So, the usually the trick is figuring out how to speed up hydration. But the problem is even, even solids crazy amount of speed up on its mm -hmm. own only gets, gets us five points. Like, yeah. right. So I mean, people could do probably better in theory. I'm thinking about like, I might even talk about this later uh, after before this week in JavaScript about resumability and stuff. But mm -hmm. there, there, there are different approaches to, to, to technology, but this is all at a core level. This is not, this test is not something that the meta framework author can do anything about. It's not yeah. something that the end user can really do anything about. This is this is straight, you know. This this is me going straight back to you know the Angular team at Google or straight back to this. Yeah. This is, you know, um, but oh man, that's okay. There you go. Fifty-nine. Okay. Yeah. So React server components, fifty-nine. Yeah. Do so you see? So RSCs are already. Um, and actually when I did hydrogen, hydrogen was also around this, around 62. So our, our, our RSCs, like pre-remix, I'm, I'm sure with remix now it's slower, but like, mm -hmm. um, like pre, pre, like RSCs are an example of a, of a, of a improvement on, on that. Um, it is interesting though, that as I said that, um, like Astro or Quick, or yeah. like that style is going to get um, going to get better scores than RSCs, but that's an implementation detail. In theory, I think RSCs can get into the into the high 80s if they were implemented differently, or maybe not React. Um, okay, but is this the, is so the yeah. remix uh, the remix team isn't there. Well, I saw they they're looking at doing RSCs, but right. is there similar to how Nix is doing theirs? Or I, I I imagine they'll have their own kind of flavor in terms of APIs and how they do it. But like the yeah. core mechanism for how the data loads and stuff, or not the data loads because people have async components and all that. But I mean the core mechanism of how the stuff gets to the page is going to be defined mostly by the RSC stuff. Mm -hmm. Does an RSC need to hydrate? Uh, that's a complicated question. It's kind of weird. <laughs> Well, does it depend on? <laughs> it depends on if you have to. You got any client uh, components right mixed in there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th this the way we build these this test is that uh, with RSCs or whatever is that. I mean, we can look at an actual page, sir. And I know I'm diverting a little bit. I was just so excited that this worked. But if you if you go to an example here, this needs to be stateful. So this is an island, and then you project. The, see, mm -hmm. we have the term project. I told you it helps with server components. Yep. You start with the server data, and then you project these comments into the island. And in so, the server data stays on the server, and you just uh, see. It recursively project through. And then it's only the client components, like these little wrappers, the toggle component in your project. Like you, in fact, do you actually have the toggle? You, you, do you have the code open still on uh, your website? Yes, I do. You flip to that for a second. If you look at your project, it's only the toggle component that actually needs to get sent to the browser because the toggle component has a signal in it, mm -hmm. right? Signal true here, the open true. But if you go to the comment component, there's no signal here. Like there's nothing actually interactive on this part. The toggle 
does the stuff. So the whole idea is with RSCs or islands, you can ship and only hydrate the, the components with the signals in them. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit more trickier than that. There's a structural consideration. But for this simple test, that's basically the scenario. The interesting thing, as I mentioned before, is this RSC thing um, like it's still 90 kilobytes. It's the same size. It, oh. There's only one component to be fair, but it's like um, the baseline of even getting next to the point where it can not ship all the components. You're already at 90 kilobytes. Um, mm -hmm. So for small apps and stuff, people aren't going to notice any kind of difference, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I diverted a bit. This is, this is on me. <laughs> I'm just so excited that this actually worked. Uh, it's been no, so it's long. A, it's good. We at least have, like I said, if anything, we get, uh, we get the, uh, n another another test case for the for the benchmark so and we can figure out how to it how to iterate on that but uh but yeah yeah um, yeah 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 I, to be fair this is this is a mean test the reason this is the mean test is i'll show you if you i mean maybe next isn't the best version if i pick uh it's actually easier for me probably to show solid start solid hmm. hn movie or not movie sorry I'm, I, it's funny i the yeah that was the, another I, one i was gonna uh, throw out there like the taste js movies yeah. uh app i know there's an angular version out there that's uh built by the the rx angular team uh and michael lackey and i know they they squeeze every bit of performance yeah. out of that so uh those are another good test also yeah what i wanted to show is this is our our, our islands routing basically our server component demo um and what i want to show here is obviously uh sorry i'm not in this is easier to show when you're in cognito this is why i had a different window open before new incognito because i have all my extensions it doesn't affect the other test but yeah. it affects what i want to show here um when you so you want to you want to still show him uh mine you want to share yeah, let me switch oh, over. Okay, Thank cool. you. Yeah, thanks for reminding me. Yeah, so yeah, th this simple test is like this page is only five kilobytes, but that's not the only reason why this is sort of a mean test is because when we get to like there's some scripts to get started and whatever, but mm -hmm. when you get to like the you know next JSON or whatever, like all the stuff that you need to serialize to the page to hydrate, there's nothing here <laughs> because of that islands trick, right? Yeah. Whereas if I took pretty much any other Thing. Actually, I'm a, let's look at the analog example again. Um, let's look at it again, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Because of the need to hydrate, um, it, it's funny. That test might even do better with the old destructive hydrating. But my guess is, if I look hard enough here somewhere, maybe I'll have to. Maybe it'll be easier to look at the network tab and look at the uh, what am I looking at? Uh, document. My guess, although I could be wrong about where it shows up, come on, come on, come on, um, is I'm going to see a blob of data for hydration somewhere here. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be like all the way down at the bottom, yeah. Yeah, I was trying yeah. to find it. I was trying to find it um, in the regular markup, but I couldn't. Uh, do, 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 do. Script, yep, yeah, there ng is, state. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what... Oh, does oh does it consume it? Is that what it is? Can yeah, you... that's what. Yeah, all that the uh, data gets serialized and put into that ng state during the uh, rendering, and then when it when the oh, application it starts, okay, up, yeah, I found it. I found it there. Yeah, so this big blob of fun, every framework spits down, but with islands or RSCs, although Next actually serializes something about as big as this, so it doesn't matter. But with like islands or like quick or whatever, mm -hmm. you actually don't send um, th this data down. It's basically empty. So th you get double hit with this example. You get hit for the serialization cost for needing to hide oh, yeah. rate, and you get hit from the JavaScript bundle, like code splitting difference on the partial hydration. So this, this is why I use this because I needed an example um, at some point, because I think I forget who I was talking about. Maybe Ryan Florence from Remix, and he's like, "Oh, your technology is really cool, but they they like don't do anything." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay, let's let's let let me put Remix on the left side, and let me put something else on the right side, and we can talk about how they don't do anything." Um, 
<laughs> leave it leave it to Ryan to Ryan to uh, light those stoke those little fires here and there. But my my point <laughs> Ryan is Ryan Florence th- that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My my point is like yeah, like this I, it's funny cuz it, like don't get me wrong, I am pretty stoked. Like old angular might have not even had I guess it would have had for destructive hydration it would have still had this, but yeah. The mm-hmm. the this anglers make is in very short time making leaps and bounds improvements yeah. in this area. It's a, as I said, analog looks like it's in the exact same class as Solid Start Remix Next, you know that kind of uh, stuff in terms of this SSR style kind of performance and hydration stuff. So I'm I'm pretty stoked on to see that. But I, as I said, I was also very stoked to actually be able to finally measure RSCs and Next um, yeah. because they they are a slight improvement, um, which is what I was hoping to see. Anyways. Uh, yeah, uh, those are fighting words. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's that, that's enough. That's enough of me playing around with this. I think I I I, I got to look at what I, I mean. Uh, sorry, did I close? I closed it too fast. I actually want to look at one more thing. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I got got you here and got it here, which is I wanted to look at. I mean, it's just minor. I I I'm always interested, and this is probably more of an ink. A- angular kind of question thinking or whatever, but I'm always interested just to look at like those little differences. You meant the script ng state, right? But I'm I'm always a ng version. I'm just interested to see what the serialization formats look like. Yeah. So these are the comments that were, but it's not on every li. It's it's at the end of blocks. So mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, let me pick a different one. Yeah, just 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 curiosity on like what the, the yeah that's cool and it's able to match up. See, Solid has these crazy hydration IDs because our stuff all gets created out of order. But it's it's this is this is pretty clean. I gotta say the output like the HTML output um, yeah. for this solution is actually pretty tight. Um, yeah, I think the yeah I think it's actually it's it's a little less than it used to be because it you like for each uh, item in an ng4 or a list everything i think there used to be like a comment node for each one of those or even in other areas like ngfs and things like that it used to keep those things in place but maybe with the maybe they did something extra there with the hydration that helps with that yeah so so that's nice that's that's 88 kilobytes um i i don't uh, that's for the html document uh see when you get into crazy hydration tricks you get pretty pretty big here oh see, see oh, this is the problem see see how the api is starting to throttle me yeah see i'm only getting 300 comments now oh yeah and that's why you're only getting 80 ah damn it <laughs> we, we've we've killed it for the day they said all right that's enough fun with the benchmarks and things our service <laughs> yeah, yeah. gotta hold up <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah okay okay fine 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 but <laughs> yeah no it does actually look like the html is pretty compact for the um, it's one of the most compact I've actually seen. If you look at any SSR framework, but those comments are important. If you have something like Cloudflare that like auto removes comments for minification purposes, you need to turn it off. All SSR frameworks, like people come to us and like, oh, it's crazy. Cloudflare is breaking solid, blah, blah, blah. It would literally break every SSR framework. Um, oh, okay. It's so, good to know because I've been playing around with trying to uh, deploy to Cloudflare. An- well, Angular, they, they come up with some... Uh, ways to, or the, they work with the Cloudflare team to get Angular deployed on Cloudflare workers. And then I had, had a separate effort to d- get that working with analog too. So uh, yeah, that's a good, it's a good thing to, to know. I have to I have to remember that. Yeah. It's just, it's understandable. They're like, Oh, we can minify the code and remove all the comments and stuff, but that we need those comments. Like yeah. there's a question about like, what do, what do the co- nodes need? It, it just, we need those markers because they don't affect styles. We don't want to mm-hmm. like make a component for ev- like a element for every component or do something like like uh, comments are these like invisible markers. They're not the best for like um, traversing. Like you can't like find them as easily. You can't just go like yeah. query selector node find me the comment with this ID. Like you you know we, we do tree walkers and stuff like this to to you know do that. I but it's it's one it's the only way to to do stuff without it like impacting layout like i tried mm-hmm. a few tricks in the past and every time every time i've done it someone eventually is like this breaks this thing in my table and i'm like okay fine <laughs> like it's if we didn't have to use comments it could be faster um mm. 
But so what would be the what would be the alternative to using the the comments then? Well, I mean, you, as I said, you could make make dummy nodes, like like put an yeah. extra div in there or something, and then you can just literally go like find me the div with this ID. Yeah. Instead, we have to like tree walk the the whole tree to like or from a certain known location and tree walk to find the the mm -hmm. comments and what you know do that. But. I think they're they're working on some DOM parts or something RFC or whatever on the uh, platform that will help with this. I just don't know the details on that yet. But yeah, comments are very useful. Um, and you find a lot of the frameworks are getting really deep down the the this whole side of things. Let me see if I can find it quick. Uh, it's not actually maybe maybe Page Insights is the one that will help me remember these 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 links because I because. <laughs> I, I stopped remembering them quick. How about HTTPS colon slash quick city hacker news? Okay, here we go. It's the one I want. Um, you just need like a, a page that or a, like a quick uh, link list, a uh, list of yeah. links to each one of these things. Yeah, but what I wanted to, what I was trying to show here is that if I go over here and I pull up the quick example and um, as I said, oh, actually, I can't run the freaking API right now because it's throttled. So never mind this you, one. You hammered it. That's why. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sir. That was wrong. Uh, uh, I, 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 I meant uh, this, this, this. Uh, where was it? This one. Uh, what I wanted to show is that we're talking about using comments, mm. right? Like the more hydration savvy you get the crazier the comments start getting because <laughs> like th at this point they're trying to recreate like everything. Yeah. And this actually starts being uh, a more and more of a, of a problem uh, uh, because yeah, I mean the HTML just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean they're hashing and doing, but yeah, this, this is kind of the, what 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 I'm what I'm getting at, right? Because in this point, like the reason you have to do this, I'm I actually I might talk about that later on stream if I have time or maybe next week. Is like they literally have to match and key each set of elements. If they're not going to like rehydrate and rerun the whole thing, they literally have to like find nodes as they hit them because they don't they never have the original state of the app. They, they like it doesn't hydrate. It doesn't go over once and go. This is the original state. Let's match it up. It's more of like you change something. Here's the new data update now as if you had the original state there in the first place so they literally have to serialize every possible thing into the into uh, the dom yeah. anyways it's crazy <laughs> sorry um i I'm, I'm going a little crazy uh was there anything else we wanted to show on analog or is it a good time for q a um uh let's see i can i guess show a couple more cool cool things there let me switch, that over let there. Me switch back over to your screen i'm done doing my benchmarking <laughs> <laughs> there we go yeah the the couple other things I wanted to show, and I think we went, we showed some of this in the docs also, was yeah. the, the API routes. And these are actually file-based routes also uh, in, in analog. So uh, you can define these uh, API routes uh, within the server directory, and you'll just get an API slash you know, path right there out of the box there too. So there is that part. And uh, I mentioned about the route pre-rendering. Pre we do SSR by default. Uh, which you can toggle on and off, but if we wanted to pre-render some routes, we could drop those in here. And this is kind of similar to Solid Start's configuration also, I believe. Yeah. Um, where you could just throw a couple of routes in there. We are look, maybe looking at some other options as far as being able to discover, like define these pre-rendered routes closer to the, the pages themselves. Yeah. Uh, so that's another another thing that we're looking at looking at doing there yeah we're looking at that too that's funny like yeah you're right i built the api to support partial static i just never actually got around to implementing it in all the adapters because i had to write all the adapters yeah. ourselves so it's kind of a pain. so yeah this is one of the benefits this is when i went to astro i was like oh yeah this is really easy i already have the api for it but i didn't actually like because suddenly i i had to have one abstracted place mm -hmm. whereas before you know all this code was in each adapter anyway but yeah, okay, that's cool. So you have pre-render. Yeah, I I think it's interesting. You guys, the one thing you don't, because you don't, I didn't notice, like, you don't have, like, the action loader kind of thing, like Remix or whatever. So you're, you're already not, you don't have conventions around file system routing already that are based on exports and that. So you're not, like, there's no right. real place to be, like, export pre-render. Um, with, with Solid, we have that export route data. So we are actually thinking mm -hmm. of changing that to be, like, export 
route config and then have the data function and pre-render and all those things as just being in options in that one object. But yeah, it's tricky because once you make that jump to the file system routing, having those kind of conventions, like it's, I don't know if it's magical or you, you know what I mean? Like it's. Yeah. The, the couple other things that we do have is uh, we have things that you can like, cause the analog router is built on top of the angular router. So we can extend the, you can actually extend the config of uh, what what the Angular router does, and we do that through this kind of similar to route meta, route metadata, and uh, you can define. So this is one of the things you can do. Like if you want to set the title for the route, or if you want to add like meta tags or things like that, you can do that additional config here. Uh, another thing that we which kind of lends in, or goes into what you mentioned before about having like a separation of things that can run uh, purely on the server. Uh, we merged this in recently, but it still needs some some polish. But I could go here and create like an ID uh, dot server dot TS file okay. here. That's and, very Svelte, uh, Svelte kit like. Okay. Yeah, it it does look very similar to to Svelte kit, but you can export a, a load function. Oh, not load config from file. If I can type here. Uh, so this load function and we import uh, this, do this here, not from express, from analog.js slash router. Uh, and I think we actually used some of the similar naming from uh, Svelte Kidal, because I, I thought it was a, a good uh, name there. Yeah. But we have like request. Uh, a request response and params, um, params and yeah, this uses like the pay server load there. So uh, you can we use this. I call it server side data fetching. Yeah, but uh, you could you know do some data fetching here and return just an object of loaded data or right. object yeah, just of data. JSON. Yeah. yeah, of serializable data. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, if we, we can actually reference that inside of this function here. So uh, right. instead of doing, getting the user or the stories here, uh, we could have like data equals inject. Uh, we have an inject load uh, function there. Right. And we use like type of load from the server yeah. uh, there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. That looks a lot like our route data remixes uh, loaders pattern. Yeah. And cell kit, yeah. It's the, same, it's the same kind of... I gotcha. Uh, but yeah, this would... Uh, I'm sure I'm missing probably what the what the data should be returned here, but it changes to an object or something like that. Uh, but yeah, inject load, this will give you... This will actually give an, an observable of this data, but, uh, we could, but we could turn this into a signal also. Right. Uh, with the it's like a helper function from from Angular uh, that will do that. So if I import to signal yeah. from interop, yeah, and I'm sure I'm typing something there. But are we missing uh, a close? Okay. Yeah, I'm missing something there. But um, but yeah, so you could you could do some data fetching on the server and like offload some of this off of the client too. So which could in, maybe save you some some kilobytes over the wire. Uh, things like that. So, and this yeah. never, and this, this code never reaches the clients, which is pretty, pretty standard practice there too. So yeah. that's another thing that we've been uh, working on in, in there. So we do have that convention of a page and a dot server file here next to it. So it gives us a little more flexibility there of things we could do in the future that could only be, you know, only be done on the server uh, and not make it to the client. So maybe you're shipping less, you know, less code, less angular code to the client and maybe offloading that some of that to the server so yeah no that makes sense yeah so loader setup uh did you guys look at the mutations or the progressive enhanced forms or the other side of the yeah we haven't haven't looked at that yet like angular angular already has like a solid form solution or hmm. i'll say two All solid right. form solutions in place yeah. uh, with reactive forms and template driven forms but there isn't a good story there of how those two things can interact with the server so if we have like with the progressive hydration or not progressive hydration progressive enhancement excuse me uh to be able to like have javascript turned off and the form still work so that is something that we could look at 
uh, I think something we'll probably revisit in the future as far as some API or something we can kind of build around that to to provide some solution there. No, no, I, I but I see the core of it here, and it's it's, it's I, I love where the meta frameworks are these days because you can see mostly imports are from Angular itself. You're reusing Angular's existing router. Yeah. You're using Angular's all all the pieces exist. You, the the analog itself is mostly just putting it together in a specific way um, yeah. with a few conventions and a few automated you know compiler tricks like route meta here and stuff that like basically kind of finish it off which is which is nice um, from a maintenance standpoint especially if you don't have to deal with the adapters um, so yeah no I, I'm I, 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 I'm getting it yeah this oh I think I see what, what I'm sorry I, it, it was racking my brain I couldn't <laughs> and then there you go so now we have our like type safe yeah. uh, data there. So because I didn't return the async from the from that there. There we go. So now we get a signal of that of that data object back. So yeah, uh, just for completeness. Yeah, no, no, that yeah, and that that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, these these patterns too. Like once, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting because you as you you're in a scenario where you're like supporting both like patterns people accustomed to angular and then yeah. patterns that people are getting like more standard on because like on one side people might think that the what you just showed me the dot server and the data and stuff is almost more straightforward you just grab the that get the signal call it a day but mm -hmm. i think it's not a conventional pattern say in angular today so you also have you know the rx streams and the that kind of stuff yeah that 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 was part of is part of the, like the overall like motivation and vision for analog also is to like you shouldn't feel like you're like completely coming out of the the angular like ecosystem and things like that because those are usually like the first questions people ask are like is this using the angular router or am i going to lose you know like angular's ng update and things like that so you're still like this is definitely like a spin on angular like outside of uh outside of google's tooling and everything that's built in but uh but yeah the we we still want to have some like comfort or uh, comfort and assurance that you're you're still using Angular at the end of the day. We're just providing like a nice integrated experience on top of that. So yeah, someone some uh, sorry, uh, Dave Agrawal um, asks uh, this: uh, What if your Angular service could talk? Did you did you actually follow oh, yeah. up on this at all? No, we're st that's another thing that's on the on the table here that we're looking at. This was another thing that Patrick JS had mentioned also. He actually did a spike of this, but I think it would be interesting to do. Minko, Minko Getcher did something like this also a while back, where because a lot of what you do with your interactions in Angular, you know, revolve around services. So if you can, like I said, offload that to the server. And basically, we're we're creating the connection, you know, between the server to like pass that serialized data back and forth. Then I think that could that could have a, a nice experience to it also. And in a, in addition to like shipping less code to the to the server, it's not quite like React server components or anything, but something like that in Angular I think would be right. beneficial. I mean, to be fair, this is more like. Uh, server dollar sign or use mm -hmm. server like the RPC calls. Um, but yeah, uh, this is definitely something that uh, we've been playing ar around with a lot um, in solid start. Yeah, um, I've been yeah, I've been following you and uh, Tanner's effort yeah. on this with like the bling project. Uh, and I was trying to, <laughs> like you said, we're, we were trying to all get in on the same on the same boat here to try to get something together on that because I think it, I think it's a pretty elegant solution to to be able to uh, use like the server dollar or the fetch dollar on and just have that kind of that data get uh, moved over, extracted yeah. off to the servers. So yeah, I'm I'm still in a world where I'm trying to figure out how that fits in. It's it's there's a, there's this like tension between like the island side or the server component side and then the RPC side and like who wants to even be thinking about all this stuff. It's yeah. like. Because there's, there's, it starts on the server, goes to the client, goes back to the server. There's actually three three zones, and yeah. people until recently have been thinking in one zone. I build my app. The end. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so like, this has been a been a, a big thing. Um, but yeah, no, that's cool. I, I I missed this tweet when it obviously originally came out, but uh, it's cool to see exploration or thinking in that. 
All right. Yeah, that was that one was like I said that one was partly inspired by the like I said the Bling yeah. uh, project and things like that. So and even like I said Minko's project is uh, um, T I can, TSRPC I believe it was yeah. the repo that he had a while back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, I, every, I mean, here's the thing. Once you get into the meta framework zone, you just like think, oh, I could wire this for you. Like on us, our yeah. first version of server, it wasn't server dollar sign. We were using proxies. It wasn't a compiler, but it did basically the same thing. I added to solid start back in 2021. Like it was just like, I knew you like, once you go there, you like, and the, I think next, not next themselves, but like in their ecosystem, there was like a library like that too. Like you just go there and you're like, man, it just makes a lot of sense to, because you have all the pieces. There is a trap there, don't get mm -hmm. me wrong, but I, it's too tempting not to at least look into. Yeah, I, yeah, and yeah, like you said, the the build, like the meta framework building on top of like the primitives and things that are already there, it, it just gives you so much opportunity to, oh, it'd be nice if we did this, or it'd be nice if we just kind of handled that for the user, but uh, there is there is a, a balance of things that you kind of have to go through of, because at the end of the day, you're still having to maintain all that, the magic per se, that people will get uh, used to, um, to do things like that. So yeah, it's definitely a trade off. So you gotta, you have to manage. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's interesting too, because when you're in the meta framework space, you are sandwiched between, and we talked about this a bit earlier, the core team working on the library mm -hmm. and like the, you know, potential user there because like sometimes like a lot of people will go to you instead of going straight to angular so to speak but what you're capable of is both a function of what you're able to add as features and what uh the core team wants to support officially and sometimes i mean this is where the communication is really key because i've seen cases where the meta framework has gone and re-implemented a whole bunch of stuff that the core team was going to add as primitives and then mm -hmm. like there's this awkward moment where everyone's like uh <laughs> What do you do? And then, and then the, the yeah. meta frame is like, well, I want to keep on using what we built. It works slightly better for our use cases. And then it's like, no, but you should use what, what we built because it, like, we're trying to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Yeah. And there's like this, this kind of tension. Um, so, yeah, this, is, this has been very much on my mind. I, I mean, what I'm talking about right now is RSCs and Remix. Um, mm -hmm. Like the whole, like, literally the transition API suspense and all that. Remix basically invented their own version of that. That's uh, not even yeah. RSCs. And React seems like, look, we, we've got this. And then it's just like, you know. Um, but it's, it, is, it is interesting uh, kind of figuring out how to find that balance in that place. And uh, the, it's got to be about communication, right? Like it's got to mm -hmm. like understand where say angular is heading and then figure out how to work that into, you know, what you're building. And I mean, cause there's an opportunity here because you're like right on the edge and where the people are doing them, where you can add more of these features and try yeah. things out that the, the core team can't make a decision on it. It would take them like, they, they don't have enough data. Yeah. Like they, you know, yeah, and there and there like there are some things that maybe they're just not they just don't think should be part of the framework. I mean they they have a you know a, I would say a relatively small team which they do a, a bunch of great stuff with, but I mean at the end of the day you you have to have the like the people and the to to be able to like execute on those things too. So some of those like even with like going back to NJRX like the that 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 need was there and we kind of feel that need uh because there wasn't like an established solution there so uh but like ideally for me like like i said that communication line would be there with the team as far as what they're building versus what we're looking to build and how can we like do those things together and not uh like you said, not have those awkward conversations of like okay are you gonna <laughs> are you gonna shut that thing down so we can so we can uh so we our thing can kind of live in that in that space too because yeah it's an awkward awkward place to be when uh when that when it doesn't go that way so like i said yeah. ideally we have like a good line of communication there which we we do have a, a line of communication there today so um yeah i'm happy about that no that's super good and super important i think that's i think that's something that actually we haven't seen the effect of but i think react might have historically um not been so good in that area but now actually has been improving in the recent little bit because as i said there was the obviously the whole thing that happened the last couple of years while everyone was waiting for suspense mm -hmm. um but 
it's I feel like it's even like it's even more than that. Um, the potential when the, when you don't when you don't have the, that kind of commu- communication available yeah. because like how do you yeah how do you how do you, how do you get anything done? It's a, it's a lot easier for smaller frameworks to deal with that. Like you know, mm-hmm. Svelte can get ahead of it. Solid can get ahead of it. But with Angular or React or so, something so widely used, it's definitely something that's uh, you know. Yeah, I think we're yeah I think we're. Or I think analog project is probably a little bit unique in that way in that like you have solid and you have solid start. So you kind of have, you have more like direct control over both things and like the direction of, of both things as, or even like Svelte and Svelte kit, that sort of thing. But I think maybe next in React is, even though they're that, that gap seems to be shrinking, but <laughs> they have, <laughs> they kind of have that same uh, relationship also as far as owner ownership of the thing that you're building on top of. Yeah. I actually, yeah, I, that gap has shrunk uh, considerably now, but, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, that's no, good. Uh, so, yeah, let's, is, was there any more uh, demo little pieces you want to show off? I, I think, I think oh, you, yeah. you have well, a lot of, oh, ooh, there's more. Okay, that's exciting because we have actually talked about most of the key functionality. Yeah, um, yeah I did want to touch on one quick thing here this is just in the analog repo itself uh and we uh, to go back to nitro the oh, integration okay, yeah. there so yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. we can kind of dig into like the the nitro pieces here um because at the end of the day like the all that interaction happens through this v plugin that connects nitro and analog together so um also how much i want to get into here but nitro like i said nitro has a javascript api let me close some of these things here. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, you got my full attention here. I, I'm very but, interested. Uh, yeah. When I was looking around for like solutions to be able to hook into, uh, to not, cause like I said, Nitro had all the deployment targets there. They had a nice, um, story there about reusability. So this is kind of the part that where we kind of connect Nitro and V together in analog. So we load in the Nitro, uh, APIs here and it's, simple or not simple as that but you can create a nitro instance here and create a dev server and we're hooking into Vite's middleware uh to be able to use that nitro server as like a node uh oh. a node handler so to be able to hook into that is not much uh at least you still have to figure out how to wire still had to figure out how to wire that part up but nitro i said nitro has nice apis around how it can give you that that handler that you can pass to any middleware uh in this case uh Vite's middleware which is like connect underneath but uh being able to use that part and everything as far as like the server related things kind of hang off of that like the ssr uh rendering we have the renderer here which is pretty straightforward it uses the ssr build and uh we call the that main.server file that i just showed earlier it calls that render function for the SSR support. Uh, the pre-rendering, re- Nitro actually handles the pre-rendering side of that too. Um, and this is what we use during the build. And some of right. the some of the things that we've actually added actually build on top of the hooks that Nitro has underneath also, because it lets you hook into the, like the pre-rendering cycle. Nice. Uh, so you can you can hook into as things are being generated. And as the pre pages are being pre rendered, that part's there. We had somebody uh, Q from the community actually put this feature in, which is which was pretty good also uh, to to do that part. But this the the other part about about this plugin is that because it's Vite and because it's like like a Vite plugin out of the box, we could drop this into like a standard uh, Vite project. Right, and uh, we kind of talked about this uh, earlier. Because yeah, someone someone was asking uh, in chat, they're like, "For analog, why did you go with Nitro as a Vite middleware versus Vite as a Nitro middleware?" Yeah. and I feel like this is almost the answer to the question coming up here. Yeah, I wanted. Yeah, I wanted the. I kind of wanted the Vite and Nitro integration to be like as simple as like a drop in thing. Because with Nux, it's a little different because it it controls more of the like the entire life cycle within Nux as far as the hooks and things go but this is more of a drop in uh, that you can do here so i had i even tried this with like a just vanilla solid project and i copied like the dev server part in 
Uh, but this is like the v, the Nitro plugin right. from uh, Analog JS it, inside of this um, V project uh, with Solid. And, yeah. you know, we define, of course, we had to define some things manually because these things are handled within the analog plugin, but yeah, uh, but it, it, it still works. Like uh, you get the API routes, you get the SSR, you get the pre-rendering. And that's, that's, that's the part that I think that shines about like the V ecosystem and that it allows you to build these kind of plugins that you can like drop into to other environments. So that that's, that's if, if this just works, that's crazy. You don't know how many weeks I spent adding that to, the, to <laughs> Astro. I'm just putting out there, but yeah. But yeah, that, I mean, yeah, I know, like I said, I just, this is like I said, more credit to the Nitro team and the V team for like, enabling basically like enabling meta frameworks to do this kind of thing but uh that was, is one thing that i'll i think i, I think i pushed this up on github too but i'll drop that in the in the chat there also for people to kind of pick through there and see but that was kind of my vision part of what i wanted to do with the v nitro connection also was create a plugin that was kind of agnostic enough to where uh you could drop it into a, a react uh vanilla react project uh solid whatever yeah uh, and you get like that meta framework in the box is what i call it you kind of get that experience there so uh that's part of the part of what came out of this effort if anything also is to be able to put those pieces together yeah no this this is very cool because it's, it's just a little little pl little drop-in plug-in uh question yeah so you are, is there file? There, there's no file-based routing or anything special here going on, is, right? Is it just like, no? Just, no, this is just the. I just went right. with the solid starter and. Uh, right, but I, I just meant yeah. So like the Nitro plugin is only responsible for just getting the runtime up, getting the dev server yeah. up, and then you can build all your other conventions on top of how you generate the code and all that stuff. So it's very. You, you, right. Yeah. The yeah. The only file system routing in here is this this is part of nitro also so you pointed at this directory and it looks and see what the what the structure is for the api routes gotcha and you can set that part up also but this could like i said if you were using solids uh file based router you could drop that in uh i'd imagine you could drop that in here too yeah, it's just funny. There's there's a, there's some comments from the chat along the lines of like like how Frankenstein can we go? Can we drop an it's <laughs> like one? We can we can go down we could <laughs> this was another thing another thing also. I can jump into the docs here, integrations, Astro. Uh and this was two parts. Like uh Astro was using you mentioned it earlier, Snowpack. They were using yeah. that before. And it has support for all the Angular. It has support for all the basically UI framework components. Uh, so I had tried to get it working with Snowpack before, but I think I hit a roadblock there or something. But then when they switched over to Vite, then that kind of opened up the door to be able to use Angular in Astro. So we actually do have. <laughs> if you want to go down the rabbit hole, the Vite rabbit hole of what it unlocks, uh, you can use uh, Angular components inside of an Astro project uh, uh, using this using this integration here so uh, that part does work too so there you go there, there it is yeah no people are having some fun with the <laughs> Frank and meta framework <laughs> like I said it this was part of this it was extending extending angular into other ecosystems right because that's what I felt like Vite uh, did was extend extended all that build tooling to any project that wanted to use it that you could build on top of. So, uh, I, like I said, I think that I feel like Angular should have a, have a, uh, a, a space in that, in that area also, or be able to tap into Vite's ecosystem. Yeah, uh, no, and this absolutely. is, and this is part of that. So, oh man, that's, that's too good. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty stoked on that. <laughs> I have to admit. Somebody, yeah, somebody, they asked the question. So, yes, if basically <laughs> if it works in, in Vite, uh, then we can drop some uh, Angular in there if that's, if, if that's your thing. So, yeah, yeah I, that's, I guess that's fair. It's funny that the framework's called analog, <laughs> but it's modernizing Angular. Yeah. yeah. No. 
No, I, it's, it's some amazing work you've been doing to, I, I mean, it, this is all, as I said, this feels like it's all part of that narrative, even though you're not like officially the Angular core team, the effort you're doing here definitely feeds into the narrative of a modern Angular, like a yep. revitalized Angular. Seeing these pieces in conjunction, seeing the standalone components, you know, and using them which like makes it like look like other frameworks like what we've come to expect in terms of like oh mm -hmm. yeah you just throw this here this works and uh angular doesn't look like the you know the the odd you know the odd one out <laughs> anymore so this is this is really cool i always think of that uh that meme with uh i think it's ted bashimi i can't think think of his name but uh, he comes in with he's got the red hat turned around. He's like, "What's up, kids?" That's how it's, <laughs> that's how it kind of started out with uh, how we were kind of how I was kind of pitching this of like Angular coming back to the table with uh, with everybody else that's kind of uh, migrating and moving the eco moving the ecosystem moving along with the ecosystem is what I is what I call it. So. Oh wow, okay. I think I think I think we should start uh, get, getting any other questions together for for Brandon so that uh, we, we can ask them while he's still while he's still with us today. Um, start yeah, collecting sure. those questions, but um, it always takes a minute. So, mm. water break. Yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, the I heat is brought, starting. I should have brought the straw so we can. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, no, I've, 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 I've finished. The stream. Yeah, I I I finished my orange juice already. Yeah, back on orange juice again. Um But yeah, no, I I I it's cool to see the, I I actually that question about the Vite versus the Nitro like back and forth. I had the exact same question um before the stream. I'm glad that someone asked it cuz I was like I looked at it and I was like, "Huh. So it's a dev server, but I I see it now, right? It's just make stay with Veet being the primary thing because yeah. the, the Veet's the plugin system. This is the this is the biggest challenge. You start making these wrappers and then you make your own config. I mean, that's an option too. Like maybe none of those details actually need to matter, but like mm -hmm. on the other hand, there's something nice about it just being a Veet config, right? Like Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, what you get out of a traditional Angular environment is like you don't besides the Angular JSON thing file and things like that. Like you don't really get access to much of the like the internal configs, and that's by design. They want you to not have to worry about like the build process and things. But I think in meta frameworks and things like that, they I think there's a good balance to be had there, to where you can have the V config and still provide a good set of like defaults out of the box. So, uh, and then people will you know people can tinker if they want to. They can kind of tweak things or add additional stuff there, but. Um, a good balance is there is kind of what I, what I was aiming for so that, you know, it, out of the box, you're going to get like the optimal setup, but you still have the, like the like, little bit of configuration there that you, you have access to if you want to be able to get at some more things. So, yeah. Um, I think we already got the answer to this question, but the loaders are type aware, right? Like uh, the, yeah. You, 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 it's the type of trick that we use in Remix and in Solid. Um, yeah, that, yeah, the loaders are are type aware, so you do get the the type safety of what the what, what the return is. Yes. Yeah, through the import. This is one of those areas that I've been trying to think of if there's different solutions because. I, I forget, I think it was Theo made a list a while ago talking about features and frameworks in terms of type safety. And he gave that a half point because mm. having to like say type of it's and like pass it, yeah. into the generic, not auto inferred was uh, was was a downside compared to say like async await in a React async component or whatever. So he, yeah. he gave us a half point for that. But yeah, I uh, think it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a trade off because, um, because we could have went with like the load the direct loader pattern within the within the file and maybe have more direct connection there but uh using the like the separate server file approach you still want to have like some connection there so i think it's yeah it's more about the trade off of what 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 do you what do we value more in this case and like angular was like the trailblazer on uh leaning into typescript so that's usually like what we try to lean towards first. Yeah. Yeah, no. The... 
that that makes sense. Yeah, Angular's got a very long history with TypeScript. Um, they 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 were probably the first framework to actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that touch it. that whole uh, types Angular leaning into TypeScript because Angular at one point was trying to create its own version of TypeScript. Basically, it was called AtScript, uh, but then they ended up ditching that and just using the like I said wrapping around the TypeScript compiler. And then that kind of trickled into uh, Angular was using it. Then TypeScript like became an approved language inside of Google, and like they started writing everything. Every like TypeScript was a requirement then, and uh, even through our interactions with like P in, with NGRX inside of Google, like it's type safety across the board, like hardcore types on everything. So because they're they like max definitely maximize their usage of of TypeScript there and I think Angular was a big was a big part of that. All right. Um TypeScript was made for Angular. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 interesting because like I said, Angu the Angular I think took a different approach than most other frameworks in their usage of TypeScript because to me like TypeScript is more of like a pass through in some other the some other frame because you can still write those applications without using TypeScript at all. But with Angular, like it's been a requirement since day one. So uh, that's what I think there there is a, a difference there in how they leveraged how it's been leveraged in the within Angular, like for better or worse, uh, whether what your opinion on TypeScript is. But of course, yeah. we've seen like Svelte use it go a different approach with just vanilla js and uh js doc but uh but yeah right oh okay yeah this question came up earlier and i didn't uh highlight it but uh because while you were authoring there people uh, oh, yeah. there was a question there like oh can i put this html in a separate file um yes yes the uh external styles and templates are supported there like all the things that you normally are accustomed to with Angular are supported in analog as far as external tiles and templates. Uh, being able to use like SAS uh, in your inline templates and things like that. So those things are supported also. Which nice. we, we, yeah, we did have to do some work on those to, to get parity with what the, the CLI does because Vite, it's like I said, Vite has different. Um, different APIs and things to, to do CSS transforms and things. So, but yes, that does work. All right. All right. Um, oh. oh, I see. Okay. We're getting some more outside questions now. Uh, I don't know how much you know on the Angular community in, in general, but uh, people asking about Angular Dart and about Angular Native. Do you know oh, anything man. about those? Angular native has never been a thing as long as I'm uh, I, as long as I know. But Angular Dart was, or I will say, Angular Dart uh, is is still a thing uh, that I learned uh, here recently. Um, but Angular and Angular Dart were like two I don't know two divergences of the same framework at one point in time. But right. Angular Dart ended up just like completely going off a different path, which I think was good because trying to support two ecosystems with two different languages uh, with the same framework was uh, seems like it was going to be a recipe for a disaster but uh, but those yeah they did diverge and angular dart still is uh, alive and well as far as i know i think there's a like a community based version of it also but yeah i was i was surprised to hear that it was uh still being used but it still has a place i guess uh inside uh inside and outside of google so uh so that is there there you go all right all right um i think we're good on questions for today um we should all thank brendan for joining us i learned a ton about um analog and uh so a bit selfishly i learned a bit about nitro which i'm <laughs> pretty interested to see more about um but uh yeah i mean it's very clear that going with angular even in the modern hipster i'm just like spinning out a cool app thing <laughs> you're not suffering any um if you've got options like uh analog to use um yep. so 
Um, thank you very much for joining us today, Brandon. Um, the stream's going to continue. I'm going to do my This Week in JavaScript. And I'm actually, I think I want to talk about resumability. We'll see how much time we have. I've, I've got some really interesting insights there. But uh, yeah, um, it's, it's been a blast. Uh, is there anyone you would like to shout out or anything you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah, first of all, I appreciate uh Appreciate allowing me to come on the stream and talk about analog and meta frameworks and everything else. Uh, really had a good time there. Uh, shout out to the to other, other contributors on the team, uh, Marco, who's also on the NGX team, and Robin, who's done a has been both of them have been big contributors to the project and definitely the community. Uh, so definitely want to give a shout out to them. Um, yeah, people in Discord. Uh, I would invite people to come in there and check out the analog Discord and everything there too. So. Uh, check out the project and you know try it out give us some more some more hearts and likes and things all the good things so yeah awesome awesome yeah a lot of hype a lot of love from the chat um, it was great having you on um, hopefully we'll have you on again as um, more things progress so um, until then until next time uh, we'll be seeing you thanks yeah. see ya uh, that was awesome um, I, it, it's, it's, it's cool to see Angular sort of reinvent itself. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's cool to see it um, kind of keep up with the time. I remember, you know, I mentioned this a few streams back about the self-closing components, you know. But I, it, it's really awesome to see, like, as I said, it, when you're looking at analog there, when the standalone components stuff it, and the loaders and stuff, it's, it's all the same patterns, you know. It, um, to a certain point, there's a kind of an obvious trend, like you get in the space and you're like, oh yeah, we should do something like this and everything kind of converges. Um, but it's cool that like, in a sense, the framework, like Angular or React or Svelte or Solid or whatever, isn't the thing that prevents you from that level of experience. I mean, I, I, exper I realized that when I used uh, Create T3 app or Create JD app, right, um, that it was basically the same thing like the fact that a solid or react actually made a lot less of a difference until you open the performance benchmark tab um but it's interesting because a lot of those abstractions are what you actually spend more of your time doing than the simple ui stuff so uh it has an important place you know is there a repo for the solid nitro? Yes. Oh, yeah. We should have got Brandon to share that. He said he, he I don't think he's actually committed it up. He said he should. Um, but there is a uh, Veep plugin nitro that he has published. Let's see if I can find that Veep plugin nitro. Um, there it is. Analog SV plugin nitro. Oh, come on. Just. I, you ever do, do that search and then you like don't get the GitHub? Um, it's probably because it's under the analog um, thing. Someone could, probably could find the link better than I can. Because um, I, I got like the NPM link, not the uh, the repo link. Yeah. Also, I should mention, although I'm like super, super late and I apologize to these people, is that early on the stream I got a, I got a few subscri uh, subscribers and I was so into what uh, Brandon was saying I didn't give a shout out. But um, going back here, let's see if we can find it. We definitely got a couple new subs, although it's probably been like two hours since they subbed. Um, why can't I even see anything anymore? Oh yeah. Oh, this is so sad. The chat like scrolled up past it. I can't even see it. <laughs> I know Julian NG subbed for 10 months. I didn't even realize. Have I been a Twitch affiliate for 10 months? Well, I guess I have. So thank you. And there was one other that I just don't remember off the top of my head, but thank you. I think it was like a seven month sub as well. So apparently there's been a few of you who've been, been here the whole time I've been uh, affiliate. Uh, what else we got going here? But yeah, the, the idea is Nitro is another solution which builds the whole adapter layer in, right? This is the layer that no one wants to keep on building over and over and over again. And 
Um, they made Veep Plug-in Nitro, which for, some, for the life of me, I can't seem to find. I, maybe if I go to Analog, if I go to Analog GitHub, I will find it. Maybe it's in their packages, apps, packages, packages. Sorry, I probably should share my screen so like you, people can see what I'm actually doing. Um, sorry, this is apps, analog, packages, V plugin Nitro. All right, let's drop that in the chat. Oh, Lynn Hart Phoenix already beat me to it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, there you go. Um, the other thing is, uh, um, sorry, where is it going? I, yeah, it's, it's, it, this takes care of all the, the, the adapter level, right? And, um, uh, what do I want to look for? Um, you do need to kind of figure out how to get, um, those things kind of together. Um, actually, no, let's just go top level. Right. Um, So maybe I'll get him to come on here one of these days again. But similar idea was uh, uh, Nikhil has been working on. I don't know if you've seen Bun App. It's like a, a, it's something that Jared kind of put together where you could kind of like define generic config um, for basically setting up the right type of bundler for the right app. So you could like kind of support anything from React server components to client side react to solid felt remix everyone in the same kind of setup and it's by using this idea of combining bundlers with route mapping um and it can handle client and server as long as you make the right bundles and assign it to the right location it can work um Nikhil went and ported it to um uh Veet, essentially and into javascript and then use Nitro as a server thing for deployments. So he created something where he literally, yeah, this is how you do React SSR, Solid SSR, basically put any framework into it. And he, he can do everything from RSCs to client only React to basically solid um, server client, whatever, and have it all automatically have pre rendering, uh, deploy to Cloudflare, you know, all the stuff, all because of Nitro. Um, so this was like his idea of, of taking a baseline of uh, how to generically make a framework builder, um, you know, because it sounds like with Nitro, you need to like, they have an opinion layer, a na layer. This is like one level up in terms of sending convention. Um, but yeah, anyway. Trying definitely fails the benchmark of finding stuff on the internet. <laughs> I hear that Jared may be on. I, yeah, I, I would love to talk to Jared sometime. I, I, I actually, yeah, it's so weird. I, yeah, I probably, if I asked him on, I, he, he's sometimes a bit of a private guy. He's not the kind of guy that come on camera, but I mean, he, he, uh, I don't know. He, he might, we could probably talk with Jared if that's something you all would be interested in. I talked to him a bunch, especially about the bundling stuff, because he, want, he, he when he was designing Bun App, he was like, you, you know, look at this, Ryan. What do you think? Do you think this could work for Solid as well? And actually, Bun released 0 0.7 today, which adds support for a bunch of other frameworks. He actually previewed me that he had Solid Start working completely in Bun, but um, he said for some reason that basically there's something like last minute. He's like, yeah, sorry, this won't get into 0.7. It'll be in 0.8. It'll be in the next version. Um, but it's cool. And I'm, I'm also what was like, man, no rush. Um, we, we're, we're looking at the Astro, uh, you know, rebase or maybe even Nitro rebase, I guess. Um, so, you know, all the work you're doing, like it's all starting right now might not actually be the, the ultimate goal. We, we know for sure with all start, we want to get rid of the adapters. Um, so we're just like looking at this kind of base, um, setups, you know, so that we can abstract that away. Oh, 
What's what, what? What are you sharing with with us here, Lynn? It's funny in the background while 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 this was going on, I, w I was running the solid islands and the quick stuff, but we didn't get the full number of comments. See, it's 115 comments. It's probably too small for you to see. Not the 14 or sorry, 1,100 comments instead of 1,400. It's 300 comments short on both of these. And I was like, oh man, these aren't the real numbers. I was trying to show like both quick and solid start. Uh, Islands router, you know, like our RSCs get about the same score and they're in the mid 80s. This is shifted up because um, like 20% of the comments are missing. These should both be about 85. Um, so yeah, it's it's just, uh, yeah. But yeah, let me, let me pull up that other link and see what's going on here. Okay, yeah, this one has the full amount of comments in it, although I think this is probably the standard solid hacker news, not the islands one, right? Ooh, that's 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 kind of slow for the page to show up. Which which solid hacker news is this one? Is it the one that I used? Or is this Yeah. URL towards the top. Yeah, this is the Netlify Edge one. Yeah, so this is like our standard single page app one, not our islands one or whatever. Yeah, this is the one that scores around 54 or whatever. Yeah, there's a lot more data in this one. This is a much better tool if you want to like actually analyze where the time's being spent. Um, uh, let me see if I can see because you can get like you can look at the timing of when the resources come in this one has streaming you can see the resources beat the full page render coming in uh lighthouse kind of masks the screen streaming for you so you don't actually get to see the whole thing um so this actually is a little bit more accurate on that side um and what you're seeing is yeah it's interesting because the purple if i remember is is actually not scripting or anything it's like just like dom painting type stuff right uh, or no, that can't be images. What is that? It's the purple. Uh, brain thread. The biggest thing is this page is absolutely humongous. So it's like there's this huge amount of stuff. Uh, do, 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 do. There's this JS block here, and then. Why am I not reading this properly? It's so funny. I was expecting to see something much more. It says image, but image doesn't make any sense. Yeah, in any case, yeah, it shows you each request made it on the page to get that the fav icon, web manifest, the you know little Chrome icon, uh, Android Chrome ninety two, interesting. Um, but yeah, entry client JS and CS, the specific page JS, and the uh, initial page load for the HTML. Anyway, this is a great tool in general. You can actually see the paint scroll in. You can see like on this slow, I'm gathering this is a very slow network. You can see that the page doesn't load at first and then you can see the benefit of having the shell and then you can see the streaming data because the data doesn't show up until here. Um, and then it's almost immediately done here. But Basically, this shows you the advantage of streaming because if you didn't have streaming, this would be white all the way to here. That's why I use this when I showed the Remix guys because they're like, streaming doesn't matter. I'm like, okay, yeah. I will show you a page that shows up and gives you a loading indicator at 1.7 seconds versus yours that will take five seconds. They came back four months later and like, okay, we have streaming. So um, anyway, that's probably enough on that for now. <laughs> Oh, that's a 4G? I, that page is just brutal. I, I was thinking 3G. Anyways, sorry. Just benchmarks is... Obviously, we can get a lot of fun and tangent there. But yeah, I was trying to decide. Did I want to do this week in JavaScript? Or did I want to talk about some more future future topics? Like, how much time do we have? It's 2.30. I could go for a bit. So we we could talk about some 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 cool stuff. Um... What's that replay IO? No, uh, I was looking at web page test. Um, 
Anyway, uh, yeah, so something that I was thinking about, remember last week when I was, you know, or the week before I was doing this like silly Excaladraw thing where I was like Astro RCs, you know, solid server components, quick Marco, kind of on the scale. I was like, I started thinking about, uh, Dave made this really funny joke where he's like, is this like the likelihood to ship like here versus, you know, Marco 6 that, you know, hasn't come out. And he's not wrong, but I started... I started thinking about if... What if... Like, I've been looking a lot in this zone because there's real obvious wins here. If you have islands, who cares about... Resumability. I'm, I'm just going to straight up put it like if you have partial hydration that will re do 70 or 80% of your hydration costs, remove 70% 80% of your code, who cares about that last 20% comparison? Like comp today you got 100% of that, right? And if you looked at the benchmarks I was showing you a moment ago, there for simple tests like that, there is no distinguishable difference between quick and Astro and Solid Start with the islands and RSCs. React's sure slower, but I mean, React wasn't really going for performance primarily. They're like, okay, if we improve performance, that's great. But like, and they did. Um, you know, they on that simple, silly test, React now is 10 points higher than, uh, like Next went from 48 to 58 or 49 to 59 or whatever, right? They're 10 points higher. But I was like, okay, there's a DX consideration when you get into this explicit stuff. So no, everybody just keeps on like choking over themselves when they're like, oh, why do I have to think about what's on the server and the client and stuff, right? <laughs> We're getting existential on what Marco is. But <laughs> what I started thinking about was, you know, I, I mentioned this last week. What if Marco was always right? You know, like, what if we just assume that everything Marco has ever done has generally been the smartest thing you could do, right? And I, I kind of live in, the, but like, obviously there's implementation things, but let's say like directionally they have the right vision. No, that's H. It's not just, no, that's HTMX. HTMX. Hmm. No, I don't want to talk about HTMX. I don't think I have anything to say about it. I, I noticed recently people have been talking about HTMX, which is confusing to me. Well, actually, it's not that confusing, I guess. It's. I think HTMX has its role right now. I think it's important that people go use that, understand what's wrong with that mentality, and then, you know, move on. Um, but I, I think... I think yeah, I think that's really all I want to say about HTMX. Um, anyway. It's the new milk, yeah. Yeah, and you've, I'm probably taking it about as equally seriously. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. I'm, I'm, I, I, <laughs> Arthur's probably among us now. Yeah, I, I'm... I don't know what to say. It has a very specific place where it's interesting, but then it's just not a zone that I live in. So I, I think it's it's fine. Like I, I think people need to be reminded that you can do a lot with less, right? You know what I mean? Like we've been sitting there building up these like big machine m machinery around JS, and this is what I'm talking about. The whole RSC thing gets us in this zone where like we're like, oh. Like now I have this thing and this thing, and then these work like this and the server stuff has to work this way and the client works this way and then they work together and like, then I do this or, and it, it's a lot. So we, we have to remember like, at some point you like, you can just like use some HTML or use some JavaScript and just like get there, right? And it's a good reset kind of perspective um, to, to see that, right? That's, that's, that's where I kind of see it. But the, as I said, that's about the extent of which I have any interest because it's like, it, it's kind of like, 
you know, you, you can't just like, th there's different scales of optimizations and right solutions for the problem. And we've been building systems to automate where things go to. Uh, an example that maybe backend people would understand is like in hardware, like CPUs have caches and then you have RAM, right? You have like level one, level two, maybe level three cache on your CPU and then you have RAM and then you have a hard disk. And in a way, HTMX is like, oh, look, what happens if you got rid of the RAM, got rid of the, the, the CPU cache and just had CPU writing directly to the hard drive? Like think about how simple that is. And you'll be like, damn, wow, get rid of all that complexity. It just works. I don't need any cash just do it but like at a certain point you're just like wait I, I can't actually do anything real with without that like there's a reason why we have caches or or um you know memory um right like v there's a bit of a similar vibe there um where it's just like don't work you don't have to, don't sweat the details so to speak but it will get you in trouble eventually perhaps although what you found is people found that svelte has the tools if they look hard enough for them um and i, I you know with an early ecosystem htmx might eventually have the tools too so i mean that's probably fine just do it <laughs> marco marco's appeared on the stream it's over. If your CPU doesn't work. <laughs> uh. Yeah, yeah, I guess there is a bit of an abstraction thing. It's not quite the same metaphor. It's just, you're right. And maybe that maybe that's the thing, right? If we find the right abstractions, I just, I, I think sometimes if the abstraction is too restrictive, that we end up just having to build the thing on the outside anyways. And that's the thing. And maybe that's the same vibe. I sometimes feel that this felt abstraction is a little bit too restrictive, right? So HTMX is like, how strict can we make the abstraction to the point that we don't intend to do the majority of things, but we make the one thing we focus on work in a simple manner. And I think at that they succeed. So that's that's probably a better way of looking at it. As I said, the problem is like, I'm trying to like spend a lot of time scratching my head, trying to figure out like how to move stuff forward. And sometimes you have to look back to move forward, you know, and that's where that fits in it. But like uh, beyond that, I, like I, as I said, I, I don't really have much to really think about on the HTMX side. Leaking abstractions are, are a death nail. Yeah, unless the goal, like Svelte is one of the most successful abstractions, I feel, as long as you're like not trying to do something too ambitious with it in a certain way. And I don't mean you can't build big apps with it. You can, but it's like, if there's a certain range of problems there and you never have to hit them, then you never have this problem. In the same way, I feel like, um, like to more of an extreme is the same with HTMX. So um, the truth matters, a lot of us are just building websites. So like, who cares, right? I'm, I am doing something very different than building websites. But I have to acknowledge that there's this overload, right? We'll talk about it in this week in JavaScript in a bit, about like the intensity of this overload and when it's done to the community. Um, and the problem is I, I come here week to week and I still, um, like I'm still piling onto that overload because anything I'm going to talk about is going to be incredibly difficult to follow or complicated to think through. And it's also an abstraction thing where I'm trying to think of if there's a way that we can make a nice abstraction in the same, in the same vein as what we were talking about a minute ago, which perhaps HTMX does. The only difference is the thing that I'm trying to solve is I guess significantly more challenging. So it's like, it's just like in a different place on the scale. Um, so yeah, I, this, is, this is what led me down this path where I was like, okay, I had given up on a certain direction to a certain degree because I looked at it and I was like, I, the, the options here are pretty bad and, or pretty heavy is the best, best way to put it. And we're only accounting for the last 20, 30% perhaps. But you do these mental explorations because you sometimes realize that you can get more than the 20 or 30%. And that's what I, why I looked at this because I was like, okay, on one hand we have something like quick, 
which just the dollar sign can't be the future in my mind. I know it's an unfortunate thing to say. It's just like, as long as we're living in a world with, with the dollar sign, and this might include server dollar sign too, I don't know. Um, I don't think we've solved the problem. Like this is a, uh, uh, along the way step. Conversely, on the Marco side, how the hell do you build the, the like the, the compiler they're building is so, like no one's built a compiler like this. Can we solve these problems without building like the super compiler? So I, I started going, okay, fine. What if I want to make resumability happen? You know, I, I've been kind of pushing it off because like, as I said, it's not where we get our biggest wins, but what if we want to make it happen? What, what would that look like? So I, I wrote uh, some thoughts down and I, I can share this in the chat for people who care. I think the problem is if you read this, you're going to be like, this is just Ryan talking garbage out of his head and I have no clue what he's talking about. So I'm hoping to actually explain what I'm talking about, answer questions, and then we can kind of think through this together, which is much more helpful than trying to read something and being like, uh, you know, what the hell is he talking about? I, everyone who read it was like, I'm going to have to read that like three or four more times. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know. This is just rough ideas that I'm spitting off the top of my head. Um, but... My, my whole concept here, which is one that I actually got to give credit to Michael Rawlings from Marco for suggesting a couple months ago when I talked to him, was I, I just wanted to explore it more. And I'm sure the Marco guys have explored it more. Every time I talk to them, it's like they have some hidden secret. They're just like, they're, they're just all knowing. Um, but I was like, okay, we have reactivity. I was hanging out with Mishko a lot in the last set of conferences and he kept on going about how signals are the key to everything. And I'm like, yeah, of course I know that, but no, I, I actually listened to him like more closely and understood what he, what he, you know, his interpretation of what that meant. And I, I, I was like, okay, we have the graph, right? Like, and you could, you could think about this. Like if you have a component graph, right? Right. Like let's, let's pretend we have like, uh, what's that fill? Let's, can I fill this with nothing? Sure. If we have a bunch of components, right? Do, 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 do. Let's just throw a bunch of these around. Sorry, where's another one? Why can't I grab this one? Okay, there we go. And you have like component and you have a component tree. How many more of these do I have? Endless components. Okay, sweet. And they pass. The way this kind of works in a framework like Solid is inside the component, you might have pieces of state. And I'm actually going to fill these. Okay. And what you end up passing down, um, how do I want to visualize this? Yeah, let's do that. And then let's, let's move this over here. Let's make one more of these. I think that's what I wanted to do. What you end up doing is you end up like passing, uh, let's go white on these props or maybe, maybe green is a good color. Yeah, let's do green. You end up passing props. But when you pass the props, you're not really passing the component. Like you're passing this state. It could be reactive or it could be static, but let's pretend this is the reactive state. You also have some static state, which uh, we can draw with maybe blue, but the static state isn't state. It never changes. So it's only the reactive state that we actually care about. So I'm not actually going to bother with the blue. Never mind. So I, I, I'm, you know, yeah. So I, I wanted this because I wanted a couple scenarios. You might have a component that doesn't have its own state, and then repasses the parent state down to this. You might have your own state and the parent state. So you might actually end up passing your own state down and the parent state down as props like certain portions of it. This might have two things of state. And this one might get both of those. This one might get this one. But what I'm getting at is if you look at an app uh, component hierarchy as a bunch of reactive nodes, 
It's a new blog. This is a fair question. No, it's when I post stuff to Deb too, I post in a consumable way. This is not at all ready to be consumed. This is a brainstorm. This is not like a, I've discovered it. When I post to Dev2, I have an example and I have code and I show people how this stuff works. This is a thinking. But yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this a bit later. Yeah. So the, the, I, I want to talk about this because, sorry, I, I'll bring this up. Resumability has nothing to do with lazy loading. It ha Quick does three different things. Resumability is one of it. But Quick is not resumability. Like, do, do, you, do you understand? Like, I, I, I've been trying to explain to people what resumability is. Mishko, everyone's trying to explain to it. But I'm, I'm, I, I, well, the reason that I wanted to sh sh show this graph here is because I, I wanted to kind of point out that like if you view the app here you might have some other props coming in and i'm, I'm gonna give, give those props a blue arrow they're not gonna connect to a circle because they might be static oh damn it i arrowed these this one's green okay let's get out of here now i'm gonna be blue you might have some static props too like things that don't change see that's not connected to anything on the end you might you might have Maybe it's the same piece of information past here. But what I'm getting at here is the if you assume that you know these connections at server render time, because you have to run all the code once on the server, when you start up your app, you don't necessarily need all this stuff, right? And one way to solve the, the, the okay, I have to add this, the next piece for this to make sense. We need to add, um, what should I use? Triangles. We need to add event handlers. Oh, damn it, I did it again. This is the problem I always have with the scale draw. I switch to the new color while I'm still highlighting the previous thing. Okay, so let's, let's make a, let's make a event handler. Let's pretend that, um, and let's pretend there's an event connected to the DOM here, okay? And it writes to this signal, okay? And actually, I almost, actually, I, maybe I wanted to actually write to this signal. An example of this is like if you have you pass like an on click to here as, to, as a component prop, and then you pass it on click to here as a component prop, and then it finally gets in the DOM down here. So this is like this is kind of the scenario I'm talking about. But in in most frameworks, when you start up your app, it runs down and it basically recreates all the state you need and reruns all these components all the way down and that's what hydration is but and it, it attaches any necessary uh event listeners let's say in our case uh, for the for this sim simple example i only have one event listener it also um queues up any effects that needs to run but in something that's resumable you don't want to rerun everything on the on the on the boot up. In fact, you 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 basically only want to attach this event handler. And the funny thing is, Solid already does this. Um, I don't I, I don't know if anyone saw my Astro stream a long time ago, where um, there was a problem with the way Astro was hydrating, and I it wouldn't work properly until I like scrolled up and then scrolled down again when I refreshed the page. It was just some. It was actually a Solid adapter issue not astro's own fault but it showed something where i was in solid i was like clicking a bunch and then i scrolled up and scrolled down and then suddenly the, the counter jumped to 10 when it hydrated um because i collected all the clicks and this is something that react solid and quick do and i think astro to a certain extent maybe for the, but I, I know for sure like as a core framework react solid and astro all collect no sorry react solid and quick all collect your events before the 
app has hydrated before it's even finished loading. This is like all part of the streaming thing. Re in React, they do something called selective hydration. So like if they, I mean, this tree is kind of backwards from my example, but in React, if you, if they were, let's say they're hydrating right to left for some reason, they start hydrating here and they start hydrating here and then you click the button, React goes, okay, so quit hydrating here, quickly hydrate this side and then let this interact before you finish hydrating the rest of the stuff. That's how selective hydration, but for that to work, you have to basically be aware of the event handler before you ever hydrate. Um, in solid, we don't have selective hydration. We just collect the events and then replay them. Like when we get to here, we're like, oh, someone has already clicked this. Let's replay it and feed it back through the system. And with, um, uh, what's the other one? Uh, sorry, with quick, well, they do this resumability thing, but it's it's the same idea. You just attach all these global event handlers. So we're already doing that. React already does that. That means in theory, once the inline script is on the page, the page is interactive, whether you're solid, React, or quick. You don't actually have to wait for all the code to run. You don't actually have to wait for the whole thing to be hydrated. Now, what happens when you do click you know, is a different story, right? Because in Saul's case, you're going to wait for the whole thing to hydrate if, you know, before it happens or, or if you're lucky, you know, it hydrates early. In React's case, they will um, try and prioritize your hydration. And in Quick's case, well, there is no hydration. It just goes and, and, and does it. If we ignore all the lazy code running and stuff, this is the fundamental thing that, that that differentiates there. The all three of these solutions are interactive. It's not like um, I don't know if, if Remix has implemented that now. They probably have, but like classically, like SSR, like before React 18, um, or in Svelte or Vue or a bunch of other frameworks, some of them might have this kind of stuff. If you tried to click or interact with the app before the JavaScript had loaded or hydrated. Um, all you would get is progressive enhancement, essentially. Like you would just like, oh, that's a link tag, or it wouldn't do anything. You'd it, it'd swallow your click and it'd be gone. Like that's why if you have PE, at least it would go reload the page. But um, so in a sense, you could say like P progressive enhancement gives you a different experience though because you're reloading the page. So you could say it's interactive at that point, but I I, I don't count that. That I mean that's like a worst case scenario. But like generally speaking your app wasn't interactive until you were done loading all the code and hydrating. Whereas in modern frameworks, that isn't the case, right? And I, I want to emphasize this because I, I want to be understood a little bit, like what the difference is between resumability, between what Quick does and how like these aren't exactly the same thing. And what portion of this do we actually care about? Because if you're interactive, and you're non-blocking or something, like maybe it's okay if hydration takes longer, right? That's what React's arguing. But as we saw with the million stream uh, last week, just being faster is a big benefit. Like, let's pretend Solid's five times faster than hydrating than React today. Well, I, I, you know, that selective hydration might not actually matter at all. It might be just more code to complicate things, right? Um, it it might have been better just to be faster, right? And um, but you could argue it at a certain size, that was, that would be a consideration. But on the other hand, you know, even with Quick's resumability where they don't need any of the code to be there to be, you know, interactive, technically the others don't either. Um, you know, the code still needs to be there to actually run the code. So it's not like you're actually zero kilobytes of JavaScript at the beginning. Like that, that's not, you're not counting properly. You have to count the code required to complete the interaction. So when you click and it does the thing and then it completes the thing, that's what you want to measure. I think INP is kind of along that line. That's what INP is. So Quick knows that. So they preload the scripts eagerly. So in a sense, everybody is preloading JavaScript. The difference is a resumable framework doesn't hydrate or doesn't get blocked by hydrate between that interaction. They, but they all preload the JavaScript, they all collect, the modern framers all collect the event, they don't lose your input. It just takes a little bit longer between um, when it goes, um, so to speak. 
Now, there, don't get me wrong. There's impact of quick stuff all being async uh, like that, which means that they do have slightly higher costs after the fact on updates, right? Like there, there are trade-offs for the different approaches, but I just say like holistically speaking, it's not about lazy loading. It's not about, um, it's about code execution is what I want to focus on here at resumability. Okay. Still following me? Uh, quick sidebar here. When you refer to, how does the React Store client component DOM do the client? Systems? No, that's the difference. It's not like .NET. It's it, the reason it's it's not stored because you don't unload the page, right? I, I imagine router refresh is just like the 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 app router refresh, which means the app is still there in the client. You don't need to send anything back to the server. The trick is when the server gets a new URL and goes to render the parts that it needs. The, the, but if the refresh, um then there is no new URL. They know what components to render. They just don't render the client components on the server and get the new props going into those client components. And then when it gets to the client, they just, while they're diffing all the RSC stuff that comes back, they hit the client component and go like, oh yeah, same component, pass in the new props, update it on the client. So basically the whole trick to RSCs is after the initial page load, you never render client components on the on the server. So you don't have to send anything back and forth because all you need to do, like it, it, every page starts from the server. So there's no, there's nothing to send. Like all the, like in, in a server component setup, the topmost thing is always a server component. So, and there's no state in it. So it's only these static things kind of. So like your starting point is going to be a component like this where it has state, pretend the, this is green and or sorry, blue and that there, this red arrow doesn't go up. All you need to know is what props get passed into the client components. Um, that back and forth trick is what ASP.NET used to do, which was terrible, um, big mess. And you'd be sending the same data back and forth multiple times. This is why this is different because the client app never unloads. They just use diffing. Okay, but I want to be resumable. And the, the, the thing is, Sure, I have this information here, but it's really tricky if my first point of entry here is this code here where I go set state, essentially update count, pretend this is a count state here that I pass through and pass through, and then I get to the event handler and I'm like, count equals count plus one. And the, the problem is when you get to this point, if, first of all, you need to know what count was, right? Uh, was was count uh was count 10 what, what what was count so you need to know that and i mean i think i've shown this in code before but uh let's trash this for a second okay. like i mean you can see this right here even without going through the components if this is my code entry point increment it can't live in here inside this function that I never run. It has to run up here. Now, how the hell do I get set count up, up here? How do I get count up here if I haven't created the component that creates the state? Right? That, that, that's, the, that's the problem, right? Like if you, sure, you have this event handler but how do you, you do it, right? And Quick's answer to that largely it involves a lot of serialization, right? You, you can go, okay, well, I can pretend, or it's not even pretend, it's, it's, it's not hard to know. You can go, this is location zero for this, for this component instance. So you can say this is component one in the tree, the topmost component, let's say, and this is zero. So 1.0 is the signal. And now instead of doing that, you can basically go like, you know, look like, let's call it, uh, let's go context one zero. And actually it's the second index in the array. So context for component one, the first piece of state, or actually let's call it component zero. Context for component zero, first piece of state zero, the setter is one and the count is 
is zero. It's the first argument of the array, right? And ta-da, now, as long as we write the right thing into these locations in context, um, we can essentially have our stuff. So if we write that this is, you know, a zero, context zero, zero is a signal with a value one, um, you could you have the information you need to you know create it and then there's this other part where you actually want to update the dom and for that you you have to also kind of go okay well i need to also know that the signal and you know this because you server render it you need to know that the signal also has a dependency um basically if you gave every signal um, a number so you know this is the first one in the app so this is you know s signal zero um, and you gave it every like effect a number or something, you know, and this is effect zero, the first effect in the app, then like essentially you can go signal zero has effect zero as its dependency. And then as long as you had the right way of when you run it to like link it to the right way, you could possibly unwind this thing. And this is essentially what quick does. Um, and you know, because of this hoisting, because like the way we pulled this out and kind of pull this out, you know, there there is this concern, right? That, well, what if you have something else like const some number and then, I don't know, like I'm, I'm just making a situation up, but like there's a concern. This one is actually isn't a good example. Uh, what if increment is by num, right? Like you start having closures, other closures. So then maybe you give this a location and whatnot. This is static, so it's pretty easy, but it's like, what if it's get numb? You know, like this, this continues on. And because of the potential of this hoisting and the need for this value that's returned to be serializable, um, they quick came up with a convention. They're like, okay, well, we should put dollar signs on stuff to tell you that, hey, this is going to get hoisted out. And I, I think with quick, even if you don't inline it, you have to put a dollar sign around the function call as well. I, I forget if they've changed that slightly, but what I'm, or the function definition, but what I'm getting at is they put all these dollar signs in here. So you know that, Hey, this has to be serializable that gets passed in here. Like, cause we're going to serialize all these values and you have to be aware of us doing this. Otherwise you know, at runtime, you're going to get some random error that's like, this value isn't serializable. And you're like, why the hell should this value be serializable? So that in, in a bunch of different places, they put dollar signs to kind of warn you. Indices sound like how hooks have to run in the same order. Yeah, it's kind of, it's a kind of bit like that. But if you think about it, a setup function that runs once also has that property because it only runs once. So there is no, it, it, it only runs in one order, right? Um, Yeah, yeah, computers are getting more fun because if you got to serialize, like, yeah, a computer is actually an easier example here because if it's like const double count, you can actually see the problem because you're like create memo uh, count times two. Well, you're referencing this count. Like, if you don't want to, if you, the, you know, the thinking is like, if you only need the code that you need at the specific time, if you don't need this code, then, you know, this should be dollar sign two and, and so on. That's kind of like the whole thinking. We break it up as small as possible. We know all the ser all the possible serialization boundaries. We serialize what we need as we run on the server. And that's basically um, how quick goes. So there's a will serialize dollar sign and this might serialize. Yeah, dollar sign is like, it's, it's, it's all a might. And because it's kind of like, if you use, well, here's a uh, similar scenario. If you put use client on a bunch of your React components, it's only the topmost use client component that actually has to have serializable props because that's the one that goes over the server uh, server client boundary for server components. Um, all the other use clients basically do nothing. And it's kind of similar. Re uh, Quick's compiler will arrange all the code and use the dollar signs to both inform the compiler and also inform you that this could be serializable or need to be serializable, but they enforce it because they automate where those boundaries happen. You don't define it. So from that perspective, this is 
probably the one of the sanest things you could do because otherwise like it could be just literally anywhere you could be like in the middle and they're like because of like some intersection of reactivity they're like sorry this memo needs to be serialized all of a sudden you're like but i was calculating some unserializable value with it why like they that's that's why they do this <laughs> oh yeah okay quick a second i see what you're saying yeah, yeah. I, it's actually using this kind of abstraction is actually kind of safe. And in fact, this abstraction, we've seen it before too. What's another example of it? Oh, Svelte. Svelte. Um, let's do this. Svelte.dev. Um, mm, REPL. Let name 2 be hello world 2. And then we actually need to actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. We need to put click handler on here. Otherwise it's not going to do what I want to show, which is that um, name plus equals exclamation mark. The reason, what am I doing here? Oh, whatever, I don't care. This is felt telling me that I have a accessibility error. But my point is, if you look at the compiled output here, what you're going to see here, in Svelte, besides, you know, all these light, nice, us developers like using these kind of T1, T3, what you're going to see here is there's going to be like index-based dirty checking. Uh, so, oh, right. I need, sorry, name two. That's my problem. There we go. I'm like, why is there only one? Yeah, where is it? We're going to see index-based dirty checking here. If index is one, do this. If index is two, do this. They basically do the same thing. They just put these into slots. Um, okay, so Svelte is the same category. The only difference is um, Svelte is localized, and we want to do this. Like Svelte only cares about the component, right? Like it's dirty in this whole check and this whole context is literally like re-render the whole component, right? Svelte like React re-renders whole components, but we want it at a more global sense in our in our in our in our system here. So how does quick handle unserializable stuff? Well, that's the thing. It just errors at you. It, it, I, I, to my knowledge, it goes, hey, this thing isn't serializable. Like if, it's, if you're crossing a dollar sign boundary, it has to be serializable. End of story. That's why they've worked so much. They have one of the cr craziest serializers in terms of like different kinds of things they can serialize. Basically, if there's a dollar sign, it has to be serializable. No, th this is a lie. It, it has nothing to do with lazy loading. They load all the code eagerly. That the, he shows that demo so that like people can um, uh, so 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 like people can see that the code doesn't need to be there. But in reality, quick loads all the code the same as everyone else. Yeah, sorry. I if I seem harsh on it, it's just even me, even I'm feeling their frustration a bit. And it's the problem is how they teach it. Um, the, the, they, they teach it by showing you that the code doesn't need to be there, which is a really nice trick. But then everyone's like, oh, well, if I want a subway, the truth of the matter is, I mean, if, if you go to like, I don't know, builder.io, I'm pretty sure this will work. I, although they do another page technique, but if I go here and I like flip this and then I go, was it uh, sources, command P. Uh, disable JavaScript at this point, or not not disable in JavaScript. Sorry, that's the wrong one. I want to sorry. I, I want to enable JavaScript again. My bad. Enable JavaScript. I want to turn off the network. Right. Um, offline. Like, I, I hope there's an interaction on here that I can show. But like, see, they they do this trick where they actually only load half the page on their, their website, but like code that, okay. Maybe they didn't make their own website to do, okay. Sorry, this is like the worst demo. Um, okay, never mind. Maybe in theory, they should have already loaded the the code for the, for this menu, um, uh, to, to my knowledge, um, the second that I shrunk the screen so to speak. I mean, they could have done it eagerly in general, but the way quick generally works is that 
they preemptively the builder site might be a little bit too aggressive on the JS bundles. Yeah, they are. Yeah, this is actually I. Yeah, okay, never mind. Okay, fine. This is a fair. This is a fair concern depending on how people build their quick app. Um, but in general, I the, like from a theoretical standpoint, if you build quick the way that I would build quick, this won't be this wouldn't be a problem. You also wouldn't be able to be as like, huh, I don't load the code because I would load the code. Like this is part of why I don't care as much about that aspect of quick because like that whole trick doesn't like if you if if you can take advantage of it too aggressively then you have the exact problem that you're worried about and if you do the sensible thing then there's actually no particular advantage of doing it that way versus doing it how another framework would do it right okay cool so I guess the Builder.io website actually isn't the best example. I'm sorry, Mishko, for doing that. I wanted to prove your point home, but I guess I, I'm, I missed on that. But um, <laughs> like what I'm getting at is like, these are other concerns, right? Quick is so was so focused on that lazy loading though, that they made sure that they were gonna serialize all these little pieces. So I came at it and I was like, well, what if we don't serialize everything? What if we like literally don't care because like in the most resumable sense yes you have all that data let's ship it all across but it's one of those like um, memory versus cpu questions and if the cpu isn't that bad i told you it's the last 20 percent um i mean you could argue this uh, serialization isn't that bad either i guess but but i i started thinking well what what the problem with the serialization thing is if with if you don't do the dollar signs like if you can do the dollar signs and now everything is serializable and it's kind of a pain in the ass. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to be convinced on otherwise, but if, if you got rid of the dollar signs and tried to do the smart thing, the problem is once you hit something that wasn't serializable, that needs to be serializable, you were, you're screwed. Like the system has to work that way unless it didn't. So I was like, okay, baseline. What if you didn't have to serialize anything? Would this be possible? Could we actually pull off something very similar, but serialization could be opt-in and optimization? Like there's certain data that you know is serializable, like resources, like async stuff. You know when you're gonna load something in async and you expect it to go across the client server, you're like, yeah, okay, fine. That can be, resources have to be serializable. They have to be serializable today and solid. You know this, it's fine. But I don't wanna worry about some random create memo down the line, right? So what, what I, start, I, I started thinking about, okay, if you assume that they're opt-in, like a resources opt-in, then is it possible to do resumability? And I looked at this graph. <laughs> I got a lot of kid noise in the background right now. Um, <laughs> someone is very <laughs> sorry. Okay, um, but if you look at the graph here, we actually have things that are separate or tied together independent of the component system. Like, for example, if you needed code over here for this part, you don't need this code over here. Do you know what I mean? Like, like you can see that there's a logical place where this breaks apart. It's actually along the reactive graph. It doesn't need to be every freaking point, right? It's actually, and the thing is, it occurred to me, you can see that in this code, like the original code I have here with this account. The signals themselves are always, like the source is always in the code. Whether it's serializable or not, there's nothing hidden. The, the initial value is always in the code. It could be one, it could be new date. It's always, the, the initial value is always in the code. And the other key part about the initial value is that um, it never changes during SSR unless you do something like new date or random. But we already know 
anyone who's done SSR in any framework knows you got to make the client and the server match. Otherwise, things go terribly bad. Right? Like, so, yes. Our, I knew random. <laughs> this thing, what is it? Sorry. <laughs> Math.random. Um, but, yes. Like, this is... This is not going to work anyway in, 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 you know, standard hydrating, you know, framework, so to speak. So if you just assume the rules of SSR that the client has to match the server, signals never be, get, get changed during SSR. The only thing that happens is you drive data off resources. So your resources can load and you can have async data, but that's derived. You can have those code paths, but signals themselves never get run to. No, no set state on the server. It means that the initial code for initializing it could be like it could be props dot whatever it, it doesn't matter is always in the code that you encode in it, like in the code you encode <laughs> sorry like it's, it's always there you don't have to worry about serializing it somewhere else because it's always part of the actual code right and when i started thinking about that i was like what if you could just basically like you can tell when expressions are static like what if we could just look at a component like a counter like this and essentially break up each expression into a bunch of like use that trick quick was doing with the uh with the um um hoisting it up so to speak you know, like I was showing here with the numbers and the zeros and the ones and whatever. Um, what if you could just, instead of serializing numbers, like serialize all these code locations, right? Like creating the signal, the um, cl cloning the template, perhaps, this silly console log that I put in this example for no reason, just to prove my point, um, this event handler, um, sorry, this is the event handler. Right, it's up. It's basically get the scope and then increment it by one. Um, what's this one? This is the DOM renderer. The idea is if you could register them on a hash based on code location, you could combine both the code location, like so the compiler hash based on like line number this in this file, with an instance hash based on the hierarchical IDs. You ever seen the data HKs in Solid? Um, like basically the idea that, you know, at the top is component one and then it, it's children. Like if you want an idea of what hierarchical IDs look like, like we could pretend like, let's, let's make a hierarchical ID system. Zero, zero point zero, zero point one, zero point two. I, I, I think I, I'm hoping, no, I'm, I'm hoping we kind of get the point, why is it? 0, 0.0.0, 0, 0. Um, zero point one zero. Okay, sounds like a burrito. <laughs> but <laughs> what I'm getting at is, if you, if you have some kind of hierarchical ID system combined with uh, ability to like hash up specific code locations, you both you, you could basically unwind the component. And this simple example is actually not even optimized because you could tell that this console log has no dependencies. So you could probably just remove it from this global registry and just only include it. But the, down here, my point is, you, you can hoist it up, or you can call it as a function and run all of them directly. And this, if you've ever seen solid code, this is basically what it does. It creates a signal, right? Call SO, create the signal. S1, run the console log. S2, create the template. Add the click handler. Insert um, the children the count, and then return the element. And what I'm getting at is this, you can know because it's static, you could actually get rid of it and just put console log in in here, like wherever the S1 line is, just keep it in line. But the idea is you, we don't 
actually need to serialize it as long as the code that, that we initialize here actually writes it to the scope or reads it from the scope, right? And, okay, this is pretty technical, but what I'm getting at is if you, if, if our component is only rendered once on the server, you don't need the client render path. It would only render again if there's a conditional, like a show statement above it. So you can actually just remove this code. And I actually didn't show it in this example, I should have. If I remove this code T0, see this T0 here? It's only, like, I should make template pure, the other ones aren't pure. It's only referenced in here. You can actually remove the template call right from the code here. But what you're ended up here, so for, forget that this is here. You're ended up with just a couple statements that are registered globally and this event handler. And then what ends up happening is when the person, you know, we serialize something in the DOM about the location of the event handler when we server render. And when the person clicks, it just goes to that location, which finds you know, E0, it goes to read the scope, finds this, using that combination, finds this location, finds that there's a signal there, which is fine. It, it creates it with the initial value here. Like we're not actually saving much. And then it knows, I mentioned about the dependency checking, it knows when we ran on the server that its dependencies include the inserting it inside the the button here, like the count is used here. So it then goes, oh, okay, I create it and now I have to run this statement, which reads the element, um, uh, so it reads the signal and then it reads the element, which is scope one. Scope one calls this get next element call, which knows that it's hydrating or that not hydrating, that it's like initial run. I, I like, there's a little bit of detail here and it doesn't clone the template, it just gets it from the DOM. We, we do this, this is how we hydrate today. So we get the element and then we insert it. Basically we run the code backwards from the event handler instead of from the component. And what ends up happening is when you click on this, it just kind of goes up the red and down this, but it doesn't, it doesn't do a first hydration pass and it doesn't touch anything over here. It basically just runs through the dependencies here. So and it doesn't do that until you click on it, but it's not the same as hydration because with hydration, generally you actually have to like, you have the previous data. You go through and go, oh, count was one. Let's wire this up, wire this up, wire this up. At this point, count is already two and you're running it the first time. And the, the, the key is because, sorry, going back to my document, because you read the scope, which created the signal and then immediately incremented it, which, you, 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 you're basically just chaining the um, thing. Now it's not, this is obviously not the most efficient thing in the world because we are sort of creating the stuff as we go, which is not unlike hydration, but we're not doing it in two passes. We're doing it in one pass. And if we serialized, we could skip some of these creation steps, but it shows that without serialization, we could still do significantly less work. Yeah, this is similar how update propagation, but it's not, but yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's, that's the idea. Like what if we could just use the graph at the point of interaction instead of running the components initially, as long as the only thing we have to serialize is not your data, but the reactive graph, like the dependency of the nodes. That, that's the whole idea. Like we serialize, we have like some kind of consistent system for identifying the, the signals and the computations, but your data doesn't have to be serializable. So you don't need the dollar signs. That, 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 like I, I talk about it a bit later that this might not be perfectly efficient because you can have data graphs. Not the, it's not the diamond problem, but very similar where if you change A in this approach and go to C and then go to E, well, it's going to go, I need D and B. And if you had serialized D, if you serialized all the va values, when you changed A, yeah, you'd need to recalculate A and C and get back to E, but you wouldn't have to do B and D because you would have already had the serialized value, right? The thing, like, this is banking on the fact that like initially you don't run anything, but then when you go and change A, well then yeah, you're going to have to rerun C, you know what I mean? Like A has changed, so you, you propagate it down. The biggest difference here is without serialization, you can't prevent... 
um, grabbing all the paths downwards. But as long as you serialize key things like um, async data, things that are expensive, like you'd have to go to the server. Like, so if D was like a, a resource and you just went to D and go, yeah, I got the value and you just move on, then, then you're kind of like in this interesting boat where it's way cheaper than hydration, but you're also kind of not forcing people to have to, as I said, serialize or put dollar signs everywhere. Like w what we're talking about here is in that last 20%, instead of doing the most optimal thing you can imagine at the cost of like literally like breaking your code of billing places or whatever, you do something that is like, I don't know. It's like, it's like a 20% of a 20%, you know what I mean? We're just, we're, we're still catering for the 60, for like the 60 or 70% case, right? So like at a certain point that, that, that percentage just shrinks to, to something very, very small, right? That, that's basically the whole concept of what I wrote in this document is the thinking through if, if systematically, if you could unwind components, would it be possible? I, I noticed something else that was kind of interesting about this was that, um, and this only works on like static stuff without components, but I, it's important. What, what I noticed was when I did the props example, which I don't explain very well, I have to admit, but this idea is like, what if you now have a child component, like a button component in here and you, you with a button in it. And when I was looking at this kind of basic example of a counter with a capital button and, you know, little button inside, I, I started just writing out the code because I knew that the, this one would have to have a way of initializing the props with its scope, right? And you're like, how do you get that scope? Well, I mean, I have to think about this a bit, but if, if you're going from here to here, you just remove the last digit of the hierarchical ID. And if you think about a context lookup could work like this too, right? You, you just have to walk up by, by using the hierarchical IDs. But, um, I, I mean, there's details to work through there, but what I'm getting at is the weird discovery I realized is that the create component call for the button with the props, this is, yes, this has expressions inside these, uh, inside the, you know, on click and read children or whatever, like, like this whole, this whole button has expressions, but the create call only happens when you call create. So if you, if, if, if you look at it, I realized something kind of funny that in a simple situation like this, if this was your whole app, let's say, if you never imported counter to render, this button, I mean, I don't have the import statement up here, doesn't actually get used anywhere else. So you could actually not import this as well automatically. It's only the, which would eliminate this template. Um, you know, it, it's only the effectful stuff, this stuff that actually has to stay around. So when you, I, I actually did this example later on in the doc, but when I was like lo looking through this thinking, I realized like, wouldn't it be funny if, like in our counter props example, if you, if you actually removed it, you could essentially, uh, this is me erasing the default exports and removing the template and removing all the equal SO equal whatever. This is what would remain, um, which is literally like nothing. The only thing that runs at hydration time is like, Register a function, register a function, register a function, register a function, register event. It's like, there's no, there's, there's not really any execution, you know, like it's just basically like put this in a map, 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 essentially. And you eliminate all the template code automatically. Like these are really simple H1, B1s, ones, but if you had a lot of HTML, you'd actually just like shrink that out of the bundle automatically. <laughs> Hopefully some people are still with me. I, I know this is like heavy stuff, but yeah, I, 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 I think this, and what was interesting for me about this realization is that if you could do this kind of code elimination by banking on this inversion through reasonability, this is why frameworks like 
Marco or Quick haven't been looking at RSCs as much. Because like you don't you kind of go, well, I don't need islands, right? Like if I'm I did this smart enough, I could just um avoid needing islands at all. Essentially, because I can tree shake out the, the dead code. I was thinking about this. But I realized that there's actually this this is actually where the 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 you yes see the, the, how do you do islands routing though yes yeah first of all yeah how would you CSR and uh, subsequent navigations well one way you could do it is assume that the routes for those islands are always server right and then just go okay my root is server which means like you know I had this kind of funny idea here where I was like what if like the hydrate call or the thing didn't actually need the app component you could just import you know, like this, and then just say hydrate from the root. And then if your app component looked like this, it would basically, other than some props things, but you could say if empty props weren't really a thing, like essentially you could just automatically turn your code into import statements, right? Like this, because you don't actually need any of these to be, to create it. And this one only runs once. And then like, you basically just out, like shake out all the code. But I realized that this thinking was not perfect because, okay. The biggest benefit of islands in addition would be have a place to identify this is where you serialize the props. We don't need all the props all the way up. It's code size optimization, but it's serialization. Yeah. So basically, if you don't have islands in this example, you would always, even if this component is base, like this component has state, but if this component didn't have state, like if, if, if there was no green here and it was only blue down, um, you'd still need to, um, like you, you're not sh like at, you're not getting, you're not pruning the props essentially. You'd have to go all the way to the root component. And if you have islands, you can just go like, I'm going to serialize props from here. Like obviously this is server component now, so it wouldn't have state. But my point is you can basically, indicate what point you serialize the props at and chop everything above it. Not that that everything is much. That's what I was saying here. I was like, oh, that everything might not be not much. It might be just like a bunch of empty statements that don't matter. But um, it's more than that. It's that I, I realized a couple of things. Think, think about this scenario. Uh, how do I want to show this? Think about when you have this JSX going to look like layout something okay and the reason I pointed out is this gets compiled into uh, you know the props object for layout exists and it, it has get children get children create component something, okay? My, my point is this doesn't tree shake out because the props get hoisted and now this reference is in there. Like if this was just div, it's fine. But as soon as you insert components and other components, these get lazily created. Notice the get, this is how almost all front end frameworks work. But there's an exception, um, server components eagerly create their children, right? Because you know that they'll never get re-rendered. They get re-rendered once on the server and then the client, even if you show and hide them like 10 times, they only got rendered that one time on the server. So to properly tree shake this without it being like, basically because this can be dynamic, it's, it's tricky to actually drop the, the code out properly. whole ton like basically all the problems right sorry I, I think i lost the internet for a second but yeah what i was getting at is quick solves is because like all of their props are serialized marco so that then they don't worry about this because they're like very aggressive on the serialization marco doesn't worry and, and they do code splitting and like they if something 
could be there. They just pull it in, you know, like it's like they don't care. Whereas we want to differentiate. Marco solves this because the compiler goes into the child components and like goes, oh, could this be dynamically generated? Well, we know this information. So we can like they know Marco knows exactly how, how the whole reactive graph works. Like they, they analyze the whole freaking thing. So they're like, oh, yeah, this can't change. So they can be smart about it. We don't have that compiler. We don't want to go crazy with dollar signs. So the other way, as I said, is server components actually eagerly insert their things, which let these be tree shakeable again. So I, I realized that if we actually like th this tree shaking that I was talking about, basically like, sure, this example is great, but it basically ends at the router or the first context provider because like, what, what like, yeah, let's change this to pr provider, you know, we're done. However, if this is server component, like we're in a server component world, and then this is a server component still, well then the fact that this is a client pro component, this provider, doesn't matter. We can still remove the code. If, if this, if, is basically what I'm getting at. Because if you're in a server component context, you know that you're basically going to um, create this template or th this piece eagerly, so to speak. All right. Yeah, I, I, I'm probably starting to lose some, some of you all, but I wanted to kind of point out that was the second thing. And then finally, when... After the fact navigation, we talked about this when we were talking about um, how Re React server components work. There's a reason I answered that question earlier um, about uh, the router refresh. When you change the page in a hybrid router and you go to the next thing and you're still, or you do a refresh or whatever, it never renders the client components again on the server. How do you know what the client components are to not render again, right? Because the only, the reason you do that is because of context. And if there's a risk of context being read in any component, it just it will break. So if you know that hey, this is a client component, then you can, you know, make that determination again. Marco can trace down the whole graph and go, oh, your use blank 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 is actually calling context which actually now we know so we can be smart about it. But like any framework that doesn't go through like 10, can't trace through 10 files to figure this out, has no way to know that use blanky blank is actually a context call. I mean, you could say it's a hook, so you can just say, but then like, as I said, you're back to a heuristic, which is basically like, if it's stateful, you're just automating the islands. That might still be an option here. I didn't discount that. I'm just saying like, if you're at a point where you're just going and going, if it has a use or a create call or whatever, it's a client component, then it's still a client component. Like you're, you're just automating it. So essentially this doesn't remove the, 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 the potential of like not having islands explicitly, like you could automate the islands. But my, my point is that you still need some way of marking that could be understand at compile time that there's an island there, whether it's manual or through some heuristic. Um, because otherwise you wouldn't know not to render it on the next render. Okay. Here's some water. <coughs> Sorry. Mm. Yeah, everybody got really quiet about like 10 minutes ago. Um, uh, but <laughs> yeah, my, my, the whole theory behind this is that regardless of all these specific cases I have in here, essentially it should be possible to unconstruct the component into statements, remove the static ones or the things and keep them in there and basically replay. It's not, so is this resumable? I asked, well, it doesn't hydrate, but it does replay portions of the graph as it needs it. Um, it should be possible. So yeah, maybe I can't call this resumable, but it basically replayed the portions of graph at 
time and in so remove initial load time and the impact of that interaction cost is not going to be any worse than I don't even think it's worse than most resumable frameworks if you think about it other than the when, right? Because if you think about it, any resumable framework has to actually, when it gets to the serialized signal, go, oh, okay, I need to create that or have that representation or link up the nodes, do the work. They do create stuff on the fly. They just don't do two passes. The difference is this would resume more of the app. That, that's the best way to put it. This would resume more of the app on interaction. It'd be like, it's not doing any more work in total it's just doing like a it's doing it a little bit sooner but not immediately and the cost of resuming compared to hydration is just not comparable like the cost of resuming over the cost of uh like I, I, this is something we have to measure but the, like if you think about it like any interaction like if you have a button that adds a row to a table like it, it we're in that level of heaviness not like i'm re-rendering your whole freaking screen right like the added cost of that first interaction i imagine is almost nothing in fact mishko made a test where he was showing his resumability like the cost of interacting like what i'd expect is in 90 percent of the cases it would be equally as efficient as most resumable ability of resumable solutions and in that last 10 it's still, you know, barely on the on the meter, so to speak. <laughs> I'm listening. Just need to read the blog post. Actually, that's saying. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. And honestly, this blog post is not even a blog post. It's probably too messy. <laughs> At least Greg knows what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah, which is something. Is, yeah, I mean, I would have to prepare better resources and stuff. Well, what's really cool about this approach and the reason why I'm talking about it is if it is worthwhile doing, if we can measure it, this actually isn't like a solid start feature. It just, resumable, resumable hydration, or as you call it, is just a different hydration technique. So in theory, today when you have the solid compiler, you just go hydratable true. like, And then it generates, well, actually we see it right here. Look, um, let me remove the garbage. Actually, let's just trash can it. Yeah, okay. Look, if you go here and you go to the output, you see client-side rendering, looks nice, temples, whatever. And you go client-side rendering with hydration. It's almost the same, but it's a little bit different. Uh, we account for stuff like get next element. So like you don't always create the template, sometimes you grab it. Um, we run those hydration events I was talking about where we, you know, the ones we've recorded. It's mostly, and there's that pure call in the template I was talking about. Like it's mostly the same code, but it's a little bit different to suit hydration. And then server-side rendering is different completely. But my point is, this is just a different hydration technique. So in theory, we could just replace solid server-side rendering and client rendering with hydration technique with this. And then everything, all our SSR would be this type of resumability. It's like, it has nothing to do specifically with solid start. It has nothing to do with islands. It has nothing to do, like this technique might not shave off a bunch of code um, without islands, like I was talking about, like all the, the things I was talk, talking about. But it is literally just a straight compiler swap. Like you basically just go, okay, when you're, instead of hydrating, generating that code, hydrate, generate this code. And now all solid apps, whether they're an Astro, whether they're anything, like maybe you're not shrinking the code, but they, they won't execute, they'll execute this way. So this is kind of cool because it gives it, it's actually completely independent of the islands router research. What, well, this is what I'm getting about. This isn't, th there doesn't need to be a use case. It's just, it's just like less expensive hydration. It's like, would you like less expensive hydration on your app? I think the answer is yes, always. Like if you, if you server render, would you like, like, you know how I, 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 in that benchmark earlier, I showed that solid start was like five points ahead of all the other SSR frameworks because I'd improved some serialization. This would be like that. Like, what if you could just take the SWA framework exactly as it is today, and then it's like, oh, another we, we, this resumable thing actually gained us another 
X number of points. What what if it scored eighties? What if it like a low eighty? Like maybe it's not as, maybe there's some more code than the island example. So you know it's like slightly lower, but it's literally just a spot. Like it's just better hydra better hydration. It's there's no actual use case for this beyond it being SSR. Now if you combine that with islands or RSC stuff, you get like a much better thing, and that's like more in like solid start range. But this is just like what if we hydrated differently? Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I'm getting at here. I, I don't know what the gotchas are yet. I mean, there's a few things that I talk about here, but in set, when I came up with Solid's hydration approach, no one had ever done fine-grained hydration in a JavaScript framework before. I had to kind of like invent a, an approach that made sense. We have those data HKs and all this stuff with JSX. Like, it was challenging because there was li there's literally nothing like it. There's no hydration for knockout JS. There's like, no one has had ever done it before. And then I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm like, this is just a different approach to hydrating, which kind of plays off the reactive graph. So if we can serialize the reactive graph and the component trees hierarchically, then this is just an alternate way of hydrating. I don't know, like it's possible that that first interaction cost takes a hit in some cases. And then we have to like, like we have to measure, but my, my gut is because how the average reactive app is not too deep. It's wide in terms of how it, it does it. You don't do many like big transformers. You do mostly a bunch of, it, it fans out. So this is built very much for fan out because you only need to worry about the sections. I think some of the big trade-offs that I've, I've realized here is first of all, in the same way that no one's actually figured out fine grained resumability, except maybe Marco, um, like quick has a VDOM. You ever wonder why quick has a VDOM? It's largely because structural changes actually add a com com complexity here. Quick has not f figured out fine grain uh, resumability in terms of structural changes. So I hypo you know, hypothesized what that could look like um, in here, but it looks like from my guess, it's doable, but I, I mentioned before Quick had those keys in the DOM. Well, then you need keys. How do you get keys? Well, basically I think our four component would might have to have a key concept. I, again, I don't know if that's worth the trade-off, but I'm just throwing out there if 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 adding a key to four is might be what it takes, then there is a trade-off, right? It, I mean, that's a gotcha, right? You your four component now needs a key. I mean, adding the key is a thing, you know. But I, you know, I, I but there's plenty of frameworks that have keys and don't really complain about it. Well, I mean then you're gonna get a hydration mismatch essentially. I mean, it's not hydration, but you're gonna get the equivalent of a hydration mismatch. Yeah, the problem is it still has to match, right? So it's either gonna replace all the DOM nodes or, you know, like, there, I don't think there's any salvaging it. Because you're, I, there's, there's no hydration. So the problem is if you have a list that's A, B, C, D, and the very first thing you get, and we didn't serialize your data because it's like a bunch of crazy objects and we want to do that. And the very first thing you get back because someone swapped the rows is A, B, D, C. Then we have to know like which one was C and D in order to, to move them. And we have to go, like, we have to like grab the elements and go, okay, these are A, B, C, D. Do we have A? We have B, C, C. And we have to ar arrange them. We have to do a basic diff. So like, um, yeah, I think... I think for this, I think a key would have, I think this is the biggest trade-off. I think you'd have to add a key, the four component would need a key. But like, as I said, like, so these are, these are, these are things to consider. Um, I obviously haven't gone too deep on this, but there is a bit of a mapping thing, uh, right? Like in the DOM, like the stuff you see in quick, like another trade-off is you're gonna have more artifacts in the DOM, like more of those uh, comment nodes. Um, so we, we do have to measure that. It's just it's just interesting in that if it is worthwhile, this has nothing to do with the code splitting, has nothing to do with islands or partial hydration. It's just like maybe more efficient hydration. But I, as I said, I think you could basically call this resumability. It's not, it's it, like, in the, quick calls their stuff resumability, but when you miss a fine-grained update and get a component re-render, it's it, it's like that. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, like qu quicks. As long as you don't have fine-grained structural updates, then you don't have like true resumability because you're like you're you're you know 
creating VDOM nodes and doing a diff and rerunning that component. And you, you know what I mean? Like I would argue that that's not the purest ver version of resumability um, anyway. So like it's about that level of deopt. Um, the difference, you know, and again, this is only, yeah. <laughs> I love that you said it's not going too deep. Yeah, I guess it's pretty deep. Yeah, I mean this this is the this is this is the question, right? I, I the thing is my gut is if if you if we if this proves worth it, it should be the new norm, honestly. Like because it, it's like so far I don't see any like the big goal of this exploration and something with the C is that it actually didn't really have much in the way of gotchas or trade-offs. Like you could author components this exact same way. As I said, the only thing that I've come across so far is the four component. Maybe there's a different solution for it, but if we can solve the four component, as a key is one obvious option, um, then yeah, like look, like you just write the same code and it just rearranges it slightly. Um, so this could very much be the, the, the default way of doing hydration. HTMX, yeah, yeah, sorry, okay, yeah. I was trying to read your thing. Is there a gimmick that you can dehydrate it back to the HTML? Yeah, I mean, that part is the gimmick part. I mean, the thing is, what JavaScript framework can't do, couldn't do that? I, I, it's funny because they talk about it being a special thing, but you think about it. Next has, you know, next, I guess it's because everything's in that context, so it's not so hard to just be like, okay, write that out to a div. But if you think about it, like every framework serializes a certain amount of state into like a next JSON script or whatever. And then when the thing starts up, it like has that data there and it goes. And if you copy that same HTML into a different browser, it would do it. The trick is that with Quick, you, because they already centralized all the data structures through the, the registry or whatever, through the lookup, they can just serialize it back in. But you have to understand, Quick used to actually keep it in the DOM that every time you updated, it would update that. But can you imagine how slow that would be? Because the DOM, like you, you're just adding an extra update to like touching the DOM nodes every time you change something. So Quick stopped doing that. They started consuming the script and then gave you the ability to write it back out when you wanted to freeze it and move it. I think there's more interesting things about the, their their approach, especially with the VDOM and whatever, because they're talking about like you can like start an app on a build pipeline and then pause it and then start it there. Like in the same way React server components are talking about how you can split the execution of React across those different spheres. Quick is talking about pausing and resuming through the same sphere. So I think I think there's more potential here um, when you look at the ability, like what you can do when you serialize everything. But as, a, as, as usual, I'm mostly looking at this from a performance standpoint um, and with the kind of practical mind in, in the sense that if you follow what I've been saying, and I, I get at this at the very end when I'm talking about like, is this insane, is that this, this could be basically an invisible optimization. Like, especially if you combine this with something that automatically could detect where islands are, like Marco's done since 2017, then you literally could base, I mean, I don't know if I'm okay with that because I don't know, you don't, you, this, the prop serialization, like where it starts might be confusing. But if, if people were accepting of that, you could literally take something like, a, I mean, there's some syntax stuff aside, but you could basically take like a solid start app, author it exactly the same way you would today, you know, with a few API adjustments or whatever, and it would actually just be RSCs and resumable without you changing any code. I, I don't know if that's the goal because I think there's sometimes you want to know about serialization. There's places where things could be explicit, but understanding like, you know, that you could use a heuristic and be like, look, we know what's reactive in templates, extrapolate. Now we know which components have reactivity in them. You could basically just treat this whole thing as like a optimization, like just like, and, at that point, yeah, you just go like, 
I'm like that optimization could be like simply I'm doing SSR. <laughs> like at that point, it's like write it client side and then go, okay, SSR mode, bam, you get all this. Because the only thing you need to know, and this is why I was asking the, the, everyone last week, I was, I was like, what needs to be on the server, right? We, we, we started writing a list, didn't we? Data fetching, secrets, analytics, sessions, server only assets. I was just like thinking, I'm like, if, if you had use server or server dollar sign or something, and you annotated your code, and then you basically um, had this that I'm talking about, then if you had a client side app, you just write it as normal, da, 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 and then you'd be like, okay, I have, uh, I have to fetch from the database, so I'm just going to use server or server dollar sign or whatever, and just, you know, put a couple things there. The difference between that and going, okay, now I'm server mode, and it's just automated islands uh, or islands routing, automated resumability, like. You know, in both cases, that because you put that server there, it's going to run on the server. The rest of the details might not even matter to you. Again, I, I like explicitness because I like control. But it's just, it, it's just one of those things that I think, I think in a world right now where people are sick of trying to like juggle these mental models, um, it might be an interesting idea. I, my guess is that it's going to fall somewhere in the middle, but I'm just, th this is why I'm thinking about it. But the, the biggest reason that I think about it and the biggest reason that excites me is because if this is possible, resumability can be done at any time. It's completely independent of the other stuff. This has nothing to do, like, we still need a solution for server components or for, you know, islands routing or whatever. This is just a hydration optimization. You know, it's the last 20%. But they can be worked on independently they can be done or not done like this that that's what's interesting to me because this suggests if we do the right stuff we don't need to rewrite we don't need to reset the ecosystem we don't need like maybe a major version at worst and that that's interesting to me you know Yes, yes. And it doesn't run all the other component create code and it shakes out all the dead templates and would never be rendered. And yeah, even inside the islands, what's cool because picture, picture if that counter component was the island, essentially it was the client component. We actually can s reduce the code within inside the client components as well. Um, there's basically three states. If you think about it, I wrote about this like three years ago and I didn't, this is the first time we've, I've actually come up with a way that it actually realizes it is that when when you have um, you have the components that are completely server components, they have no business on the client. They don't have any state. They don't have event handlers. Um, they just render some stuff. Then on the opposite end, you have the d dynamic components because like they get re-rendered on the client. Like you have a for loop and you have to like add a new iteration to the list, or you have like uh, something that's under a conditional that you know dynamically gets created or whatever. And then in the middle. You have the top level things that are, they have state, they have event handlers, but they don't actually re-render. So like you don't need the template or you don't need, you don't like, you don't need like any of the, um, yeah, like any of the kind of like initialization stuff in the client. But there is like three categories of components if you look at it that way. And what this does is say server components over here, which is the first category, client components basically over here, which is the second two categories. And this optimizes the third category back into the second category or whatever. Like that, that's essentially what I'm saying. It gets rid of the extra code and it gets rid of the extra execution. I imagine they talk because Next.js talks with Chrome team a lot. They work together. I think RSCs, uh, we've already shown our performance improvement um, over uh, Next, at least in theory, uh, like older patterns, at least in theory. They seem to be, you know, a couple points higher on the lighthouse, so to speak. So I think, I, and that's in a simple example. I'm sure they actually have bigger benefits elsewhere. So, yeah, I mean, Chrome's interest in Solid um, and the Solid Start Money and the Aurora project was around research into these 
this is a very low JavaScript version of kind of something similar to server components, but it's also in the hydration, the stuff like this. This is very interesting. I, I think it'd be, I think we're in this interesting zone where we, we can tell kind of what's possible and we see prototypes everywhere of what's possible, but people are having a hard time with the shift. So it's either that they just need more beat over the head enough times, like RFCs is really trying that right now, um, or it's possible that we just haven't hit the right DX point where people can just wrap their head around these ideas. Um, so yeah, I, I think the technologies that are gonna define where things are heading are already present. I think this resumability stuff has more merit than people give it credit for. I think it's tricky and we haven't seen many frameworks leverage it. On the other hand, I, I don't know if it's the, I don't think it's the most important optimization we can do in this space right now. I, I, I'm still very much on the server component kind of zone of things, but I think the mechanical pieces are present between stuff like um, server functions, RPC type stuff automation, between um, the, the server component islands router type things, and between resumability. I think resumability is part of this equation or at least a consideration here. Um, if it proves that the serialization or the overhead um, is not too much and just spitballing, it, I don't think it should be, um, right? I mean, this is the opposite extreme to quick where you don't serialize anything. The truth of the matter is you land in the middle and you start serializing certain key things and you be smart about it. And I think you might get to a really nice place as long as we can kind of figure out these details. Yeah, I, I'm very interested in IMP. Um, I want I want to make sure, yeah, like first input delay was close to right, but I want to make sure that we can give that not just on the initial page load, but as every time we interact with our app, we get good response, good timing. Um, you know, as we incrementally load the JavaScript we need, as we, you know, do what we need to do. All right. Yeah. I knew that would take a while. <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, this is the trickiest part of this whole thing is that, like, what assumptions you can make here. Marco knows they have their compiler. They know they can pull this off. I'm pretty sure. Quick has its serialization, has its VDOM. It, it knows it can, you know, it can pick up the pieces. I'm proposing a possibility where we combine both approaches um and uh again i don't i'm even less certain than i'm definitely less certain than those two but i i think it's interesting but it's also not something we have to worry about tomorrow or today because as i said it, it fits into a very specific role in optimization but i think it's i think it's interesting um and something worth thinking through expanding on. Well, I mean, let's not get ahead of ourselves. No one's implemented this, right? Um, I. Yeah, I don't know. I, I it's it it comes it comes down to what like what you think is important. Like the lazy loading thing, maybe there's like really large apps. I, I talk to the guys from Wiz occasionally at Google and they're very much on the lazy loading pieces of quick maybe not quite as small, but they definitely feel that lazy loading aspect is really important for them. And um you know it, so it's hard to say like maybe the things that I kind of dismiss and the way I talk about it say that they're less important are actually important at a certain point. And that's where that fits. But I mean, you know what I'm trying to do, what I always try and do is which is thread the needle. And when you thread the needle, I mean, the whole point is almost to come up with that perfect balance where, you know what I mean? Like, uh, 
So, you know, if, 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 if what we're hypothesizing is good and it actually gets built, then we, we, can, we can talk about it then. That's, that's, that's how I'm going to put it. All right. Let's let's get ready for this week in JavaScript. Give me give me a moment here. I know that was a lot. I probably lo I like lost half the audience going deep on this stuff, but it's it's something that I've been thinking a lot about. And I think that people are sleeping a bit on resumability conceptually. I'm not saying everyone should go out and use quick necessarily at th this moment. But I think that the value of what's being worked on is a lot higher than people realize. And I think that, um, well, I, I said the same thing about RSCs, right? Um, it, it's just that um, th these technologies still need to prove themselves. And that's, that's going to be the challenge for the next little while, right? I, I think we're all kind of expecting that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. It is what it is. Yeah, I mean, I saw actually a tweet from, um, Devin Gava, uh, Critter Parcel, uh, earlier today. And, um, it, it was along the lines of, Um, like he said, always put UX first, but then he's like, he, he changed it and he's like, okay, I, I, I reframe that a little bit. He's like, start with good UX and then work back to good DX. And that's what we're talking about here. Right. We, we like in a sense, people move because of DX often not UX. You can smash them over the head about performance and all this and no one cares. No, no one cares. But if if you manage to find the sweet part of DX and deliver it, then you're into something, right? So people move on DX alone, right? Like if server components didn't had a significantly better DX and didn't provide anything on performance, I think some people would move to it anyways. Like. I think we're seeing a bit of that. Like async components are attractive from a DX standpoint, even if in my opinion, they're kind of a bad pattern, but like, like people love it. Like, oh, I can just locally just async away it all over the place. You know, this is great, you know, la la la. And like, that will be enough to buy, win people over regardless of if their performance goes through the, you know, goes, gets worse or whatnot. So, I think that like, yeah, you know, the load on demand as we resume specifically can be still implied without the lazy loading. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or execute on demand is basically, is basically the, the thing. And that's what Marco was doing. Marco's compiler is so crazy that you're not even going to worry about the load on demand aspect too quick because like it's so small. Like I, I just, I still can't get over the fact that the Marco hacker news demo is, was 1.6 kilobytes. Like if you load the code you need to in quick, for example, to use that page, well, guess what? It's like 20 kilobytes. Like I'm, I'm not saying that like, uh, obviously like that's a, bad scale example because it's like one small component but like my, my point is like um like th th that would be the one downside of making this the default uh i didn't mention this before the default uh hydration approach solid i think the code gen size would be larger maybe 10 or to 20 percent larger the the uh islands counteract that because they make it small again and in a sense some of the code elimination uh, does it, but if you had no code elimination with that uh, resumable hydration approach, I think the code gen is slightly larger. And so like, um, 
yeah, maybe it makes sense to pair these things up. Yeah, where's the state point to prove it? Our season maybe we have yet to prove real better examples. I haven't seen outside of cherry picked examples yet. Yeah, I mean, right. The thing is, they kind of show that they have the potential, but no one's going to move if the DX doesn't get them there. And if well, the way people do simple benchmarks isn't giving them that gratitude, they, they won't move. You know, they open up the thing and go, why is this slower? Why is this bigger? Like, I showed you the next 13 movies app demo is larger than the next 12 one. This is just insane. Like, that's a full app. Like, why is this happening? It's okay to someone. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, let's let's get this week in JavaScript queued up for the few of you that are left with me um, here. So I think we're I think we're good. I think I am set up here. Um, yeah, let's do this. Let's talk about this week in JavaScript. So, I I haven't been that busy on Twitter um, the last little while um, for various reasons. Just trying to keep focused. Um, so most of the stuff is going to be stuff that I pulled off other people's threads. I think the only thing I tweeted this week was right after I finished writing that resumability without serialization document. Um, I wrote ever gets distracted from work you know you should be doing to work on a different problem you've been thinking about for a few months only to have that euphoric high of crashing of solving that crashing back down when you realize you still need the work to do in front of you first and i got really stoked about the resumability thing right after i wrote it but then i realized that i need a serializable reactive uh reactive graph which we're not going to get to solid 2.0 so you know there's people working on solid 2.0 there's people working on you know the art, the art, uh, the islands router stuff. So like, this is just going to take time, but you know, I was supposed to be doing work to help, you know, get the islands router stuff back in shape. And I got distracted writing that whole, doing that whole exercise for the resumable stuff. It's fine. I got it in eventually, but I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. You know, apparently a lot of people, uh, relate to this problem, right? You, you're working on this thing and I mean, some menial merges, you know, you're just sitting there going like gr grinding at it and you do just like, yeah, apparently, apparently everybody, uh, has a, has a, has an example of this, but yeah, I, I, this is why I've been trying to stay away from Twitter a little bit. But there, 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 there were some, you know, good announcements and stuff that happened. Obviously, I mentioned Bun zero point seven. Um, I didn't actually look it up yet, so let's let's see if we can pull this one up. Bun zero point seven. I probably could just go to Jared's tweet. Beat Tev is failing. Yeah, why, why don't I just go to Jared? This is like the most indirect way of getting there. <laughs> yeah, but that's the whole thing. They got beat working in Bun, which is the whole key. This week's goal for Bun is Vite support. September 25th, 2022. Took 10 months longer. Yeah, it took the whole time. But yeah, Vite dev runs, workers, post message, structured cloud, async local storage. There you go. Well, yeah, this this is all huge stuff. Um, I've been talking about why async local storage is going to be big. It's the missing piece right now that we have on our server functions. Um and a bunch of node stuff, but yeah, Bun's coming along nicely. Um, I haven't liked this yet, but I should. Um, this is this this is pretty sweet. That's how R and D works. This is what I'm talking about. It, it probably was just a matter of doing the work at the right time. His his. If you're in heavy R and D mode, your job is efficiency rather, or sorry, is uh, effectiveness rather than efficiency. You know, if if this can make a big dent on stuff, it's probably good that I worked on it versus being you know super efficient, so to speak. So, yeah. 
yeah, Jared, Jared's not losing steam. Um, really cool to see this. Workers, yeah, I mean, there's just, let's see, maybe we should just see what, what, what else he's got here. Yeah, and he's talking about some of the later point six updates. But Vite support, huge, right? Workers, huge. Structured clone this is a new API, that's good. Async local storage is actually huge because literally Next.js and everybody's just gonna be using this at this point. More memory reductions, more Jared benchmarks. Yeah, no. Readable stream to form data. See, he he's he pays attention to what the frameworks are doing. This is smart. These little efficiencies he's making will let frameworks run faster on his platform specifically if people leverage it. Yeah, the, the, he's he's very much tailoring to what the specific frameworks are. He's very much in key with it. I I got to give him a lot of props for that. Um I guess it's part of his, you know, starting as a bundler, but he's very connected to like the tools that are needed. Very, very cool. No, but buns and zig, but I think his point is if you can find system programmers who are good in C plus or zig, you know, he's going to take them. But yeah. Oh yeah. I guess that's true. Right. Because of the VA bindings. Yeah. Although actually, is that only for certain platforms? Because isn't isn't uh, Bun mostly was it the Safari engine, the JavaScript core or whatever? But I guess I guess I guess uh, yeah. I guess I guess it depends on yeah. I wonder if like no compatibility or depends on the platform stuff. I don't know enough about this, but I I know that that he didn't use like. I thought I thought primarily it was JavaScript core, like the the same engine that Safari uses. Okay. Um, on the solid side, we had some news. Everyone started announcing it before we officially did, but we brought in three new fellows. I can't be more stoked because every single one of these are actually a little a lot more high higher profile than yeah you know pretty high profile in our community. Um, between Alexis, the guy behind our HMR plugin. Solid Refresh, he did a whole bunch of the compiler plugins. Um, he built a bunch of meta framework stuff. He built his own island solution and all that. He's the guy who's uh, um, the main, doing the majority of the work on the Solid Start R&D around the islands router. Um, with Nikhil focusing on some of the lower level bundling stuff um, around the base, but he's doing a lot of the, he, he's taken on the, he's building the benchmarks right now that we're gonna be using and he's, uh, He's going to be doing a lot of the work this year. Um, Sarah, uh, she, she, she and uh, Shogun, um, Michael, uh, uh, the docs team, uh, did a stream this morning at 9 a.m., which was very cool, talking about solid docs. Um, and she is joining us, sponsored by Eraser, um, working on the docs effort. And, yeah, a lot of people are really happy to see that happen. Um, i super proud. It seems like... Each 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 of them have their own announcement, which had a, a lot more traction than our official announcement. But it's very awesome to see um, to see see this. And then the the one that I was showing originally at the beginning, or JDev, student from Israel, basically makes sure that no solid developer ever has any kind of uh, wanting for stuff found in the React ecosystem. If Next.js has it or Create T three has it, we have it. He he even built like he's he's ported all the T three style stuff into Solid Start with Create JD app. He's even made the like upload thing Theo's stuff. Uh, there's a solid version because of our solid uh, integration because of him. Um, solid TRPC PRPC like it just it just keeps on going. Um, he makes sure that yeah if. You, you, you aren't missing anything from the next e ecosystem. So he's going to work on Solid Start. Um, he's on the other side. Instead of on the R&D side, 
he's on the stabilization side. He's going to make sure that we get out of beta, um, make sure that the tooling around it's what we need. I rely on a, a lot to actually understand what the ecosystem needs to so make sure that we don't have feature misses. So very stoked about uh, about having Orr uh, as one of our fellows here. So yeah, big announcements for all three of these um, fellows. That's the term we use. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, he has a PR for clerk. Of course he does, right? Um, that, that's what I mean. Like there's, there's no, there's no, you, you aren't going to be missing anything from like, he's, he's trying his best to make sure you're not missing anything from the next ecosystem when you come to solid. Yeah. So yeah, getting, getting this stuff in is awesome. And this is, this is with the, you know, the core team that we already have together with, uh, the addition of these, uh, fellows and stuff. We're really moving stuff forward. I, as I said, I hope to have a couple more announcements on a couple more fellowships coming out, but, um, that I'm, I'm still putting together, but we are, we are, you know, I, I've always, we've always kept a pretty small core team, but if we, you know, add the fellows and stuff to this kind of group of people, you know, um, maybe we should, you know, take a letter from view who has always had a very large core team and kind of look at like how we can, uh, an Astro, I think, is another one. Great communities, and look at how we can energize and get more people working on Solid. But this is a very good start. He basically Solid ecosystem. It's funny. That's what people used to say about Alexis too, right? Because Alexis did a lot of. Um, um, I say he sold Start ecosystem is basically the the way. Like he's the meta framework side of stuff. Um, but yeah, so this is this is this is really. The big news for us, um, yeah, I mentioned their stream already. We're gonna have solid office hours being put on by the the dot dev team um, in August. Gonna give it a shot. Um, so, yeah, come and ask me questions and whatnot. Um, and they're gonna kind of do it in a structured ways. Talk about the roadmap. Uh, my talk from JS Nations up, uh, where I talk about suspense. The full version from Finland is not up yet, which is has a lot more examples, but I still think this is a really good showing of kind of understanding how like with fundamental primitives, you can build um, the stuff like you don't like, it's about finding the right boundaries and understanding what pieces and I think the problem right now is a lot of people, all the, it makes it easier to ship these things as a single thing. So you can like wrap them all around and be like, look, you have RSCs, they do all this. But RSCs are like the final wrapper of several different technologies coming together. And I talk about how we could take a lot of the same primitives and do a lot of stuff with a lot of the patterns people have today without RSCs. So, um, you know, streaming, uh, transitions and all that. So uh, it's a good talk. And uh, I mean, in that regard, actually, I want to I wanna actually pull this out uh, that was posted today. Um, Tanner got streaming SSR working in Tanstack router, which means that he's got most of the pieces he, he needs to kind of have the baseline now of pretty much uh, modern framework metaware. He has loaders, he has mutations, he has, he has you know, streaming. Um, he's basically, it sounds like he's looking at most of the remix uh, um, um, feature set and just getting them ready so that like the more baseline stuff, when we figure out the basis start or whatever, we can just get, you know, maybe on the same page. I mean, he's been building some, some examples just straight and express. Maybe, you know, we, we just need to find the, the right base for, for, for his stuff here, but he, he, he's filling in the pieces, right? He, I was talking to him earlier and this is why I was talking about having the right primitives. React 18 does have the pieces you need to build this stuff. He said though, unfortunately only the first, bullet point came from react team and he basically had to build all the rest of this which is very different than how you know our, the integrations with solid worked because we basically had everything up to here already built um and the people could just use those primitives but he got there and he showed that you can do it so you know this is this is uh yeah see so he's, he's showing the streaming and stuff coming in um which is interesting because this is not a server component demo. This is, you know, similar to Remix, who also does does streaming uh, without server components. Um, but yeah, so another feature for Tanstack Router. I, I love one of the comments. I'm so confused. There's so many decisions to make between Stack. Everything seems to have a drawback. I constantly 
second guess choices. Tan spec router seems amazing, but tuning over next app router feels daunting. <laughs> you know, and I, I understand this is the, the thing. What's the difference between a streaming, you know, data loading, whatever framework and RSCs? It's not apparently obvious to people. So making them have to choose or be aware of these things makes it actually really difficult. But still very cool to see that. <laughs> yeah, very, very, very late. <laughs> but uh, it's all good. Um, but yeah, uh, let's, let's, yeah, we talked about Bun. We talked about Tanner. I think, and we talked about Solid. I, I just, yeah, let's, t let's talk a little bit about a few other things that have been going on. Um, I think this this was an interesting. The Remix guys are clearly working on RSCs. They've been s talking about like how they have something for server actions that uh, that uh, um, I think um, they, they they say they're excited about. But at the same time, I've been seeing kind of tweets like this from Ryan Florence, which are like, "I wish the RSCs had waterfalls, like network tab in the browser." Clearly they still believe in their hoisting and this is like there's some tension it's kind of like when you talk to them about streaming they're like yeah we have the feature but we're like not stoked on it i i, I get the feeling with rscs it's a bit of this i don't know i i guess we're gonna have to find out and pay more attention but i'm gonna look at terminal and network terminal yeah i mean he's admitting that you know you don't avoid this just by using remix like you have to be aware of waterfalls but it's it's it is interesting because with the with the whole uh you know with the whole you know nesting and stuff it might not be as obvious but i, I this is this is a good sign for the react ecosystem because i said People like Remix or Gatsby or whatever, like sort of people frameworks, could just drag their feet if they want to. And sh if Next can out there on a limb proving themselves, there's a lot of exhaustion on their part and the React team to really push. And they can just be like, yeah, we'll adopt it when people like it. You know what I mean? This is suggesting that we're getting to a point where they're like, okay, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at this because before that they weren't. And, you know, the longer that goes on, the in a sense, they almost benefit from it. If if in the sense that it makes it harder for next, I I don't know. It's it's like they could just take as much time as they want. <laughs> yeah, no, I I I'm not too sure what Gatsby is myself, um, to be fair. But, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's a whole risk in that too. You know, I mean, it's fine. The, Remix is the the other React framework, and maybe we only need a second one um, to kind of tell that story. But you, every, everyone knows that the download numbers for a newer framework are not usually in the same realm as the the bigger frameworks over time. I I, I don't know if Remix and Gatsby have crossed lines yet, but um, yeah. Oh uh, yeah, I wasn't sure if I was going to have enough time, to, like enough stuff on this week in JavaScript. So I actually put this in here because I I wanted to. I wanted to see this Vercel rela released and React guys released something about performance. I was like, I probably should look at that and see what they think performance is. Um, but maybe we'll come back to this. Oh, see, here's some, this is more of what I was talking about. Server phones are like magic for reducing bandwidth, blah, blah, blah. I hate this trade off though for Remix. Eight kilobytes every time you validate is fast. Basically, Riot's still out there digging a bit on, on RSC. So you could tell it's almost like a twist my arm kind of thing, or like we have to like test it to prove it. Um, yeah, I don't know. Brian's back. I mean, I, I think I mentioned that last week, so that's kind of cool, but I'm, this is the vibe that I'm getting. I'm getting like, yes, we're looking at it, but you know, maybe we're, we're not the happiest about it. Um, okay, cool. Um, I'm like spoiling other stuff. I want to leave that for a moment. Talking about Marco a bit today. I honestly don't know what Dylan Piercy is doing. He's just trying to cause violence. Um, this stupid tweet. I, 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 I was like seeing people like Corey House or whatever, you know, doing tweets about this stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? Why are people talking about Camel case and Pascal case? Well, I found the original source 
and expect my surprise when I when it's our our man Dylan from the Marco team. Yeah, I. This is why tech Twitter is stupid. This is I was talking about earlier why I don't spend as much time anymore. I just I just what's going on? To be fair, <coughs> um, I used to make case for years and years and years in CoffeeScript. Um, we had full stack way back in the day because databases and like backend stuff and, you know, case sensitivity and stuff. Snake case makes a ton of sense, but I'll tell you the second that I moved to camel case, it was just like, I never wanted to go back again. I, it's just so silly that it's an aesthetic thing, but like, you know, and I think everyone's seen this silly, maybe Matthew Phillips thing. So maybe he's actually the start of this. Um, but like, I don't. My variable names at least aren't that long, so I'm not I'm not sweating it. Shouting case for the win. Oh, thanks. Uh, let me see if I can grab it. J okay, yeah. So to answer my remix, uh, Gatsby question. I don't know if this is the best remix package to look at. I, didn't, I have no clue why Gatsby spiked. But generally speaking, um, then the spike is messing with our numbers. Gatsby is slowly declining and remix is slowly gaining. Um, but they're still about double. So at this rate, they'll probably meet in about a year. But both of them might accelerate, especially Gatsby's down might accelerate. So yeah, there you go. Screaming snake case. <laughs> this is what happens when the React team is quiet for too long. Go on, Rifts and Tailwind, yeah. Yeah, it's like we need something. Oh man, yeah, no, this is, this is, yeah, I'm I'm glad there's a bit of lightness, you know, always on tech Twitter, but it's also just like what, what you know what's going on. Um, let's take a quick look at this article because I I want to understand how React 18 improves performance. Transition suspense React server components. Okay. So there's an explanation here of how main thread and long tasks work. Yep. Do do do, do. when a task is being processed, all the tasks must wait. Yes. Fifty seconds around. Blah blah blah. Mm -hmm. So they're talking about, based on the fact that the device must create a new frame every 16 milliseconds. So yeah, long, long tasks are bad. So what are we talking talk about? Total blocking time, okay. Interaction to next pane, imp, yes. Again, measured on interaction through task. Okay, this is actually, okay. Yeah, talking about the diffing and reconciling stuff. This is where a lot of the work was um, React rendering. I see. Right. And this is, yeah, no, this is a good explanation because it's talking about the pure part. This is where all the side effects happen. Up to here, this is pure. You could like throw this away. Um, right. And they're showing that React rendering is a long task, which is probably pretty fair. Um, so the long list. Oh, I guess I went a little too crazy. Okay, well, I, I'm not going to see anything in that demo, but showing that vent key press long task. Okay. Then we talk about high priority and then low priority. Still commit phase. Yeah, this is actually this is these are good visualizations here of in terms of the part of the pure versus the side effect part. Basically, low priority stuff gets sliced. Um, um, this is what I was trying to explain on the million stream uh, last week when we were showing the difference between concurrent mode and React and then million just making stuff faster. Um, and I was trying to explain, like, I'm like, when we added more DOM nodes, it didn't make a difference because the problem is this commit phase still has to happen. So if you just make this commit phase bigger, like, it doesn't... Like, if the commit phase overruns the blue phase, you're not going to notice concurrent rendering anyways. But in the case where you have 
a bunch of low priority tasks which are small and distributed, you, you can definitely start seeing a benefit here because it can yield because we made the whole bar shorter, so to speak. So you mark it with a transition. So do urgent update, transition. We have the same mechanism in solid, but we don't actually do the scheduling. We use it for a different reason, but, and then they're showing this can go in. Yeah, we're never gonna see any difference on the actual, but it's showing you just a lot more sliced. What's interesting though is, I guess we don't have the to full total timeline. What I was trying to show, like you see it's way less blocking, like all these like, where this is like, like, uh, where is it? This is like barely blocking. There's just these little tick, tick, tick. Um, is that there was that delay in the million demo last week. Um, because even though it's, it, the, the problem is you, it, you really want to only apply this for low, for low importance stuff. Okay. Client side rendering, React server components. Okay. But default component, the components aren't expected to have you client directory, client directive. Yeah. Suspense, lazy. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty good explainer. Cache, the cache function. I'm, I'm super interested in this cache function. Um, in general, because it lets you generalize like around simpler async await type things. And I don't just mean async components, I mean just in general. Okay, so yeah, I mean, this, this, this focuses a lot on this like um, slicing kind of thing in most examples. I think the hardest part for people to, to try and figure out and it goes right back to the beginning here. You're like, what the hell is this big blue thing? And what can I actually do like this? And I think, I think what, what a lot of challenges is for a lot of interactions, this big blue thing is actually, could be a much smaller blue thing. And then you start going, why do I care? Because the problem is, it's the big red thing that you don't get to do anything about. And when you have a slower device, the they both get longer, so to speak. Anyway, okay, cool. That's. Well, I hadn't looked at that article. I was just curious. I mean, this is one of those interesting things. I think you, when you're solving a problem of different types of scale, different kind of problems come up, and I think. I, I was trying to picture out, like, what's the ideal case for the concern rendering? Because the thing is, it's not, you know how I was talking about earlier, but like people tend to, like, pull down something and, like, do a simple performance test and be like, ha, huh, you know, my stuff's good. The problem is, like I showed with the millions demo last week, and it's the same thing when you use solid or whatever, it's like, when you take something that just is faster, like, let's say it's 10 times faster, and, and then you put it against something with scheduling, and you're like, like, it, you're not impressed, you, but you're also missing the point. So almost all concurrent demos involve simulating slowdown because you can't just add DOM nodes. That makes the red part larger. You actually have to make up busy work in, in micro benchmarks because it's like, how could you possibly generate work that's that expensive, that's that, like realistic? What, well, the answer is in a real app that gets big enough, you have enough interactions, like more data interactions between your props and stuff or your React rendering gets bigger, you know, you have to re-render more components or you have to do more calculations and you know all those things that update because of something else and it just gets larger and larger to a degree that it has nothing to do with the fact that your UI is relatively simple. It's all just all the other stuff that you're doing around that data. And in that world, 
um, if you can find a logical way to break it. It can't be a singularly expensive task. It has to be something distributed that you can split up. Like if you're running one memo that's really expensive, well, it's going to block you, you know, regardless, right? Um, it's got to be like hundreds of memos, you know, that, you know, need to be recalculated or hundreds of components. Um, that's why every, as I said, every demo has simulated slowdown um, because it's not easy for someone just to pick it up because they'll expand the wrong things. Which makes it about the hardest feature to sell in the world because it does not make things faster. It makes them less blocking. But sometimes if you make things fast enough, you don't even notice that they're blocking. So, and the, the ironic part is like when the red part gets big, it becomes blocking anyways. So then it just feels like it's slower and blocking. So yeah, this has been very difficult to find the right spot for it. I've, people have come up with very specific use cases, but it doesn't feel very generalized. But as a philosophy, it's interesting because you can see how it fits into all these React paradigms. The interesting thing is like what we did with Solid was we just take all these same features and you just get rid of the little blocks. But instead picture that our blue line is like way shorter. Then like you still have the 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 main benefits, which is like basically like doing stuff on the side, like hey, I want to render the next page while I'm on the current page, you know. But you don't have the complexity and slowdown of scheduling, so it's tricky. Um, yeah, I feel like that million demo was from last week is what you like couldn't illustrate it better of the trade off between being fast and being um, concurrent. Is it at Facebook Club? You don't want the whole app to crash because the issue is one part. Yeah, yeah. But it, I think it, one part could still actually drag down the whole thing. Um, y y the work still needs to be kind of distributed. I mean, it's that's kind of like microservices too. I, I mean, at a certain level, like this is. You, 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 there are people in the equation, there are programmers, and we're not all going to do the best possible things, right? So you kind of got to account for that inefficiency. Um, one way is to section them off, give them their own microservice. Uh, you know, another way is <laughs> isolate them. Yeah, as, as uh, you know, parasocial is saying, uh, isolate them in their own little low priority bubble. Um, yeah. I, I I can see where this could apply. It's just it's it's not the thing that you verify. Like like when someone goes, Oh, I've got this new concurrent feature, let me go give it a spin and see how fast it is. It just you in fact it's slower. I think I showed a while ago the JS benchmark someone were like, Yeah, let's use concurrent features on the JS framework benchmark. Of course, it was like twenty percent slower than React was normally. Actually, is it still there? I don't even know. I haven't been to the JS benchmark this week. Ooh. Yeah, we're back. 1.08. I like that. Million got a good run too. 1.07. Sorry, Solid's been getting bad runs recently. So, oh, but they got rid of my delete the ones I don't want to look at. Because basically all these 772s, ignore, ignore, million is the fastest right now from this run. Eevee's the second, Solid's third. Okay, anyway, sorry, I got distracted. Let's look at, let's look at React. Oik. Uh, let's see if we can find it. React. Maybe it never got merged. I think, oh no, here it is. React hooks use transition. Here we go. Versus React hooks over here. Okay, so React hooks is a one point seven five. Actually, you know what? Let's 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 narrow this thing down. And in fact, 
let's do something else. Everybody's been bugging me about Legend State all week. I have no clue what happened. I talked about Legend State like last fall. Um, React Signalless. Yeah. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, I guess people are uh, adding signals to React whether they like it or not. Um, but let's go. React Hooks. Hooks use transition. Let's. Where's Legend State? React. Where is it? Oh, did those guys never release the 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 keyed version? Only put in the article. If that's the case, that there, that's 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 too funny. Let me see here. Legend state. Okay, there it is. So they're under L. They didn't. Yeah, they didn't even bother putting React in their name. That's 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 ambitious. <coughs> Don't even know you're using React, okay. Yeah, this is actually really impressive because you shouldn't be able to get faster than core React, but um, it means that there's an inefficiency in the core React implementation. But I wanted to show, this is, this is what happens to when you add concurrent mode to basically the same code. It goes from React speed to Ember speed. That's before you're leveraging the benefits of you know concurrency. Um, I think that's Ember speed. Should go back to all again. Two eleven. That's gotta be Ember. Who's two eleven? Ember is two nineteen. I was close. Yeah. Marco is one ninety five. Yeah, Ember speed. Anyway, um. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely trade-off. Only Firebase users you trust. <laughs> that says a lot, doesn't it? Oh, Jack did a video. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the hard part about it is that, like, in theory, you can't beat React. Like, as fast as, even though in the benchmark they show that uh, Legend State is, like, slightly ahead, um, you can't, like... In theory, React, you should be able to implement React and be faster than it. Legend State might be easier to author it that way, but in general, it's always the baseline. But the point is, like, even at um, one, where did the rest of the table go? Oh, there it is. Even at one point seven five, you know, with like, or where's Legend State? One point six eight, like doing a good number. Oh yeah, actually, here you go. React here is one point six eight. So it's tied. Jotai actually for this run was the one in front at 165. It, it, it doesn't matter. You can assume these are basically around the same speed. You, you can't be faster. Estate management can't make you faster than the library by itself. S not really. So unless it makes you better at authoring code for that library. So like what I'm getting at is it's like that, that's not even going to get you to preact, you know, or whatever. But you get to still, you know, you, you understand what I'm getting at. Um, I, and similar, if Preact signals is on here, they wouldn't really be any faster than Preact. Like, you basically can't escape the base of the framework, is what I'm getting at. Oh, man, that's... Oh. Yeah, I, I get it. I, 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 I get it. Like, there's, like, that very narrow part of the audience that cares, but everyone else is kind of, like... Is he just talking, bragging to himself? Yeah. Um, like there's some, there's relevant information in here, but yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, okay, I wanna talk about, um, yeah, let's talk about this. Um, I feel Bittersweet sharing, I'm leaving my job at Meta in a few weeks. Working in the React org at Meta has been an honor. I'm thankful for my past present colleagues for taking me in, letting me make mistakes, helping me see my strengths, and being kind and sharing their time. Yeah, I mean, I'm... I'm not surprised by this news. I was not an insider on it. Every time I talked to Dan though, the last few months, he, he, he's he been sounding like he's been looking at other opportunities and he's been pretty public about it, I feel like, where he's just been like, eh, what else can I do? Um, 
you know, so obviously there's a whole bunch of quote tweets, people talking about end of an era and whatnot, and and it, and it is in a sense because, but that end of that era, this switches, this feels more of like not the beginning edge of that end of the era. Like the beginning edge is when the core, some of the core people from you know, s- core visual people, like people known, moved to, uh, to, from you know when Brian Bond went to replay, and Seb went to Vercel, and then a bit later, Andrew Clark went. Um, this is sort of like the one of the last bastions of that side. Like, don't get me wrong, there's a ton of people working on React and Meta, really talented people, amazing people. People, I, I've met a number of them at conferences recently. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff going there, but Dan has been kind of the public face of Meta um, for it, and... I think it doesn't matter where he goes and even his continued involvement with React, it's going to feel a little bit different. I'm almost a hundred, I'm almost positive he's not. I mean, I could be completely, I could be completely wrong, uh, obviously, but, and he definitely has considered and talked about Vercel in the past. It's just, I don't think you could tell that's not what he's looking for. And he, he just read more of this. Yeah, in the past year, I kept on saying I'd leave in a year or so, but the moment never felt right. I want to finish the new docs, see a b- use a suspense data fetching. She has a work the team both have shipped this spring. I felt hesitant leaving earlier because not too long ago, leaving Meta used to mean le- leaving the React team, right? So the React team has already become distributed. React is a multi-company project. So he's staying as an independent engineer, similar to Sophie. Um... And this means that I will not actively be sponsored to work full time on React by any company, but I will stay involved in the team's work in me. This suggests to me that at least he's not intending to work at Vercel on React or Next or whatever. I mean, the, essentially, yeah. I'm, this I was debating myself. I didn't actually quote tweet this one because I feel like usually I like talking about announcements that are like I'm got my next gig. A leaving announcement. Like, this has huge impact, so we should talk about it. But it's also, like, there's a lot of, like, unknowns, right? But it is it is pretty clear from at least this that, like, that that's not the case. I mean, th- just think about what Dan's been doing the last few years. He came in as a, like, a hotshot programmer, worked on Redux. Him and Andrew Clark had some other projects and stuff they do. Came in, got the work on React. Over time, it became very obvious that he had a gift for teaching and explaining things, and he would write. And he said, in his words, that he got outshunned programming by the other developers. But I, I, I mean, I've been in that situation myself when I joined the Marco team. I felt like that too, to a certain degree. And I, did, it's more like he, I think he saw the gaps and understood what needed to be done, right? You know, if if you got people on the team amazing engineers doing work, you know, let them do that work. Where, where are the gaps? And um, he, he obviously ended up getting involved with the docs project because, again, important work that needed to be done. And he, he, as I said, he's a, great, he's a great teacher. So he's kind of been away from the stuff. I Actually, he talks about all this in here, I'm pretty sure. Uh, one of the things I grounded towards explaining things Practice writing overreacted, and later Rachel and neighbors inspired me to write React Dev together. I poured my heart into the project, but I bit off more than I could chew, right? So he talks a bit about like stuff akin to burnout. What has happened is my standard for writing has gone higher, but my writing ability did not. He's so hard on himself. But he, basically, his expectations make it difficult, right? He see, I'm getting the impression that stuff just stopped being fun to a certain degree. You know, like there, there, there. Stuff was fun in the abstract because he's working on a team delivering incredible stuff to the web and changing the way people do stuff. But like in the specific, um, things became a bit of a slog, right? He talked about burnout and stuff for explaining the server components, but I, this is more than that. Um, you know, we talked about that last week or the week before. Um, I, I'm, I'm just getting the impression that it's time for a change and I think we'll end up with a much more level level out Dan after he can uh, you know get away like what is this? I enjoy this type of work but it's not sustainable to do on my own it's taking a toll emotionally at some point being a single point of failure stops being fun I was feeling I'm failing both teams yeah. 
This is a lot. It's it's. I'm always amazed about how um, open and honest he can be. You know, in public and convey that meaning really clear to people. But yeah, um, obviously a lot of emotion and a lot of stuff went into where he was said this. Um, what this means in practice is still um, something that we'll have to leave to see. But yeah, I mean, he's had a lot of weight. I mean, what's the thing? Follow the person, not follow the f framework, whatever. Like, he's definitely the the most visible member of the React team, right? Um, and he's kind of, he's carried that torch. And part of that working at Meta did actually kind of enforce that. When, in terms of actual like te like te technical leadership, we've got Joseph Anna, right? Obviously working at Meta and we have Seb uh, working um, at Purcell. And it, it's just, it's a different sort of presence. Um, Seb especially, as we know, is kind of the visionary behind a lot of the work that's been going on React the last seven or so years. Um, but, you, you, you know, Dan has had a very important role. He's very self-critical himself on this, but um, the, his impact on the, on the whole ecosystem, especially as the kind of face and the learning about React, you know, I, I remember we, we looked it up a little while ago. We looked up uh, Jordan Walk, and it was a picture of Dan Abramoff. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I think this is why a lot of people wanted to come out and say like, thank you, you know, so to speak. Um, <laughs> I like this. I don't have plans and goals. I just have a hunch that now that things I care about are not going to fall on the floor, it's the right moment to try something new and feel like a beginner again. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know this. This this is uh this is. I feel like in a sense, maybe this also needed to happen to really enforce that image of like the new React and like the this distributed thing. Dan being as visual, and I know this is nothing in, plays into his decision at all, but as as like visual as he is, like out there, and the meta association, like this this actually changes the perspective people will have when stuff happens. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, people follow people, not brands. Yeah, that's exactly what I was kind of getting at. Although I imagine React has a lot of followers, but like my point is like, D Dan is who you follow, so to speak, right? I, I, it's funny, Dan more says that directly. I more say that like, this is like something that happens when you're, you see when you're like a manager too, like some, you have people on your team who are really good at what they do and they know what they're doing and you, you make sure you let them do that and you support them in doing that. Like it's, if you want stuff to get done a lot, yeah, sometimes it's about stepping out of the way, right? Like, and, um, it, I don't take that as a thing. Like Dan's like overly critical himself. I forget where he where he's where he wrote that. Uh, uh, I saw it somewhere where he was like talking about. But like, I I think that like, yeah, there's different ways that help that make the most sense for the the different things. And the most important thing is that getting everything across the finish line. And I think that's, that's what experience teaches you. And that's what like, like th that's what ultimately becomes the important part um, is the, the final product goes across the line and, you know, all the pieces fit. Yeah, we, we talked a bit about this. I mean, there was a lot of blowback on server components. Both him and Lee felt like they were at the forefront kind of pushing it and talking the message. And I, it's too easy. Everyone knows this is not a new story. It's it's way too easy to just be there and, you know, be critical because you can. So, like, I, th I think it's... Uh, obviously, this is all parts of the thing, but I don't I don't think this is a major contributor. It's just, like, sometimes when you're, you're trying to push new ideas, you hit friction, you know, and it, there's 
it's hard also when you're on a project that's the incumbent. People want to see it can knock down a few pegs. They want to see, you know what I mean? Like they want to see it kind of fail a little bit or that like, like you, when you're at the top, you, there's only one direction left to go, you know, that, that kind of thing. So yeah, people are looking for that weak spot kind of, you know, it makes a fun narrative or something. I mean, it's not that fun, but that that's, there's a lot of that happening for sure. And yeah, you know, sometimes it's enough is enough. <sighs> Parasocial, you left me a link. I don't know if I want to follow it. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect, yeah. You're just saying that React is only 2x Dan, which is actually kind of, um, you know, I think, yeah, that's good. That puts it in perspective, right? Um, I remember for the longest time, um, I had more followers than Solid. And then Solid got more followers for a while. And I'm like, good. Solid will never, I will never have... I was like thinking in my head, I'm like, I will never have more followers than, than solid. Um, you know, like we, I got past to that next level and then eight months later, I ended up with more followers with than solid. And I realized over time that it's probably likely, unless we get to a point like where we're like react or whatever, I will probably actually have more followers than solid. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just an aside. I, I I don't think so. Dan's been talking about this for like over a year, maybe two years. I, I he, he, I'm not saying it helps, you know, when people are just like not like harsh for no reason. They're, they're not treating people like people. It, it doesn't help, but you're also it comes with it. You you expect it. You know it's going to happen. Yeah. It's a, thanks, Dev. You already it's gone on that. Yeah, yeah, I think this is a, this is a good write-up, and I don't want to speculate too much on this stuff. I just remember a while ago, he was like, you know, ask me anything, and I was like, my, I'd like, when are you going to write on over, uh, reacted again? You know, his uh, uh, his blog, and he's like, I don't know, I have nothing to write right now, and I'm like, I, you, you know, when that's the case, that either you're working on something big and you just got to like get there to talk about it. Or you're just not excited about new things. It's funny. I, I say that right now, and I haven't released an article probably in three months, so or four months. So I'm I'm probably in the same <laughs> beginning of that same boat, but on that side. But I I think you're right. I think I think it's a level of excitement that needs to come back again, and um, I I think it's important. Um, I I mentioned it before. I mean, it's my whole freaking Twitter thing right now was. It was it was actually a response to Dan saying no, he's not excited, and I feel like it's time for Dan to get excited again. Yeah, I mean it probably does, but I mean, at the scale of stuff that uh, he's experienced over the years, you just you do know that that's the thing. Like, yes, there's been toxicity about RSCs and stuff right now, but like he had to deal with the hooks or suspense when it was coming out. And like, like he, he went through tons of stuff. Like I remember Adam Rackus or something was like poking at him and he went and wrote a big long GitHub thing like a few years ago. It had like on, on the weekend, like he, 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 I'd say being invested for that long to that degree is, can be tiring. And the tricky part is like somehow he's managed to make it sustainable for like five plus years, but that's, that's not an easy task. So, you know, uh, I, I, th I, th I think there's going to be a lot of positive that comes out of this, but we are definitely this, this, even though this isn't the beginning of what that, that era change, this is the thing that signals to everyone like, like, it's happened so um yeah it's gonna be interesting where react uh continues to head into the future and uh obviously wish dan 
the best. I hope he finds that spark or thing he was looking for. Cause I, I always got the impression when I talked to him, he was like, he's, he's just looking for that thing. And he, and he, he's, you know, self-conscious about it. And I, I really do hope you, you know, you find it. Yeah. We, we talked about this tweet last week about the, the effort not, I know the timing seems like suspect and I don't think it's completely unrelated, but for the most part, like, I mean, he's just been doing this for years. Is this the same tweet? Is that what this is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's this tweet. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we did talk about this. Yeah, and Lee was... Was along the same lines, wasn't it? Yeah. I I like this because in a lot of ways I think this was. This was got people to kind of cool off a bit. They're like, okay, fun fun is fun. This isn't fun. Um, personally, though, I think this narrative and stuff is going to continue for a while. This is this isn't anything about social or about Dan or about anything. I think. React is at that point in its life cycle where people, you know, the, the the hero becomes the villain. People want it to become the Javo, that people poke jabs at it. And it just is what it is. I This is why I think it's so great to have people like Eli White and that, like, working on the uh, React and Meta. Like, just much more even keel. Like, it's, it's a different... It, it seems like the first few years of React, there was, like, a certain kind of attitude and perspective you had pete hunt and jordan walk and like that whole thing it's funny almost a sense tom Machino was like the calming thing in that very startup aggressive we're going to conquer the world kind of phase right that's the one that that's the phase they wrote the movie about like the whole documentary was basically about that first few years um and i i mentioned it before it's funny because the actual React itself, like that that's only three years of like the ten years of React, so to speak. Like there's so much more in the last seven years. But that was the phase where it's like the Wild West and you know the glory was made or whatever. And then in 2015, 16, there was a bit of a change of the guard, right? Obviously that's when Seb kind of got elevated. Um but more so uh Dan, Andrew Clark, a bunch of them kind of came in and started this long transitional period that honestly took took like the full seven years to kind of pull off. I, I'm, I'm sure they thought it was only going to take two or three years at the beginning to get to where we are now, where the React moved from that aggressive, you know, flippant kind of like, it's where we all start, to like being like, this is, a, this is the thing. And now that they're getting treated kind of like Java, well, it's because they've like, they've made it in a way that like, um, I don't, like JavaScript frameworks usually don't get to. So okay. now we're, you know, we're at this next phase where they almost have to separate that really innovative R and D portion, like the Seb of the world from the, like we're, we are the incumbent thing, you know, like we listen to your feedback. We are the react team. And in a sense, almost the split between meta and the other ones is where that split's happening right now. So, I mean, that is something worth considering, but I'm just saying like, this is the next phase of react, you know, that it just so happened. It's not just cause it's 10 years is it's the, this release of server components, react 18, all the stuff that the transit transformative years of react went through is now released and we're at that next phase. So, this you know this this is phase three um so yeah i i think the timing and everything makes sense <laughs> i set myself up for this don't i <laughs> thanks dev for always keeping me honest <laughs> um but yeah, no. In in all seriousness, um, um, React today is a different React, and I I hope. I also think that there's a need to find some balance in the force, so to speak, 
people there's, there's a reason for this it's like people for years at the early years of react and whatnot they trusted a framework with that had no evidence that it was ever going to succeed they tr- and back in the day people used to be like that and now we're in a place where like with an incumbent people like you if you don't choose the big player you're probably not doing something right and i i think we've almost over corrected that way and that's why you feel, feel this pullback cuz you know you need innovation from outside you can't always have innovation from inside um you need to test the waters you need to see that things are moving and that's that's part going to be part of this phase 3 of react cuz it's it you know it's been the top dog for a long time. It's been rising, but I don't think people. I don't think people will let it move too much further from where it is. Anyway, I think that makes up this week in JavaScript. Um, look forward to seeing what the stuff means and uh you know where we go from here um clearly as i said new phase for react it means a new phase for front end so um you know it's an exciting time and uh yeah i don't know um i think i actually the way the schedules and stuff work um i'm I do not believe I'll, I'll, I'll probably check up during the week, but I, I, in two weeks time, I do not have a stream and I don't think I'm going to stream next week. Um, I have other stuff going on, so it might be three weeks till my next stream. So, um, just letting everyone know right now, um, if I do a stream next week, it'll be a short one. Um, but, uh, the following week I will not have a stream. Anyways, Thank you all for joining me today, and uh, till next time, have a good one.